Stranded with the Billionaire Book Six of the Ramsey Brothers Series Written by Josephine Bintema Narrated by Josephine Bintema Chapter One She was really going to do this. Sterling handed over all the cash in her purse. It was a considerable amount. The bank teller had eyed her with surprise when she had requested to withdraw it. Now the entire amount was going to be an investment for the biggest story of her life. In return, the flight attendant held out a uniform. There is no name badge. You will have to say you'd misplaced it. The woman pursed her lips and watched Sterling with skepticism. You read the manual I sent to you? I read it, she lied. She had skimmed it. It really was not complicated. Sterling grabbed the bundle of clothes and went into a stall. They were in the bathroom at the airport. She quickly began to strip. Besides, if he figured out she was an impostor, it was not like he could just land the plane and kick her out. He needed to get back to the city ASAP. I hope you studied it. I could lose my job over this, the stewardess huffed. If anything happens, you need to know all the protocols. You said yourself that it's unlikely anything will go wrong. Sterling rolled her eyes. It is perfect weather out. The pilot is experienced. I just serve the passenger a couple of drinks, smile pretty, and snap some photos. No big deal. Besides, all you did was call in sick. You have no idea who would replace you. The flight attendant sighed. I am going to bitterly regret this. Think of that vacation you've been looking forward to. Sterling slipped on the skirt. It was such a sexist outfit. Why she had to wear a knee-length skirt and pumps while handing out drinks on a plane and reminding people when to put their seatbelts on was beyond her. As it was, the pumps were going to kill her feet. Sterling was a sneakers kind of girl, much easier to chase down her quarry with. Now she was going to be chasing down Jake Ramsley, the ever-elusive bachelor who was even harder to get a picture of than Michael Ramsley and Michael valued his privacy to the extreme. There were only two public photos of Jake, one in an old GQ magazine where the entire business conglomerate family had been present, and one file photo for Ramsley Insurance. Now Sterling was going to have him all to herself for a six-hour private flight. Her mouth practically watered at the thought. She was going to do a lot more than snap photos. Not that Sterling was going to tell the flight attendant who had so thoughtfully provided her with the uniform. She handed over a month's worth of wages for this opportunity, and Sterling intended to have an exclusive that would catapult her career. The bonus would more than make up for her investment. Rumor had it Jake was on his way to help the Ramsley family deal with the latest disaster. His father, Robert, and Uncle David had been arrested by the FBI for smuggling drugs into the country on a staggering scale over decades. David had been arrested recently, and his son Michael would now be in FBI custody, charged with the same crimes. Not that the general public knew that yet. Sterling's article would hit the stands tomorrow morning, enlightening everyone to the latest in the Ramsley family drama. Sterling would never have believed it. Michael did not seem the type. Yet the FBI must have something if they were arresting him. Her source had been adamant that he would be arrested tonight, so Sterling had made up the article and submitted it to her boss, Ray Grange. She would continue to press her contacts. If Sterling could keep ahead of the regular papers with the breaking news regarding her favorite source of income, Ramsley Drama, then she would be earning more money than anyone could dream of. She might even be able to make a book out of it afterward. Sterling tugged on the jacket to get it to sit right. It was too tight. Are you ready yet? The flight attendant asked impatiently. I need to check you over. You have to look the part or the pilot will not believe it. Sterling opened the door. Help me with this silly little hat. Do you really wear it? Two minutes later, Sterling was pronounced good enough to pass inspection. Remember, the pilot's name is Richard Merriweather. There is no one else on the flight besides the three of you. Do not screw this up. The flight attendant gave Sterling a critical once-over. Stop worrying. No one will know that you were involved in this unless you tell them. Sterling grabbed her purse. She set a thick layer of red lipstick on her lips. There. I am all set. Sterling shot the flight attendant a triumphant smile, 
and quickly exited the ladies' room before the flight attendant could get any ideas about raising her price or having any remorse. Sterling needed this to work. It had been a bit of a long shot, trying to set up this little operation and managing to fly out of here on time to get on Jake Ramsley's personal plane. The timing had been tricky. The fact that it was all coming together was like a shot of adrenaline for her. Sterling made her way to the correct gate, showing her ID and borrowed pass to a security guard. New here? The guard barely looked at Sterling's fake credentials. She had spent hours with a backstreet fake ID specialist to make sure the airport employee card was perfect. Yes. Sterling smiled as she took back the card. She did not volunteer any other information. That was where most other reporters got in trouble, when they were trying to scope out information. The more a person lied, the more likely they were to be found out. Sterling told the truth wherever possible. Sometimes she just embellished it a little. Only a little. Not that Sterling was a real reporter. She worked for a tabloid. That meant she was the scum of the reporting world, even if she had outscooped some of the biggest newspaper competitors in the city. Have a nice flight, the guard motioned her through. He was as lax as the flight attendant had mentioned. Perfect. Sterling gripped the handle of her luggage case and purposefully walked down the corridor. She passed through some automatic doors and walked across the tarmac to the plane. Everything was going well. Sterling climbed the steps and entered the plane. It was small compared to the large commercial flights she was used to. Then again, it was a private plane beautifully detailed inside with leather seats and nice decor. Jake had hired the plane since the Ramsley Corporations did not own one. Sterling wondered why he had just not flown on a commercial flight like everyone else did. Then again, he was a Ramsley. It was not that she had anything against the family. They were her bread and butter most days. If she had the money, she would travel like this all the time, too. Sterling strashed away her single suitcase. She grabbed a pre-flight checklist for the flight attendants and started to look busy. She was in the middle of checking the fire extinguishers when the pilot, Richard Merriweather, came on board. "'Good evening,' Richard smiled at her. He was a distinguished-looking man in his mid-fifties. "'Good evening,' Sterling echoed the greeting. She shook his hand and introduced herself. "'Sarah Hawkins.' "'Pleased to meet you, Miss Hawkins. Richard Merriweather. Weather looks good today.' He stowed a small bag away. It appeared the pilot traveled very light. Indeed. Sterling smiled as he made his way past her to the cockpit to start his own pre-flight checks. First hurdle done. Sterling continued with the list. Anything she did not quite understand, she put a check mark beside. She was not about to admit her ignorance. It was only a six-hour flight, so no meals were required to be served. All she had to do was fake it until they were well on their way. Footsteps came up the steps. Sterling turned to have a look, and there was Jake Ramsley, immaculate in a suit, coat draped over his arm, laptop case in hand. For a moment, Sterling could feel her heart flutter in her chest. That was silly. She had never been nervous around any of the celebrities that she chased down for a story before. Jake Ramsley was not even all that famous compared to his cousins. Sterling had every intention of changing that come tomorrow when she wrote her next article. "'Richard, good to see you again.' Jake greeted the pilot with a nod. He turned to Sterling. "'Nice to meet you.' "'Sarah Hawkins.' Sterling held out a hand to greet him. "'Miss Hawkins?' Jake said briefly before he handed her his coat. Sterling blinked. She meant to shake his hand, not do coat service. However, she pasted a smile on her face as he went to take his seat. She was invisible, just part of the help to Mr. High and Mighty Ramsley. That was fine. It would suit her purposes not to have him pay any attention to her. She put his coat and single luggage case away, ignoring the sandalwood smell. Just because he was tall, dark, and smelled good did not mean that she was going to give him any mercy. Sterling had a job to do. Jake settled himself with his laptop and phone out, ignoring Sterling and Richard as they went about their duties. His phone rang, and he put it on speaker while he continued typing. Jake Ramsley. Sterling could not believe her luck. She tried to be inconspicuous as she listened in on the conversation. They have arrested Michael, a voice said from the cell phone. 
Jake stopped typing. What do you mean they've arrested Michael? The FBI. They searched Michael's house, seized his boat, and have taken him into custody, came the reply. Anne is beside herself. What are we going to do? Get him a really good team of lawyers? Jake was grim. Dylan, how is Dad? I tried to get an appointment to speak to him, but was denied, responded Dylan. Why? asked a frowning Jake. I asked to see him, and it came back that he did not want to talk to me. Hopefully, when you get here, he will talk to you. Dylan was frustrated. How did this even happen? What possible reason could they have to become involved with drug smugglers? We run billion-dollar businesses, not illegal activities. None of this makes any sense. Jake grimaced. You said Michael had arranged a family meeting? Yes. Michael had proof that money was being laundered out of Ramsey Pharmaceuticals. Have you checked the Western Division accounting? I got a team of auditors looking over Ramsey Insurance Eastern Division right now, and they have uncovered some disturbing things. It is possible money has been laundered through our company as well. Slow down, advised Jake. We do not know that for certain until a complete audit is made. I am worried that the FBI is going to ask for our financial records before we have even fully scratched the surface. There are over 30 years of records to go through, sighed Dylan. I'm concerned about what we could be left open to in this investigation. We did nothing wrong, Dylan, Jake said reasonably. We cannot be charged for not knowing what Uncle David and possibly our dad was up to. Dylan had a short, unamused laugh. We are the heads of this company. We're open to liability and thus charges if the FBI deems it necessary. That is part of the job. At the very least, we should have been apprised by our counting of discrepancies. I'm pretty sure ignorance is not an acceptable defense. Jake knew that Dylan had a habit of imagining the worst. It was a strength when Dylan prepared properly for the worst and everything in between. It was also his weakness when Dylan was paralyzed by his fears. Dylan's first marriage had been something of a disaster, resulting in the anxieties he now bore. Jake was waiting to see how his second marriage went. However, it appeared that Dylan was happier with his new wife, Kelly. Dylan deserved some happiness, after all he had been through, in Jake's opinion. Let's not borrow trouble, Jake responded reasonably. Right now, we audit, we get the lawyers involved, and we try to figure out how to help Dad. Sterling noted that he was not worried about helping his Uncle David. Perhaps Jake was leaving that for his cousins to sort out while concentrating on his own father. Sterling wondered just how deep each Ramsley was involved in this. It sounded like Dylan and Jake were innocent of being involved in the drug smuggling if their conversation was anything to go by. Or perhaps just Dylan was innocent, and Jake was keeping his youngest brother in the dark. "'Have you heard from Everett?' questioned Dylan. "'Just that he'd be flying in soon. He promised to contact me once he had an approximate rival time,' replied Jake. "'Dylan, it will be okay. We will get this sorted out.' "'I wish I could believe that,' Dylan responded. Look, I have to go. We are having a shareholders meeting. I'm going to be in the hot seat, trying to calm some nerves over Dad. I'll see you at the airport. Give me any updates by phone. The last thing we want is the FBI misconstruing something through an email chain, mentioned Jake. I will see you soon. They said their goodbyes and ended the call. Jake worked diligently at his computer, so Sterling had a moment to jot down a few notes on her cell phone. She had not learned much but her source at the FBI had been right. Michael had been arrested. "'Ready to go?' Richard pleasantly asked Sterling. Sterling fixed a smile on her face and shoved her phone in her jacket. "'Absolutely. Everything checks out.' "'Great. If you could close the outer door, I will let the tower know that we're ready to depart.' Richard went back into the cockpit, and Sterling breathed a sigh of relief. She turned to the door and studied it a moment. It was not like a regular door. There was a huge handle on it. Sterling grabbed the handle and pulled the door in. Then she shoved the handle down and felt it click into place. Giving it a push and a tug, Sterling noted it was secure. Thank goodness. The manual she had skimmed last night had not said anything on how to lock these doors, and Sterling knew that they could not fly with it open. Suddenly she felt a little worried. Maybe she should have taken the time to read the manual properly. It 
maybe even watch some videos on YouTube or Google procedures for flight attendants. Little things, like closing a door, could potentially trip her up and blow her cover. The last thing she needed was to be discovered as a fraud before they even left the airport. Her boss would eat her for dinner and spit her out. As much as she was the tabloid's rising star, Sterling had no illusions as to Ray Grange's loyalties. He cared nothing for his workers, only the bottom line of the paper which was selling them to make money. In a world where things were going digital and paper was going the way of the dinosaurs, Grange was constantly pushing his writers to make things more edgy, exaggerated, and sometimes using lies to make a profit. Sterling had managed not to lie in any of her articles. Sometimes she went a little far, she would admit that. But her writing style and suggestive comments had managed to save her from outright lying in the paper. It helped that she started the articles on the Ramsleys, and the drama had been recently unfolding, making her job a little more secure. Yet, if she did not keep giving articles that sold, she would be out on the streets in today's job market. Most people did not look on tabloid writers as very unemployable. Her best bet would be to move into the fiction market, writing books. First, Sterling needed to get as famous as possible, so people would recognize her name when she ultimately made the career switch. She was not going to be at Ray Grange's beck and call forever. Some point soon, she would be able to escape his demands and inappropriate comments. Sterling reminded Jake to fasten his seatbelt before quickly taking her own spot. She clipped the belt together as the plane started. A chirping noise came from her phone, and Sterling looked up to see if Jake had noticed. Instead, he was focused on his own electronics. She probably should have reminded him to put them away, at least during takeoff. However, he should also have flown enough flights to know better. If he got whacked on the head for his own carelessness, was she really to blame? She was probably going to make a bad flight attendant, Sterling reflected ruefully as she pulled out her phone and checked her messages. One of her sources at the police department had just tipped her that Ted Searson had died of anaphylactic shock, an allergic reaction. Sterling's fingers flew over the keys on her phone as she quickly pressed her sources at a prestigious medical center where Ted's doctor was to learn if Ted had any known allergies. She did not like the timing of this. Ted could have become a potential witness against David Ramsley, except now he was conveniently dead. Her eyes widened as the next message came through. David Ramsley had been released. How was that even possible? Sterling scrolled down the message, reading as the plane began to speed up down the runway. David had agreed to testify against his son Michael, brother Robert, and Ted Searson in exchange for immunity. He would not need to testify against Ted any more, Sterling reflected. Sterling had included the possibility that David might testify against the others in her tabloid article on a hunch. She was amazed that it was correct. It did not feel right. Sterling felt that if any of them were guilty, it was David. She had met David Ramsley at a fundraising dinner at Mercy Hospital. He was arrogant, rude, and smug. David gave the impression that he could do or say whatever he wanted without any repercussions. Sterling felt that he was the epitome of all that was wrong with rich old men. They thought they ruled the world, and everyone else was simply there to serve him. Sterling detested those types of men. A chime alerted Sterling to the fact that seatbelts were no longer a requirement. Shoving her phone into her pocket, Sterling unclipped her belt. With a smile fixed on her face, she reminded Jake that he had no longer had to wear his seatbelt, and asked if he would like anything at this time. Thankfully, he said no which was a good thing, because Sterling had yet to familiarize herself with where everything was on the plane. If he had ordered a whiskey or something, she would not even know if they had anything in stock. Vowing to ignore her phone, Sterling began to poke curiously into cupboards, shifting things around until she knew where everything was. Jake ignored her. Sterling ignored Jake, somewhat. He was not conventionally handsome. He might be tall, four inches taller than Sterling's impressive five-foot-ten stature, but he was a little thin. He also had a craggy face. Whatever that really meant, Sterling did not know, but she decided the word craggy suited Jake. Maybe if he ever smiled, he might be handsome. 
but right now he was simply serious and all too male. Sterling tried to ignore him while waiting for any morsel of what would fit into her next article. She wondered if she should start asking him annoying questions in a clueless fashion to see what he might say. Deciding to save that for later, Sterling poured herself a small measure of white wine and enjoyed it in the tiniest kitchen she had ever been in. That was saying something, since she had been in her Uncle Jim Bob's motor home, and it had a miniaturized kitchen all its own. Sterling had come a far away from a tiny nothing town of perhaps eight hundred people, if one were being generous, all the way to the big city as a writer. Okay, tabloid writer. She could handle that as long as it kept paying the bills, and catapulted her career into something higher. Wait, were flight attendants allowed to drink on the job? There was no way to pour it back into the bottle without making a mess. Plus, it was the good stuff. No way was she going to pour it down the drain. With a grimace, Sterling kicked back the last of the wine like a shot. She sighed over the fact that she had barely gotten a good taste of the last large gulp. "'Rough day?' a voice said from behind her. Sterling gasped and turned around. "'You were supposed to be flying the plane!' Richard had a smile as he reached past her into the fridge for a bottle of water. "'Autopilot!' "'Yes, but if something goes wrong—' Sterling gave a speaking look at his chair where that was just visible through the cockpit door. You need to be there to fix it. Relax. Richard shrugged and uncapped his bottle. Nothing is going to go wrong. Sterling watched him return to the cockpit with a wary eye. She could see the headline now. Pilot jeopardizes billionaire Jake Ramsley's life all for a bottle of water. Richard would probably get fired. Then again, that headline was not as good as Ted Searson dead in jail after possible poisoning from best friend pharmaceutical chain owner David Ramsley. David released as FBI framed son Michael for father's deeds. Sterling grabbed her phone and typed a few headline ideas in the start of a new article. Three hours later, she had outlined a couple of article ideas, penned an article, and managed to snap a couple photos on her cell phone of Jake without his being any the wiser. And she was distinctly bored. Jake had not received any more calls and was assiduously working away at the laptop. Sterling decided to ask Jake once again if there was anything that he required. This time, she was able to get him a bottle of water. How dull. She grabbed a glass, put in some ice, and brought it a coaster and a napkin and the bottle of water over to him, setting it down on the desk. No one would ever complain about that level of service. Just the bottle is fine. Jake said distractedly. Sterling kept her smile pasted on and whisked away the ice napkin and coaster. She entered the kitchen, putting the items away and taking another small sample of wine for herself when she heard a curse from the cabin. Hurriedly gulping down the wine, Sterling tossed the glass into the bin and went into the cabin. Sir, is something wrong? Jake glared at the computer screen. No. Something was very wrong if his expression was anything to go by. Sterling really wanted to know what he was looking at. She looked at his water bottle. It had barely been touched. Jake probably was not going to go to the bathroom any time soon. Maybe she could, if she just innocently looked at the screen as she walked past. Have you ever heard of Sterling Denver? Jake asked disgustedly. She's a tabloid writer, right? Sterling responded with just the right tinge of curiosity and confusion. Yes. Jake practically spit out the word. A friend has sent me tomorrow's article, and she has outdone herself again. How does she know these things? Sterling eased herself to stand beside Jake and look at the screen. There was tomorrow's article that she had just submitted a few hours ago. Michael Ransley arrested by FBI. Boat seized. House ransacked. Pregnant wife Anne in tears after Michael Ramsley was arrested last night by the FBI in a drug smuggling investigation. Rumors that Father David will turn against son set to testify against Michael, Robert Ramsley, and family friend Ted Searson in return for immunity. Searson is accused of attempting to murder his own daughter, Bethany, who is rumored to have moved in with Detective Andrew Colburn Ramsley, illegitimate son of David. What a soap opera! 
Can the Ramsleys withstand the drama as stocks of the family companies take a dramatic drip? Or will this be the ruin of a once powerful and wealthy clan? Sure, it was a little dramatic, but everything was factual. She had written far more inflammatory articles. I'm sure that she has her sources somewhere, offered Sterling. She's a menace to society, growled Jake, feeding off of other people's pain. Really? Were they really in pain? They had billions of dollars, the best legal team that money could purchase, and would probably be able to buy their way out of any conviction. If the FBI thought that they were guilty, there was some very strong probability that they were. Well, David, Robert, and Ted were guilty. Sterling did not believe that Michael was anything but a fall guy. Then again, it was not like she had the opportunity to look at all the evidence. No one would, except a jury. I think she's entertaining, Sterling ventured to defend herself just a little to keep the conversation going. She ought to go to jail for libel. Jake snorted. He switched the screen to some boring data analysis reports. She would never go to jail for libel. Sterling asked the lawyers downstairs all the time how much she could push the envelope before getting sued. Rolling her eyes, she headed for the front of the plane when a scene outside the window caught her eye. There were mountains with trees. Lots of trees. Rather close to the plane. Sterling frowned. Getting closer to the window, she peered out. "'What is wrong?' a distracted Jake asked, alerted by her behavior that something was amiss. "'I think you should put on your seatbelt,' Sterling said with some trepidation. Those trees were blurs as they whipped past. They were definitely getting closer. She pushed away from the window and tried to push down the panic growing inside of her. "'Excuse me?' Jake looked out the window. He gasped in disbelief. We were supposed to be past the mountains hours ago. What is going on? Put on your seatbelt, Sterling repeated over her shoulder as she opened the cockpit door. Richard? Richard was slumped over the controls, his fingers spasmodically clicking buttons. An odd sound escaped him. A shriek escaped Sterling. She grabbed the pilot, yanking him upright in his seat, holding onto his heavy frame as his eyes rolled up in his head, and he slumped limply against her. The weight of Richard's body caused Sterling to stumble, and she grabbed him firmly. The plane began to dive. Pushing Richard back into the seat, she sat on his lap and grabbed the thing that looked a little like a cross between a joystick and a steering wheel, pulling back on it ever so gently. Sterling took quick little breaths, scared out of her wits. "'What are you two doing?' Jake glowered in the doorway. "'This is not the time for kinky stuff.' "'I think he's having a heart attack or something,' she practically yelled at Jake. How he headed half of a huge American corporation when he could not see what was happening right now or follow simple directions like putting on a seatbelt and staying seated, she did not know. "'There is no one flying the plane.' "'You are flying the plane,' Jake frowned at her. "'I am not a pilot,' growled Sterling. "'Now slap him around some that he'll wake up and do his job.' "'I don't think that's how it works,' Jake looked at Richard. "'He is turning blue. Do you know first aid?' Which meant Jake did not know first aid. Sterling took a deep breath and tried to remember back to the single course she took back in high school. "'Can you fly the plane?' "'What?' No! Jake looked at her like she had an alien growing out of her head. Just grab the stick thingy and hold it steady, Sterling pointed. Easy! And when we want to land or turn? Jake reached out and held the stick airing mechanism. Sterling squeezed between Jake and Richard. We will radio air traffic control and I'm sure they can walk us through it. At least she hoped so. That was if she could figure out what part of the radio was out of all the electronics on the dash. "'Have you put in a mayday?' Jake asked a little desperately as the plane swooped a little. He tried to hold the stick steadier. "'No,' grunted Sterling as Richard fell halfway out of his seat, pinning Sterling's legs against the co-pilot chair. She grunted and tugged on the man, laying him flat on the floor. Kneeling beside him, Sterling pressed her cheek near his nose trying to feel for any breathing sounds. Is he breathing? 
Jake asked as he carefully sat down in the pilot chair. Sterling tried not to roll her eyes. Concentrate on driving the plane. I think it's called flying the plane, not driving, Jake corrected her. Excuse me, grammar police. Sterling put two fingers to Richard's throat, trying to find a pulse. She moved her fingers around, but found nothing. Great. She was going to have to bluff her way through CPR. Sterling tried to remember what to do. Okay. Tilt head. Pinch nose. What are you doing? Jake questioned as the plane took another swoop motion. Sterling swallowed hard as the contents of her stomach did not appreciate the maneuver. Maybe she should not have had those two glasses of wine. I am trying CPR if we would just shut up and drive the plane straight. I am flying straight, Jake said defensively. It is turbulence or something. It is every time you turn around to see what I'm doing, she shot back. I bet you cannot look at scenery and drive straight on a roadway either. I have a personal driver, Jake countered, and who looks at scenery anyways? Jake Ramsley was exactly the guy who needed to look at scenery and remember that the world was not all about him and data sheets, Sterling thought. She took a deep breath, sealed her mouth over Richard's, and pushed air into his lungs. Or at least she tried to. The experience left her own lungs and throat aching as no air moved anywhere. Sterling lifted her head and looked down at Richard with puzzlement. She had tilted his head pinched his nose, opened his mouth. Was there something she was missing? What was he doing? Jake inquired as another swoop happened, followed by a couple of smaller swoops. Just dandy, Sterling said sarcastically. Richard is ready to get up and fly the plane. No need to be rude, he responded. Sterling moved her knee for a better position and found something hard. Distracted, she gave it a glance, pulling a large round mint out from under her knee. Looking around, she could see other men scattered on the floor. No, Sterling breathed. What? Jake asked with some alarm. Sterling ignored him, got to her feet, and raced for the first aid kit. Grabbing a flashlight, which was stored with the kit, she turned it on and came back to Richard. Tilting his head, she looked down his throat as best she could. She did not see anything. Ew! Sterling screwed up her face and stuck her finger down Richard's mouth, trying to see if she could feel anything that should not be there. What? Jake asked again. What is it? I think he choked on a mint, revealed Sterling as she kept feeling and was rewarded with a hard surface. Maybe it was his tonsils. Maybe it was the mint. How was she supposed to know? Was she supposed to do the Heimlich thingy on an unconscious person? Although, if he did not have a pulse and was not breathing, didn't that make him a dead person? Sterling gulped and tried to quell her nauseous stomach. She had her finger down the throat of a dead guy. She had her lips on a dead guy. Do something, ordered Jake. Sterling gave him a dirty look. Not that Jake could see it since he was flying the plane. Her eyes widened as she looked out the window. Is that... Fog? Clouds, I think, responded Jake uncertainly. I don't think we should fly into that. Sterling felt a fissure of fear dance its way down her back. How do I avoid it? Jake gave her an incredulous look. Move the stick? Sterling motioned with her hands. The plane took a dive. Not that fast. Would you like to drive? He groused as he pulled back slowly on the steering mechanism. I thought you were flying, Grammar Man. Sterling decided to try chest compressions. Maybe they might dislodge the mint, since she could not manage to get it out with her finger. She mumbled a few lines from an old song of the Bee Gees. Are you singing Staying Alive? Jake turned and looked at her in utter surprise. Watch where you are going, Sterling huffed as she pumped Richard's chest. It's to keep time. Otherwise I could sing Another One Bites the Dust by Queen. You are demented, Jake said as he swung back to look out the window. The beat of the song is the optimum rhythm for CPR. Sterling shot back. It is one of the few things she remembered from her first aid group other than wrapping her mummy up like a mummy with her group. 
They wasted forty-two rolls of gauze in the effort and scribbled all over the guy in permanent marker, declaring it a body cast and calling him Dummy Mummy Meets Tree on Ski Hill. The teacher had not been amused. It's all right. It's okay. The ambulance is on the way. It's all right. It's okay. EMS will save the day, Serling sang under her breath. You got a mint stuck in your throat, but do not take note, because I'm keeping you alive. Keeping you alive. What are you doing? demanded Jake. I don't remember the words, so I'm making up new ones. Sterling was starting to sweat and run out of breath. This was hard work. Can you figure out where the radio is and call on a mayday? That is your job, protested Jake. What does radio even look like? I am a little busy, Sterling puffed. Wrinkling her face, she swiped her finger down in Richard's throat again, hoping to find the candy loose so that she could just grab it. No luck. Mayday, mayday, Jake said into what looked like an old CB set. Nothing happened. Did you press the button? questioned Sterling. She remembered her brother used to have a set of walkie-talkies where you had to press the button to speak. Yes. Jake grabbed the steering stick suddenly with both hands as a bad patch of turbulence hit. The three of them bounced around the cockpit. I don't think I should be doing both things at one time. It's like distracted driving. Not like anyone is going to give you a ticket 15,000 feet in the air. Sterling grabbed Jake's seatbelt and began belting him in. What are you doing? Jake twitched away from her. We are putting on our seatbelts before either one of us is seriously injured. Sterling leaned close to clip the belt. A fissure of awareness went through her, and she put it down to their situation. Everyone knew senses were heightened during an adrenaline rush. Right now she could smell Jake's cologne, and it was heavenly. I thought I told you not to go into the clouds. Was there a choice? Jake growled. What about the pilot? She pushed away from him and got into the co-pilot seat as another round of turbulence hit. Clutching her seatbelt, Sterling quickly fastened it. Richard is dead. How do you know that? You can't just give up on him. Jake was white-knuckling the stick, and it bucked in his hands, and the plane jumped up and down. He is, and I did, Sterling said shortly. She grabbed the radio thingy and pressed the button. Mayday! Mayday! Nothing happened. See? Jake said triumphantly. Sterling rolled her eyes. She fiddled with the dials on the radio, and it emitted a burst of static. Mayday! Mayday! This time, they heard static and nothing else. Sterling repeated the call, then fiddled with the dials again. There should be a frequency they should be on, perhaps? Is there a book on your side? Sterling rifled through the co-pilot area, looking for any sort of manual that might tell her what frequency to set the radio to. I do not have time to look for a book. Jake stated firmly, nor is it time to be reading something when we have a plane to fly. I meant we should look for the radio manual. I will do it myself. Sterling huffed as she undid her seatbelt and started looking through all the compartments in the cockpit. As she found manuals and checklists, she skimmed through them, tossing what she did not need on the floor. Why do you not know where the list is? he questioned. You are the flight attendant. This is pilot stuff. Sterling said curtly. She had no idea if a flight attendant was supposed to know where everything was in the cockpit. The good thing was that Jake did not seem to know either. The plane jumped and bucked. Sterling fell, knocking her knee on the console. Ignoring the pain, she grabbed at anything to keep her in place as the turbulence threw them around. Jake made an inarticulate noise as the clouds parted to reveal the side of a mountain dangerously close and coming closer as they flew towards it. Pull up! Sterling shouted as she launched herself into the co-pilot chair, struggling with the seatbelt straps. Pull up! Jake yanked on the stick, and the plane tilted, pushing them backwards into their seats. Chapter 2 Sterling felt her head. Her fingers came away warm and wet. There was a ringing in her ears. Something was crackling? A coughing fit overcame her smoke there was smoke where there was smoke there must be a fire fumbling with her seat belt sterling managed to unhook herself the plane was on a forty degree slant so she fell onto jake who moaned sterling looked at him 
He was breathing and still alive, however, he was unconscious. Sterling tapped the side of his face, but got no reaction. Jake? She shook his shoulders. Jake? Nothing. With firm resolve, she hauled back and slapped him hard. What the? Jake blinked in surprise. He felt his red cheek with a hand as his eyes focused on Sterling, who was half sitting on his lap. The world was at an odd angle. The plane crashed, she said unnecessarily. How bad are you hurt? Jake dragged in a shallow breath and thought about it. His ribs were very sore, but everything else felt fine. I'll be okay, I think. Is it warm in here? Sterling looked toward the cockpit doorway. Flames were creeping along the frame. Wincing from her knee, she managed to lunge across the tilted aisle and grab the fire extinguisher. Pass. Pull pin, aim at the base of the fire, squeeze trigger, sweeping motion, she muttered to herself as she extinguished the flames. The fumes set off another coughing fit for her and Jake. It took them a while to get their breath. A cold wind swirled through the air, and Sterling reflected that could not be a good sign. She stepped up to the doorway to see where the cold air was coming from. Do you always do that? Jake grunted as he unclipped his seatbelt and slid, landing against the side of the plane with a thump. He grimaced and tried not to curse as a wave of pain took over his ribs. He had been brought up better than that. His mother, Beverly Ramsley, did not allow swearing from her sons. Jake sucked in a slow breath to try to minimize the pain. "'Do what?' she asked distractedly, as she realized the entire rest of the plane was missing." It was gone. They were miraculously in the cockpit, which was not in good shape, but in one piece. After the missing cockpit door, there was maybe three feet of plane before complete and empty air, swirling snow, and evergreens came into view. Sterling stared at it, shocked. Say instructions as you do a task, Jake clarified. He gently propped himself up on an elbow as the pain settled into a throbbing. Jake tried to right himself so he could crawl over the pilot chair. Where is Richard? Gone, Sterling replied. He probably disappeared with the rest of the plane. Could that be right? He had been in the cockpit with them. Maybe he was in the snow out there somewhere. Sterling did not know. He could not just be gone. Jake managed to get himself free. He slowly made his way down the aisle to see what Sterling was looking at. His mouth gaped open. The plane! Gone, Sterling reiterated. She was starting to shake. From cold or shock, she did not know. We need to try the radio. Jake nodded and backed away from the missing part of the plane, returning to the edge of the pilot seat. He had an arm around his ribs. He was hurt. Great. They were in a mess of trouble, and both of them were hurt. Sterling limped to the radio and tried to get it to work. Nothing. The battery was dead, or fried, or completely missing. She just did not know. We should stay with the plane. They'll send someone to rescue us, reasoned Jake. We are hours off course. They don't know where we are, responded Sterling as she shivered. If we stay, we will freeze to death. We had a fire a minute ago, Jake pointed out unhelpfully. The loss of the fire was now making way for the bitterly cold wind. Sterling looked at him with a glare reserved for people she generally found wanting in the intelligence department. So burning to death is preferable to freezing to death? We are not going to die, he stated resolutely. There has to be some solution to this. There's a solution to everything. It's the way I do business. Everything can be resolved with the right amount of time, energy, resources, and patience. Tell that to Richard, Sterling thought. She lurched her way back to the cockpit door and had a look. No. What? asked Jake with a frown. The closet with our luggage is gone. Sterling made her way back to Jake. It was only a few feet to walk, but difficult with her knee and the angle of the floor. Her jeans, leggings, extra socks, and fleecy jacket were a thing of the past. With a violent shiver, she looked around. Maybe there was something they could use to keep warm, 
if she could just find it. What about my coat? wondered Jake. Gone, Sterling repeated the word again. It summed up the situation nicely. Nearly everything was gone. She thought about what to do. I think there were a couple of these silver blankets in the cupboard near the door. The wine. All that beautiful wine was gone. So was any food. Sterling grimaced and made her way back to the cockpit doorway. She pulled open the cupboards that were still there, looking in each to see if there was anything useful. Found the flashlight. Jake called to her as he spotted the item. He nearly groaned as he bent over to pick it up. Slowly straightening, Jake pressed the button. It even works. Considering how dark outside it was, they were going to need it. The question was, did they try to shelter in place until morning, or try to set out on foot as soon as possible? Sterling pulled out the blankets. There were three thin silver blankets. If they had something to stick a blanket to the doorway, then they could stay in the cockpit without freezing to death for a short time. It would be better to stay the night here rather than walking in circles or going the wrong way in the dark. Or meeting wolves or whatever other creatures were out there. Sterling shuddered and tried not to think about it. She had every intention of getting down the mountain rather than freezing to death on its peak. Pulling out items and shoving them around, she found a roll of packing tape. Sterling was not sure what it was doing on the plane, but she intended to use it. Thanking God for this small miracle, Sterling limped back inside the cockpit. Help me with this. With what? Jake got to his feet, standing behind her. Handing Jake the tape, Sterling broke open one of the blankets, freeing it from the plastic packaging. We are going to tape this to the door to prevent the wind from coming in. That way we can stay the night and not freeze. Were you in Girl Scouts or something? Jake asked as he ripped off a piece of tape. No, that would probably be useful right about now, admitted Sterling. What about you, Boy Scouts? Nope, I hated camping, he said as he taped the blanket to the door frame. That means you went camping? Hopefully you retained something useful that will help us. She pulled the blanket as tight as she could while he leaned over her, taping it. He was right close to her, and Sterling had a moment where it was hard to breathe. She blamed it on the cologne. Men should not smell so good. I learned that I hate snakes, bugs, raccoons, deer, and all other wildlife, and sometimes even my two brothers who excelled at camping. Jake had a sharp breath as he bent to continue taping the side of the door. I learned that fingers do not plug holes in the canoe, gravity was not my friend, and that I hate climbing trees almost as much as I hate horses. Who hates horses? A surprised Sterling had to question. They bite. Jake remembered the occasion with a frown. They also sweep off riders by going under low-hanging branches on trees. That does not sound pleasant. Sterling frowned. His horse obviously had not been trained very well. Her memories of being out in the bush involved bonfires and copious amounts of alcohol as a teenager, something she was glad she stopped doing. It was an idiotic thing especially when the guys decided to see who could jump the highest over the bonfire. Not great times. It was a miracle no one had gotten burned or killed. It was not pleasant, Jake responded curtly, nor did it probably teach me any real-life skills. What about reading a compass or a map? Sterling asked hopefully. Not that she had a compass, map, or even a starting point. No, he grimaced and hugged his ribs as he straightened. Like I said, nothing useful. Finally, they taped the blanket to the floor. Already it felt warmer in the small space. Jake helped Sterling to her feet, and she had a look at her knee. It was swollen and oozing blood from where she had smashed it against the console. The first aid kit was on the other side of the cockpit door. Sterling shrugged. It would not kill her to just leave it for now. She had no intention of going back into the cold until absolutely necessary. You are going to get frostbite in that skirt and those pumps if we have to start walking through the snow, Jake remarked, looking at her calves. Sterling pulled her blanket out of the packaging. I did not make up the uniform requirements. If I had, it would feature much more sensible and less sexist clothing. Is that sexist? Jake inquired. Yes, 
Sterling stated. A skirt and pumps? Would a man be wearing those to work as a flight attendant? Not likely, unless he were in drag. Jake shrugged. However, I do not think that women and men should try to dress alike each other. It does not really work. We both have roles in society and ways of doing things that are unique. Our uniqueness should be celebrated rather than forcing us to try to be the same. We're not the same. We never will be. I am too tired to get into an argument about that right now, sighed Sterling. Who said we had to argue? asked Jake. She ignored his question and laid her blanket on the floor between the two seats, curving it up at the edges. It was going to be a tight fit for both of them. Sterling laid down and pointed to the space beside her. You go here, and we put the second blanket on top of us. Shared body heat. Jake sighed and carefully lowered himself to the floor. Are you sure the floor is the best spot? Unless you want to try to share a tilted pilot seat. Sterling shrugged. It did not much matter to her as long as she started to get warm soon. You might be able to breathe better sitting up, but we will be colder if we do not share the heat. If I stop breathing, do not do to me what you did to Richard, Jake muttered as he laid down, spreading the blanket over them both. Hey, I tried to save his life, she defended herself. Sterling was squished between Jake and the seat. Wait a minute, what is this? Something hard was digging into her ribs. Sterling managed to squirm around enough to grab the object out of her pocket. A phone. Jake looked at it and her. Mine was in the piece of the plane that is missing. Do you have a signal? Sterling looked at the cracked screen. It was not totally shattered, so hopefully it would work. She turned it on, and the screen came to life in a disjointed mess. Maybe... Jake turned a little so they could both look at the phone at the same time. I think there is a bar. No, it's gone. We could just give it a try anyways. Sterling hit the call button so she could dial a number. Putting in 911, she waited for the call to connect. It did not. A message flickered across her screen and Jake puzzled it together. No signal. No kidding. Sterling sighed and shut off the phone to conserve battery. I'm not too sure it would have helped anyways. We don't even know where we are. What mountain? What state? They should be able to trace the phone, right? Jake frowned. Technology is so far advanced now, you would think they would be able to do that. Not unless it can be triangulated off of three cell towers. The police need permission for that, which I would gladly give. Sterling was starting to feel warmer. Even then, the search area would be massive. We would be extremely lucky to get found. How do you know that? he asked in surprise. I read extensively, improvised Sterling. Truth was, she knew for her job. There had been a police case about a missing child that she had covered, and cell phone coverage with emergency services had been part of her research. Fortunately, the kid had been okay. A rare good news day in the world of negative news. We will just have to keep trying for a signal as we make our way down the mountain, said Sterling. She returned the phone to her pocket. The last thing she needed was Jake seeing her notes or files. Sterling would keep playing the flight attendant as long as possible. She hoped the police would not be mad at her when they were finally rescued. Was impersonating a flight attendant a criminal offense? When I do not arrive at the airport on time, the airline and my brother will notify the proper authorities. Jake said with confidence. They'll start searching for us shortly. We are off course, remember? Sterling hated to put a crimp in his belief, but it was better to be rational about this. At three hours into the flight, we were still over a mountain range when we were to have cleared that within the first hour. At least, she was pretty sure they should have cleared it close to the hour mark. It seemed right to her way of thinking. We must be north of where we started, Jake remarked. How do you figure? she wondered. There's snow, he explained. The northern states are starting to get colder for winter. Higher elevations have snow, Sterling responded with a dry voice. We are on a mountain? You don't think we ended up south in Mexico? Jake did not like that thought. Or even north into Canada? I don't think so. If anything, I think we went around in circles for a couple hours before we crashed. Sterling shrugged and yawned. 
she felt exhausted from all the activity that had been happening. Or maybe she was tired from the bump on her head. That's my hope. Then we'll be closer to where the search and rescue teams start looking for us. What are we supposed to do with a concussion? What do you mean? frowned Jake. I bumped my head, she explained. Do you have a headache, feel dizzy or nauseous? he asked. No, I just am really tired. Sterling snuggled against him. He was warm, and that was all the invitation she needed. Plus, he smelled good. She took in a deep breath. Careful of the ribs, he complained. Sterling rolled her eyes. What a wuss. She yawned again and went to sleep. Chapter 3 Bright sunlight was streaming through the window. Sterling groaned and squinted into the light. Her nose was frozen, a drip of moisture hanging from the end. Quickly, she wiped it away. Not that she was trying to impress Jake Ramsley. If anything, she was going to be persona non grata after she published the photos that she had taken. Speaking of which, a picture of the inside of the cockpit before they took away the blanket in front of the door would look great. She could see the headlines now. Billionaire stranded on side of mountain. Billionaire to survive due to the ingenuity of flight attendant. Plane crash claims life of pilot. Jake Ramsley still alive. Any one of those would be a seller for the tabloids. Ray Grange, eat your heart out. Her boss would be enthusiastic about the piece. Problem was, if she did not have reception, she could not send any articles. Sterling also would need to find time away from Jake Ramsley to write. There were so many things in the mix right now that she needed to work on. David's release, Michael's arrest, and the family's opinion of that, Ted's death, and now Jake being stuck on a mountain. It really was amazing how one family could have such bad luck. Her good luck was that she could write about it and had an interested audience. Sterling took a peek at Jake. He was still sleeping. At least he was breathing. The last thing she wanted was to explain how a billionaire had died under her care. Those would be bad headlines. Turning her phone on, Sterling edged it out of the blanket and took a quick picture before looking for a signal. Nothing. Then again, had 911 rolled out a new texting program? Sterling did not think it was available in all areas, but she was willing to give it a shot. She remembered learning somewhere that text was less strenuous on signal strength than an actual phone call. First, she dialed 911. No signal was the phone's response. Then, she tried to text. Sterling had never done this before, so she did not know if a person was supposed to just send it to 911, or if there were letters or anything. Figuring it could only not work, she texted as much as she knew about their situation. Plane 9089, out of New Haven Airport, crashed in mountain. Unknown location. Pilot dead. Passenger and crew okay. Need rescue ASAP. Hitting send, Sterling had a little prayer that the text would find its way to the right people. Any luck? Jake asked sleepily, running a hand through his hair. No man had any right to look that good just waking up. Sterling knew her makeup was going to be smeared all over and that she would have wild hair and raccoon eyes. Her breath probably did not smell all that wonderful either. No, the text message is not even sending. Who did you text? Jake frowned. He did that far too often in Sterling's limited exposure to him. She wondered what it would take to make the man happy. Probably data sheets that added up perfectly. 911? Sterling shut off her phone and put it away. Her fingers were getting cold. Is that a thing? Texting 911? He asked. She shrugged. I thought I read somewhere that some countries are now making texting 911 available. I thought it would not hurt to try. True, Jake slowly agreed. I suppose we should see what our situation is by the light of day. He sat up and took all the warmth of the blanket with him. Sterling scowled as she quickly sat up. She grabbed the blanket from the floor and wrapped it around herself as he began peeling the tape away from the frame of the cockpit door. Bright light hit their eyes from the winter wonderland outside. It was white and snowy with green pines. It looked like a holiday postcard. 
except for the fact that neither of them were properly dressed for the occasion. Sterling huddled in her blanket, trying to ignore the call of nature. Now she bitterly regretted those two glasses of wine. Jake stepped through the doorway and gave a low whistle. What? Scrambling to her feet, Sterling followed him. It's a long way down, Jake grimaced. Did I mention I hate climbing trees? Well, be thankful you don't need to do it in a skirt. Sterling looked over the edge. The nose of the plane was wedged on a rock face. Unfortunately, it looked like their best bet was to climb down one of the nearest pine trees. It did not look like they would be able to reach the rock as the plane was just slightly over the edge. Sterling stepped back, her stomach queasy at the drop. Thankfully, their combined weight had not caused the plane to move an inch. Otherwise, they might be pumbling down the hillside right now. How was she supposed to climb down a tree in a skirt and pumps? In her search of the remaining cupboards, Sterling had not found anything useful that she could swap out her flight attendant clothes for. She had a bad feeling they were in deep trouble. Jake did not look much better equipped than she was. He had loafers and dress pants on. Both of them were going to court frostbite come the approaching nightfall when things cooled off considerably. Right now, with the sun and hardly any breeze, it was somewhat tolerable. Still cold, but Sterling thought if she could just get proper shoes and pants, she might be okay. Tonight, however, that was going to be a different story. Without adequate shelter, they probably would freeze on the side of the mountain. Jake Ramsley, billionaire and America's most eligible bachelor, dies on mountain. Oh, and so does tabloid reporter. Wonderful. Or better yet, she chased them to their deaths. America mourns Jake Ramsley. Grange would make her out to be some delusional idiot. Sterling wondered what they were going to do. I have an idea, Jake suddenly spoke. Come on. He led the way back to the cockpit. Sterling followed him. She watched while he spread his blanket on the floor. We cannot go back to sleep and pretend it was all a bad dream and hope that we'll wake up someplace else, Sterling said dryly. I have already tried, and it didn't work. That is not what I'm doing. Jake pointed to the blanket. If you sit there, I can cut out of a sort of pat patterns out of the blanket. We can use the tape to secure it, and you'll be warmer than just a skirt. Can we make some socks, too? Sterling went for the blanket. We can try. Jake shrugged. He pulled out a set of keys and picked one. Jake used the key on the blanket to punch through and tear it. They taped up the seams with packing tape. What about the waist? wondered Sterling. Is it going to fall down? Tape? Jake held up the roll. And when I need to do my personal business? She raised an eyebrow. Her bladder already was protesting at the delay. Jake frowned. Does your skirt have a belt? If it does, we can tape it to the pants and you'll be able to keep them up that way. It won't be pretty, but it would work. Sterling undid the belt on her skirt. She helped position it while Jake taped it to the shiny material. I am going to make every disco club person jealous. Funny. Jake gave her a smile and took Sterling's breath away. Oh, dear. Craggy had turned into handsome. Just with a smile, Sterling thought with surprise. Maybe we'll get lucky and the rescue people will see the sun reflecting off your legs. Dual-purpose pants. We should patent these babies. Sterling briefly debated whether to put her skirt over top or to tuck it into the pants. Without the belt, it might fall down, so she decided to tuck. It probably would not look sexy. Sexy was not her goal, Sterling sternly reminded herself. Getting to safety was. She could get all glamorous off the check her boss was going to give her once she submitted her latest articles. Somehow I'm not sure they would be too popular. Jake grinned at her transformation. What? You don't like the model that comes with padding in the rear? Sterling shrugged. Socks, please. Coming right up, said Jake. A few mistakes and tries later, they came up with an acceptable prototype for socks. The good news was that Sterling's feet still fit in the pumps. The bad news was that they were very tight. It had to be better than not having socks at all. At least, she hoped so. Jake taped the bottom of the pants to the socks so that no snow would come in. They folded up the remains of the tattered blanket, 
taking it and the tape with, in case any repairs might be needed. Sterling folded and stuffed her blanket down her shirt so that she would have both hands free. Jake did the same. Okay, ready to make a jailbreak? Sterling questioned as she grabbed the nearly empty water bottle that had been in the cockpit. They would need water and something to carry it in. It looked like this was all they currently had, so Sterling was going to take it with. She popped it in her blouse as well, wincing at the cold. I think so. Jake looked out at the tree. I wish we did not have to climb down a tree to do it. Only one option. She limped past him and carefully lowered herself to sit on the plain floor near the pine. What is that? Jake asked curiously. We keep going until we find shelter or rescue. Sterling thought it was fairly clear. Otherwise, we die. One option, he agreed grimly. Crouching at the opening, Jake helped Sterling find a grip on the tree so that she could start her descent. Hopefully they would not dislodge anything and cause the nose of the plane to come crashing down on either of them. Branches scraped her face and hands as she carefully found her way down the trunk of the large pine. Sterling breathed a sigh of relief as her feet touched the ground and she was able to make her way out from under the tree. She looked up to see if Jake had already started to climb down. Sterling shadowed her eyes with her hand, but could not see him. Over the edge of the rock face, it looked like the plane was hanging off by nearly a third of the nose. They were so lucky it had not moved. Sterling was tempted to call up to Jake. Then she realized if she yelled, it might set off an avalanche. That would be the worst thing that could happen to them right now. Instead, she swallowed anything she might have been going to say and waited patiently for him to descend the tree. Her toes were already numb either from cold or from the lack of the ability to move. Her pants were actually warm. Sterling blessed Jake silently for thinking of making them. The tree shook a little under his weight as Jake made his way to the ground. A few moments later, he emerged from the branches, dusting off his suit jacket. Ready? No. Sterling shook her head. Remember when I talked about doing my business? I'm going to find a convenient tree. I'll be back in a bit. You sound like you've been camping before. Jake thought he should find a tree himself. More like bush parties? She shrugged as she walked away. Meet you back here. Sure thing. Jake went in the opposite direction. The good news is that it was not snowing. When he was done, he followed his tracks back to the tree where they had climbed down from the plain. I hope you like to walk. Sterling was plowing through the snow as she returned. It was up to her knees. We should probably take turns going first. Jake said as he fell into step behind her, she walked past. That way we'll not tire out as easily. Okay, Sterling puffed. It was not easy going. The elevation was not helping either. I think going downhill would probably be the best since we have no idea where we are. Maybe we'll find a road, Jake offered some hope. They trudged along for hours, taking sips from the water, then putting snow in it to melt with their body heat. It was bright and sunny. They saw no one, not even any wildlife besides the birds singing to them. I need a rest, Sterling finally gave in. She leaned against an old stump, puffing. Jake handed her the water bottle. He looked around the clearing. I think this might be an old logging road. What do you mean? Sterling looked around. There are a lot of stumps in the clearing. Then there's clear way between those trees at the end, he pointed. I think that might be an old logging road. If we follow it, we might come to a real road. Sterling smiled in appreciation, with real people in real cars who will give us a lift to the nearest town. Shall we give it a try? asked Jake. Beats walking through the trees, she agreed. How are your knee and feet? He took the offered water bottle back, drinking the rest and stuffing it with more snow. It was not efficient, but it was all they had until they found a stream or other source of water. Knee hurts, but that's to be expected. Sterling shrugged. My feet are completely numb. Whether it's from the cold or the too tight shoes, I don't know. Jake frowned. His feet were cold, but not numb. Maybe we should rub them to help with the circulation. We don't have time. She pointed to the sun, which was slowly making its way across the sky. Sterling got up from the stump and began walking again. 
We need to find shelter or rescue before tonight, or we'll end up freezing. Jake realized the wisdom in what she said, even if he did not like the idea of her getting frostbite or worse from the cold. He would make sure that his turns pushing through the snow lasted longer than hers, since Sterling was starting to tire as the afternoon wore on. "'How long have you been a flight attendant?' he asked, in an effort to make time seem to go faster as they walked. "'Not long,' admitted Sterling. "'It was something I sort of fell into.' "'Not your dream job?' questioned Jake. "'No.' Sterling had a half-laugh. "'What about you? What do you do?' I head up the Western Division of Ramsley Insurance, Jake automatically replied. We provide insurance for large businesses. How long have you worked in insurance? Sterling knew the answer, but decided to ask it anyway. Since college, supplied Jake. It was something I was expected to do. So not your dream job either, she asked dryly. No. Jake frowned and looked at the snow at his feet. He crouched down and cleared away the white stuff to find gravel. It is a road. Oh, good. Sterling was relieved. This meant that they were making progress. Hopefully they would find some civilization soon. She was so hungry. If you were not in insurance, what would you do? What do you mean? Jake frowned as he resumed, following her. What is your dream job? she inquired. I don't know. How can you not know? Sterling stopped to look at him. Everyone has a secret wish that they were doing something else. What would your wish be? I don't know. Jake shrugged as he passed her and began plowing through the snow. I suppose I never let myself think of it. There's not really a point, since I knew I was expected to follow in my father's footsteps. At some point he'll be ready to step down as head of the company, and I'll be expected to take his place. How boring. Sterling hurried after him. You will never realize your true potential all because of family expectations. What about you? What would you be doing if you're not a flight attendant? He returned the question. What is your dream job? I would love to be a writer, Sterling said easily. I used to want to be a gritty news journalist, going to other countries to discover the truth and write about it to the American people. What happened? What stopped you from being a journalist? Jake asked, truly curious. There is a surplus of journalists since the digital age has reduced newspaper readership. Also, most newspapers and online columns are syndicated. That means they only need a handful of people to write, shrugged Sterling. It was a difficult job, Market. I didn't make the cut. Now you fly to other countries while serving the American people on airplanes. Jake did not think it would really compare. My next move is to try to write and publish a book. Sterling did not know why she was admitting her goal. She supposed Jake was too easy to talk to. What about? inquired Jake. Maybe about my life experiences, she admitted, or maybe just a work of fiction. People say I have a flair for the dramatic. It could be fun, and with the indie market exploding, I don't even have to worry about going through a traditional publisher if I don't want to. Indie market? Jake questioned. Independent market. Individual people publish, market, and sell on their own terms with the help of different digital platforms. Sterling had been researching the idea more and more lately. However, right now the tabloid paid the bills. Which meant she should be questioning Jake, not the other way around. Sometimes they say that you should turn your vacation into your vocation, Sterling remarked. Since you don't know what your dream job would be, what do you enjoy doing? Jake shrugged. I golf. Mostly that is a networking tool for business. What else? wondered Sterling. How dull if all he did was business and golfing. I like to cook, Jake confessed. Like barbecue or boil some soup? She puffed as she tried to keep up to his long strides. Sterling was not exactly in the worst shape. She did do a lot of cardio, running after people and sources. However, she also enjoyed a little junk food, she had to admit. Like full-on know-my-way-around-a-kitchen cook, he clarified. I've taken classes when I have time. I make a mean brownie. Brownies. Just the word made her mouth salivate. 
I always thought it would be neat to go on one of those cooking shows on the cooking channel, Jake mused. You mean like Rachel Ray or Martha Stewart? Sterling frowned. He did not seem the type for that. No, I was thinking more like Beat Bobby Flay or Iron Chef. His hands started moving as he talked, and Sterling had the inkling that when he got excited over something, he emphasized his talking with gestures. That would be cool. Cool indeed, agreed Sterling. She did not cook, nor did she see the fun in it. However, she did enjoy eating, so if he liked making brownies, she'd be happy to sample them, or anything else, since she was generally hungry. Not that she was ever going to see Jake Ramsley after they managed to get off this mountain. Sterling took out her phone, snapping a quick photo of Jake as he walked through the snow. She held the cell up and prayed for a signal. Wait, I think I have a bar! Jake practically ran back to her as Sterling dialed 911 and pressed to connect the call. No service. How can that be? There was a bar on the screen, Jake growled as he pointed to the clearly defined bar. I'll try texting 911 again. Sterling tried to resend the previous message of them being missing. She added on that they were now walking down a logging road and pressed send. Incorrect number. Unable to send message. The phone screen flashed back. Sterling looked at Jake. What now? Maybe we can send a text to someone else, suggested Jake. They can tell the police what we send to them. Good idea. She texted her brother, Brant. Brant generally texted her back within a couple hours, so he would be good to send an emergency text to. Or Sterling tried to text him. The shattered corner of the screen would not let her access her contact list. It's broken. Can you put in the number manually? questioned Jake. Sterling brought up the keyboard function and began to put in the phone number. The numbers on the screen skipped as the cell phone did not acknowledge two, five, or a six. Who do we know that does not have a two, five, or six in their phone number? Sterling said in frustration. The screen was cracked, but yesterday the phone had worked perfectly. Now it appeared the damage had progressed. They both began going through various numbers of people they knew, ruling out almost everyone from business associates to friends and family. It did not help that due to the phone keeping all the numbers in a contact list, Neither of them really had many full phone numbers that they could recall offhand. Wait, I think I've got one. Jake had been writing his numbers in the snow, trying to find one. Try 317-907-8070. Who is that? Sterling asked as she punched in the number. My cousin Max, Jake replied. He came to peer over Sterling's shoulder as she began to furiously text. At least I think that is his number. Not all the text letters worked either. It was working yesterday, she wailed in frustration. Okay, we can figure out a simple message without whatever letters that are not working, Jake assured her. It took them a good twenty minutes. Phone 911. J.R. and S.H. S.T.R.N.D.E.D. On M.T. dot P.L.N.E. C.R.S. H E D. Get cops, follow phone. Maybe we should replace P L N E with flight? Sterling asked doubtfully. The G does not work, remember? Jake frowned at the screen. Maybe just delete that and leave the crashed part? Okay. She got rid of the unnecessary word and sent it. They both waited to see what the phone would say. Message sent. Jake had a sigh of relief. Yes! Sterling grabbed him in a hug. We are going to get rescued. Ouch! Jake gasped. She quickly let him go. Sorry. It's okay. Jake assured her with a pained expression while he held his aching ribs with both hands pressed against his chest. He drew in a few shallow breaths. I am so sorry. Sterling apologized again. No worries. Jake put a hand on her shoulder. We should keep walking. Like you said, they still need to find us. Sterling nodded and allowed him to lead them onward through the snow. They walked for hours, taking small breaks and getting thirstier. Near sunset there was a small stream that was flowing. 
Jake filled up the bottle several times, and both were able to drink their fill, then refill the bottle again. It was well into dark when they found the shack on the side of the road. Sterling stumbled into Jake as he aimed the flashlight at the tiny cabin that looked like it was held together by whatever materials had been handy at the time someone was doing each repair. It looks like the home of a serial killer, Sterling grabbed Jake's sleeve. It looks like home for the night, and hopefully it has food and a stove. Jake went up to the door and found that it was not locked. We are in luck. Sterling was not so certain. She cautiously followed Jake into the small space, shutting the door behind her. Jake shone the flashlight around, showing off a small cot along one wall, a shelf with canned goods, a desk with all sorts of paperwork on it, a single chair, and a tiny stove with wood nearby. Thank you, Jake said emphatically. Whoever you are that set this up, thank you. Sterling was about to agree when something swooped at her, brushing her face. She clutched Jake's arm and screamed. Jake jumped. What is wrong with you? There is something in here. Sterling wondered if it was the ghost of the former owner. A shiver racked her frame. She hoped he was a nice ghost and was not mean or creepy. It is just us in here. Jake rolled his eyes and looked on the shelf for matches. We are in business. Sterling carefully took the blanket out from her blouse, setting the shimmering fabric on the cot. I am telling you, something touched my face. Sarah, nothing is in here, Jake repeated as he shoved some wood into the stove. Are you supposed to use the large bits? Wouldn't the small bits catch fire easier? asked Sterling. She had seen her brother and father create fires often enough, and they did not do it the way Jake did. How about you see if you can find a can opener while I get the fire going? Jake ignored Sterling and lit a match to try to start the fire. Sterling scowled at him. Leave it to a man to go all caveman in a desperate situation. It was obvious he had no clue how to start a fire. And ordering her to find the can opener? How sexist was that? especially when he had said that he was the one who liked to cook. Fine. He thought she was delusional and incapable of anything but the most basic womanly thing of opening a tin can. Yet if that stupid spider, or whatever that thing was that touched her one more time, she would— Ah! The can opener went flying from Sterling's hand, causing Jake to duck. Or maybe it was the winged creature that went flying for him. There is a bat in the shack! What on? Earth? Jake slowly stood up, and they both looked for the bat. Here! Sterling threw a blanket at Jake. Catch it with this. Catch it? Jake looked at Sterling like she had lost her mind. What am I supposed to do with it? Put it outside? She explained, ducking down as it swooped over her head again. That's what my father would always do. I'm going to risk rabies just to put a bat outside? Jake asked incredulously. What else are you going to do with it? Kill it? Bats are good for the environment. They eat mosquitoes. Sterling stayed in a crouch, despite the fact that her knee was adamantly protesting the treatment. And I am not going to sleep in here with it flying around. You get rid of it, protested Jake. You seem to know what you're doing. Be a man, Sterling shot back at him, conveniently ignoring that she had been trashing him in her head for going all macho a minute ago. I told you already, I hate camping and everything about nature. Jake glared at her. Suck it up, she replied without any sympathy. You're starting the fire wrong anyways. Get the bat, and I'll get us a blazing fire in a little stove on which you can cook dinner to your heart's content. Fine, Jake stopped and stared at her. Stay still. What? Sterling paused, her hand coming automatically halfway to her head before stopping. She turned fearful eyes to Jake. Is he in my hair? Please say he is not in my hair. Adjusting his hold on the blanket, Jake carefully stood on the cot. He slowly maneuvered himself until the right position, and then pounced at a corner of the ceiling. Aha! Did you get him? Sterling used the desk to get back to her feet. Get the door before he bites me or something, Jake ordered as he stepped off the cot. She limped to the door, flinging it open. 
The hinges squeaked in protest. I'll shut the door behind you so he does not fly back in. What am I supposed to do? Let him take revenge on me for evicting him? Jake stood in the doorway. I am not going to be outside letting him attack me as soon as he is free. He won't attack you. He'll just fly away. Sterling certainly hoped so. The last thing she wanted was for the bat to return inside the shack. How do you know? For throwing him outside into the cold to die, Jake said sarcastically. I would be upset if someone did that to me. First of all, he does not reason like a human. He's probably going to be happy to get free, Sterling retorted. Secondly, maybe he has another little cozy home he can go to. Some place he does not have to share. Or maybe he has a relative he can room with until we leave. Whatever, it is his problem. I am not going outside, Jake reiterated. Fine. Sterling grabbed the door, leaving it open just a small piece. Put your hands and the bat outside. And when you let him go, pull your hands in quick and I'll shut the door. Do not smash my fingers. I need them, he warned. I will try not to. Sterling rolled her eyes. He needed them for all those data reports he liked to study and type up. Ready? he asked. At Sterling's nod, he released the bat and pulled his hands into the tiny cabin, leaving the blanket in the snow outside. She closed the door quickly. They waited for a moment. Do you think he's gone? Well, I don't hear any minute knocks on the door. Sterling looked at Jake. Are you going to get the blanket? Not for a little while. I'd rather wait until he's gone for certain, Jake said firmly. Thought you were going to start a fire since you know all about building one. I am, Sterling smoothly remarked. She limped over to the stove. Your knee is getting worse, Jake remarked with a frown. How are the ribs? She pulled out large chunks of wood that he had placed in the tiny stove and began building a proper little pyramid with small sticks, paper, and shavings. Lighting a match, the kindling caught. Sterling gently blew on the flames until they grew and then added more sticks. Sore? Jake retrieved the can opener from the ground with a grimace. They're worse when I have to bend over or stretch. Sterling frowned as she added a couple larger pieces, then shut the door of the stove. Should we tape your ribs? I thought the doctors advised against doing that any more, Jake murmured as he perused what was available in the meager supply of canned and dry goods. Well, except for the packing tape, we don't have anything proper to bind you with anyways, shrugged Sterling. The stove is all yours, chef. Excellent. Jake selected a can, opening it. Do not expect gourmet. I'll be lucky if I don't burn anything on that stove. Sterling sat down on the cot, holding her frozen hands toward the fledging heat of the stove. I am so hungry right now, I don't care if it was burnt. You should probably pack your knee in ice, Jake commented as he looked around the small space. There are no plates. I guess we eat it out of the pan, Sterling suggested. She did not feel like moving to put ice on her leg. Hours of walking had exhausted her. There is cutlery, but no pan either. Jake frowned and peeled off the can's label. I guess we eat right out of the tin. He set three cans on the stove and then kneeled in front of Sterling. What are you doing? she asked tiredly. Taking off your shoes? Jake peeled back the silver blanket socks that they had made. Your skin is a little blue. Sterling moaned as the heat from the fire started to penetrate and Jake began massaging her feet. At first it was a little painful, and then enjoyable. She leaned back and closed her eyes. Don't fall asleep just yet, Jake warned. Supper is almost ready. We could melt snow on the stove and those cans afterward, Sterling mused. She needed to get a picture of this place. Ramsland flight attendant overnight in a tiny logging shed. Her boss would expect another line tacked on. Like, did they? Or didn't they? Well, they did not. They were far too exhausted from slogging through the snow. Not that Jake Ramsley was not fine in his own way, but they were too tired, too sore, and too hungry to think about intimate relations. It is hot, Jake mildly warned, as she accepted a can of beans and a spoon from him. Jake sat beside her as they each ate from their cans. What do you have? asked Sterling. Carrots, shrugged Jake. 
We can switch halfway if you'd like. Sure. Sterling was not feeling too picky at this point. He could have said he was eating sauerkraut, and she probably would have eaten a few spoonfuls before giving up. She was not a fan of kraut. The other can is beef stew. Jake pointed his spoon at the stove. I figure we will split it. Then, if we're still hungry, I saw a can of peaches on the shelf. Peaches, breathed Sterling. It was a feast, in her opinion. They sat in companionable silence while they ate. Between the two of them, they managed to finish off all four cans of food before giving up. Jake retrieved the blanket. Sterling stroked the stove, and they settled in for the night. Chapter 4 The next morning, Sterling woke early to the sounds of birds singing outside. Yawning, she debated snuggling back in for the warmth, or answering the call of nature. The fact that the stove had gone out, and she was hopeful of the jar of instant coffee Jake had unearthed, made her crawl out from under the covers. First, she hobbled over to the stove and got it started. Her knee had swollen further during the night, probably from all the walking they had done yesterday. It ached horribly, but she would just have to put up with it. Next, Sterling made her way outside. It was a beautiful sunrise. It would be even more beautiful if she had appropriate clothes, a coffee in hand, and indoor plumbing. Shrugging, she looked around for an appropriate spot when she saw the outhouse. Outdoor plumbing. Maybe with toilet paper? Sterling stumbled through the snow, using nearby trees to help her make her way to the tiny structure with a traditional moon cut out into the door. Wait. She hauled out her phone taking a picture of the outhouse, the shack, and the sunrise through the trees. Perfect, Sterling thought. All good fodder for an article of making their way down the mountainside to rescue. She hoped things were not evolving too rapidly elsewhere in the Ramsley family drama. Sterling had been out of touch and desperately needed to engage with her contacts for information so that she could get her articles written and submitted to Grange. The last thing she needed was Grange to declare her M.I.A. and decide to put some other climbing tabloid writer in her place to cover the Ramsleys. That could be the death of her career. As much as she would rather not work at the tabloid, Sterling was not ready for that, which meant she had to submit today, if she could just find a signal right at the outhouse, even better as it was private and Jake would have zero chance to interrupt to find her email in Grange. Sterling stepped inside, happily typing on her phone as she enjoyed the necessity. Email and photos sent, Sterling leaned back with a smile. She checked her other emails and texts. Ted S. No known allergies. Was in good health. Autopsy results support anaphylaxis shock diagnosis. Sterling quickly texted a contact she had at the Ramsley Pharmaceutical Company. This contact was fairly new, and Sterling was not sure she would be able to get the information that Sterling wanted. However, she knew of no one else except the Ramsleys themselves who might have access to this information. Mindy, need info if Ramsley Pharma ever aborted research on a drug due to allergic reactions. Thanks, Sterling. Thank goodness her email was stuck on autocorrect. Maybe they could manage to email someone since Sterling was getting a good enough signal to send out the emails. A text popped up. Who is this? You do realize it's not funny to send texts like that. Max Ramsley. Possibly their ticket out of this mess. Sterling was about to ask him for his email address when she realized that without an A it came out more like email address. She didn't think that he would get the point. Sterling looked at the phone. Three signal bars and low on battery. Pressing the call button, Sterling decided to grab Jake to convince Max of who they were. Max Ramsley, blow it up demolition services, came a deep voice over the phone. There was some static on the line, but otherwise the signal was surprisingly good. Max, this is Sarah Hawkins. I was traveling on the plane with Jake Ramsley, your cousin. The plane crashed. Sterling took a step. There was a cracking noise as a rotted board gave way under her foot. With a shriek, she fell forward, wedging her knee between the floorboards. 
A piercing pain traveled from her already swollen and hurt knee up her leg. Sterling grabbed at her knee, which was stuck between the boards, gasping in pain. Hello? Hello? Max's voice came from far away. Sterling looked around frantically. I have dropped the phone. Look, we're stranded in the mountains after the plane crashed. You need to get someone to trace this phone call, then search and rescue can find us. Hello? I can barely hear you, Max yelled from the phone. Who did you say you were? Stay on the line, Sterling called out. Jake, Jake, I need your help. My name is not Jake, replied Max. You're breaking up. Don't you dare hang up on me. Sterling could not find the phone. She tried to move her leg, but it would not budge. Jake! The door of the outhouse opened, and Jake frowned. What is going on? Down here, Sterling sagged in relief. My leg is stuck, and I'm not sure where the phone went. Going down on one knee, Jake looked at the area by Sterling's knee. Looks like the wood has rotted out. Can you get me out? she asked, blinking back tears. Her knee was throbbing. Just a moment. Jake ran back to the shack. Hey, was that Jake? Max asked excitedly. I am so glad you are okay, man. When your flight did not come in, Dylan was having all sorts of worries. We are not okay, shouted Sterling. We are stranded on a mountaintop and need you to get emergency services to look for us. Did you say the plane crashed? questioned Max. Yes, Sterling said in relief. Finally, he was starting to get their predicament. Listen, we're on a logging road in a shack of some sort. We do not know where we are. You need to phone police to tell them what I've told you. Here, Jake puffed as he carefully went down on his knees in front of Sterling. He had a block of wood in his hands. We're going to use this like a hammer to get rid of some more of the wood that does not look too good. Once I make a big enough hole, you should be able to pull your leg out. As long as I don't fall through. Sterling could not feel any bottom beneath her trapped foot. Grab hold of the doorway. Jake began pounding the wood around Sterling's leg. What is that noise? Max's voice was faint. Was that a phone? Jake stopped in surprise. Yes, there was a signal, and I thought I would try to see if I could call out. Sterling tried to budge her leg, but it remained firmly entrenched. Unfortunately, it called Max. Where is the phone? Jake looked around. It fell through the floor when I dropped it, she explained. They're stuck on a mountain, Max explained to someone on his end of the call. Do you know where you are? No. Sterling wanted to scream and pull her hair out. She's pretty sure she had already said that bit of information. Max, it's Jake, he called out as he leaned a little further into the outhouse, conscious of the rotting floor. We need you to find out who is in charge of our rescue. Let them know we're on a mountain with a logging road and a small shack. Wait a minute, I'll, I'll ask, Max said impatiently to someone. Do you know what direction the face of the mountain is? What? Sterling looked at Jake in confusion. Are you on the south side, east side, north, or west? It might help with the search part, reasoned Max. We don't have a compass, Jake sighed in frustration. We don't even know what state we are in. How can you not know? Max's voice cut in and out with static. Check the sun. We are going to lose him, whispered Sterling. The battery of the phone is low. Max, just tell us that you're going to talk to whoever is in charge of rescuing us and let them know that we are stranded. Jake listened for Max's faint reply. They heard nothing. Max? Sterling called out, but there was no answer. I guess your phone is dead, Jake stated the obvious. She swallowed hard and tried not to cry. They won't be able to find us. What do you mean? he frowned. If the battery is dead, it's not sending any signals to the cell phone towers. They can't trace us if we leave here, so they won't be able to know our location. She gave an involuntary sniffle. Sterling did not want to cry. It was useless to tear up at this sort of situation, no matter how frustrated she was. And we stay where we are, Jake said reasonably. They'll find us from the last call. 
Plus, your knee is not going to be in good shape after we get it out of the floor. What if they don't find us before the food or the wood is used? We'll have to move and they won't find us. Sterling wiped a tear away. She was going to lose her job over this. Without her cell phone, she could not take pictures, write any articles, or email them to her boss. Unless they got rescued by the end of the day, Grange was going to give her spot reporting on the Ramsleys to someone else. Hey, Jake took her cold hand in his. We can ration out the food. As long as we're warm and okay, we can stay here. Maybe someone will come by for ice fishing and be surprised that he has guests in his shack. Sterling nodded in misery. Even if Max managed to get the authorities to trace the call, it could be weeks for them to cover all the area. The logging road was a good clue, but how many logging roads were in the area? Were they passable for vehicles in the winter? Was this particular logging road even on the map? I'm going to try and get you free. Jake let go of her hand, and Sterling immediately missed the contact. She berated herself for a feeling of loss. Jake was just a source for her articles. She could not grow dependent on him. He picked up the piece of wood and began hammering beside her knee. Moments later, Sterling could feel the wood near her leg shift, and she was able to pull up her leg a little. "'Can you help me up?' she asked. Jake carefully helped her stand. Sterling took one step and gasped, sinking down as the pain from her knee protested at any weight being put on it. Here, use me as a crutch. They each wrapped their arms around the other for support to make it back to the shack, Sterling hopping on one leg through the snow. As Jake helped her to sit on the cot, Sterling groaned as a thought crossed her mind. A pin! What? Jake frowned as he carefully tore open Sterling's pants at the knee to have a look at the grotesquely swollen and bruised joint. I should have gone to Google Maps and dropped a pin on our area, Sterling lamented. I could have read the coordinates to Max, and they would have found us. Your phone may not have been able to open Google Maps, Jake reasoned. It was broken. Plus, it might not have worked anyways. The app takes data, and who knows how good of a signal was available. Three bars, she moaned. I had three bars on the phone. Jake looked at her, not sure what to say. He did not like the thought of her blaming herself. It still might not have opened the app. We'll never know now, she rubbed a hand over her eyes. I am so sorry, Jake. I should have thought before trying to phone Max and using up all the battery. It's okay. Jake sat beside her on the cot and put an arm around her shoulders drawing her close to him. You were just working on our previous plan. We gave Max all the information that we knew. We will get rescued, Sarah. I feel so stupid, Sterling said quietly. You did okay. He rubbed her back as he tried to reassure her. Next time you find yourself in this situation, you'll know exactly what to do. There will be no next time. Sterling gave an unamused huff of laughter. Quitting your job as a flight attendant, he asked. She gave him a small smile. I just don't think it was for me. If you ever need a job in the insurance industry, let me know, he offered. Thank you, but I think I'll try writing, Sterling grimaced. If she had a job when she returned to the city, she would be grateful. Some people say I have a talent for it. I promise to buy your books, Jake gave her a smile. Really? she asked in surprise. Sure. Any time someone comes in my office, I'll point to them and get a tell a great story about how we were stranded on a mountain and this impressive flight attendant saved us by calling my cousin. Jake grinned. Now you are patronizing me. She rolled her eyes. No, I'm not, because it's going to be true. Jake got up from the cot. Now I think you should lay down and elevate that knee. See if I can find something to put some snow in so you can hold it against the knee and get the swelling down. Sterling leaned back on the bed, putting the lumpy pillow below her knee. She kicked off her two tight shoes and pulled the blanket up over them for added warmth. Jake was right. She had no way of knowing if her phone would have been able to pick up their location. It was unfortunate that they would never know. If there was a way to charge the phone battery, then they might get somewhere. However, the shack had no hydro. It did not help that her phone was somewhere in the outhouse, probably underneath it. She was never getting that phone back, Sterling moaned. It had all her contact numbers. 
she was going to have to take a lot of time to rebuild that list. Fortunately, her emails were backed up, so she still had all that information saved. Jake returned with a bag filled with snow, laying it on her knee. I'll get breakfast started. Can we have coffee? she asked. How she longed for a cup. Coming right up. Jake looked through the cans on the shelf to see what was available. Hey, there's oatmeal. Sterling made a face. Not her favorite, but beggars could not afford to be picky. What do you think, peach-flavored or raisin oatmeal? Jake held up packets of instant. Oh, Sterling perked up. It had to be better than the plain oatmeal. Peach, please. Jake happily melted snow and put it around the stove. What was your childhood like? Sterling wanted to know. What do you mean? He frowned as he mixed the oatmeal with hot water. It was a typical childhood. We went to school, had friends, played sports, all the normal stuff. She rolled her eyes, even though he could not see it since his back was turned to her. How can it be typical when you were raised in one of the richest families in the country? My mom made sure it was typical. She felt it was important for us to grow up without any sense of entitlement. So we did pretty much everything normal middle-class families did. Hence the camping. Jake shrugged. I never really thought about it. I grew up with two younger brothers, and mostly we had a lot of fun. Define fun, prompted Sterling. Just fun kid stuff, shrugged Jake. We visited our cousins a lot, went to the beach, skied during the winter seasons, played golf, built a treehouse, typical stuff. Sterling had her doubts on that. Even with Beverly Ramsley's influence, some of the wealth attitude must have kicked in, because Jake sure did not do things middle class now. He had a driver, played golf on the best courses, ate at the best restaurants, flew in a private plane. What are your brothers like? Everett is out in Europe on a fool's mission trying to expand our business interests in Europe. I think it's just a waste of money. With the regulations and traditional ways of doing business over there, it's a real uphill road to try to break into the European market. I think Dad was wrong to try and expand in today's market. Jake pulled breakfast off the stove, waiting for it to cool a little before helping Sterling to sit up so that she could eat. And Dylan just got remarried, so he's probably pretty happy when he's not worried over the current mess. Thank you. Sterling sipped the coffee. It was a little strong without any sugar or cream, but she desperately needed the caffeine. Jake's revelations about the European market was not news, unfortunately. None of this was useful for her articles. Billionaire thinks he had normal childhood. Yeah, that was not going to sell papers. What was your childhood like? Jake turned the chair at the desk so that they would be facing each other. Any brothers or sisters? One brother who's older than me. Sterling smiled. I grew up in a tiny farming community. My parents own a farm and a business that employs most of the town's population. There are only about 700 people or so in Pendle since the economic turndown. I had my own horse. I was on the girls' field hockey team. Had a lot of friends. I was even a cheerleader for basketball since we did not have enough people to play football. Sterling shrugged. It was a pretty good childhood. Why did you leave? wondered Jake. Small community. Everyone knows everyone, and there just wasn't much for job opportunities, sighed Sterling. I could work in my parents' business or leave to pursue my dreams. I left. I know a few people in the press, offered Jake. I could give them your number. Maybe you could get an interview. Or, if you're interested, we have a marketing press position with the company. I think there is a spot open. Thanks. That's really nice of you. She was not about to take him up on the offer. As soon as he saw the pictures in the tabloid and realized she had taken them, he would come to the conclusion that she was Sterling Denver. Then all the little moments of camaraderie, like this one, would be suspect in his mind. Jake would probably hate Sterling more than he did already. Sterling felt a pain at the thought. The truth was, she kind of liked Jake Ramsley. He might be autocratic and sometimes a little annoying, but he had shown a lot of resilience during the hiking they had to do. He had also been nice to her making her silly pants to keep her warm, giving her the foot massage, cooking for them. He even saved her from a bat, which was way out of his comfort zone. Normally, Sterling did not have the opportunity to get to know the people she was writing about. She knew things about them, for sure, 
but to actually take the time to get to know them and talk to them? That did not happen. People generally did not want to talk to the tabloid reporter who was going to portray them in a light that probably was not too positive. If they did want to talk, it was through lawyers or to sue, or just to fling insults her way. Usually, Sterling did not give a second thought to the feelings her writing might give to any people that she wrote about. In her opinion, they were pampered, rich, and famous. A tabloid article was a minor inconvenience for them. Usually, she did not care what they thought about her. Having a negative reputation was part of the job. She cared what Jake would think about her. That was a revelation, Sterling thought in surprise. She was very much afraid that she was going to disappoint him, and the thought did not sit well with her. Jake, I'd like you to know that I've really enjoyed getting to know you, Sterling began haltingly. I should probably tell you something. Wait. Jake froze, setting down his coffee slowly. Did you hear that? What? She frowned as he went to the door and opened it, leaning out. Part of her was relieved that he had interrupted her. What had she been thinking? Confessing her pen name and having him hate her for the rest of the limited amount of time that they had together? Foolish! What if he asked her to stop writing articles about the Ramsleys? She could not afford to give up her income. It not only had to carry her own limited expenses, but she had other responsibilities that her income provided for. I hear a snowmobile, Jake listened intently. The sound of a motor was faint. Sterling heaved herself off the cot and hopped to the doorway. It's coming closer. We are getting rescued today. He grinned as he leaned down and gave her an impromptu kiss, thankful that they were finally going to be safe and on their way back to civilization. It was just a light brush of his lips against hers in a friendly way. What Jake had not expected was the physical reaction. Kissing her was like nothing he had ever experienced before, and he wanted to do it again. She blinked up at him like she could not quite believe it herself. The motor of the snowmobile was getting louder. "'I'm going to use the silver blanket to try to flag them down,' Jake tore his gaze away from Sterling, grabbing the survival blanket. "'Okay,' Sterling said a little breathlessly. "'Good idea.' Sterling watched as he made his way out into the snow following the noise of the machine. Once he was out of sight, she closed the door, stoked the fire, and sat down on the cot again, putting the homemade ice pack back on her knee. It had barely been a kiss. She smiled at the memory of it. He had just been happy to think about getting out of here and back to the normal world, she told herself. It did not mean anything, even if it had made her toes curl. So quick and fleeting, yet wow, she thought. Who knew that Jake Ramsley would be a good kisser? It could just be a form of Stockholm Syndrome. Not that either of them had been kidnapped, but they were spending a lot of time together. Surely, once Sterling had seen other people, she would not find Jake quite so attractive any more. She might even wonder what she had seen in him in the first place. That is what she told herself, as all sorts of irrational worries crossed her mind as time passed. Thoughts of Jake falling down an abandoned mine or well, or some of the snowmobilers deciding to capture Jake for a ransom after they recognized him, or of him getting lost in the wilderness. He had admitted that he was poor at camping. It only followed reason that he would not be good with a sense of direction. Sterling calmed herself with the thought that they had both shown streaks of practical behavior during this ordeal. Jake would be okay, and he would find the snowmobiler. Hopefully, they would be on their way out of the forest and mountains at any moment. She added wood to the fire and put on a little more water for coffee. Sitting at the desk, Sterling shifted through the papers that had been left out. Mostly, she wanted to combat boredom, yet there might be a clue as to where they were just in case Jake did not manage to snag the snowmobiler's attention. There might even be a map. Excited at the thought, Sterling shuffled through the paperwork. There were old bills, some awful poetry about the landscape, a list of things to do which ironically included replacing the rotting boards in the outhouse floor, and plans for a chicken coop. Frowning, Sterling wondered why the person who owned the shack had abandoned it, or if they were coming back. Maybe they chose to winter elsewhere, or perhaps they were visiting someone. 
pondering at what their mysteriously absent host might be doing sterling looked at the dusty wallpaper until she noticed it was a series of lines and written words grabbing a dirty towel she dusted off the old and yellowed paper to find a map held onto the wall by four thumbtacks eureka sterling carefully removed the aged map from the wall and looked it over if she could figure it out where they were in relation to this map they might be able to walk out of here to the town that was listed on the corner of the map let's see sterling muttered as she read mountain top coves fishing pond old bernie's place called side Road. i don't think i would want to go to den's misery jerry's logging road they could possibly be on jerry's logging road sterling studied the map prime hunting here buckshot caves terry whittle homestead and the little town is called yurt siding she hoped they were at old bernie's place if that were true then they could walk to the homestead then onward to the town taking called side road if this was a map of the area that they were currently in sterling turned the creased paper over to see if anything was on the back notes lots of handwritten notes big buck found two miles west due to old b's place jerry's men over the boundary again august second nineteen eighty eight crossed half a mile onto bernie's land documented chickmunk invaded cabin today three hours to evict the creature found old wellhead covered with boards for safety six ounce dust from the week of panning mountain top chipmunk returned put crumb trail out of door eventually left found bear trap one mile northeast of ollie oak tree disabled chipmunk again left door open so could leave not feeding it this time documented another incident of jerry's logging over boundary line august twenty sixth nineteen eighty eight named chipmunk larry sterling giggled as she read through the rest of the notes noting that larry the chipmunk had turned into quite a pet the worst part was now knowing that the map was probably irrelevant due to its age turning back to the map she saw a tiny little sticker i don't know waldo sterling remarked dryly where am i the little sticker silently stared back at her through his thick glasses not that she expected an answer the door opened startling sterling she turned in her chair to find jake gratefully warming himself by the stove how did it go did you talk to the snowmobiler never talked to him admitted jake frowning i managed to spot him and wave the blanket but i don't think he saw it if he did he's a real jerk cause he never came to investigate sterling slumped in disappointment not that the little shack was not a lifesaver and cosy but they had to get back to their lives i found a map really jake brightened let's have a look it's thirty years out of date sterling handed it over it could still be relevant jake's brows furrowed as he looked at all the different landmarks you grew up in the city right do you know how many streets and places get built or torn down in thirty years sterling asked reasonably this is not the city the countryside logical to assume that land is developed more slowly here there should be fewer changes he turned the map looking out the window trying to place where they might be in contrast to the logging road she smiled ruefully i suppose you've never heard of the direction story then what direction story he asked absently well if you want to reach the davis farm you need to take second line out past the milliners turn right before the bridge Take the left fork in the road at Ma Benson's old place, which is now the Talbots, since it brought it three years ago. Then, past the church that burnt down last spring, take a left again. It's on the right side, past the good peach orchard, not to be confused with the bad peach orchard. If you see the old country schoolhouse, you've gone too far, finished Sterling. People do not give directions like that. Jake gave her a look of disbelief. People do where I'm from, she shrugged. Country life is a little different. How would anyone know where they're going if they had never seen the landmarks? He questioned. Usually someone will get in the car with them to direct the stranger. They'll also question the person about why they're in town. Sterling smiled at the memory. 
Once it was an insurance guy who was overcharging Ma Benson on her life insurance policy. The boys had him turning in circles until he ran out of gas. He had to walk back to town in his fancy loafers and suit to purchase a jerry can for the Jaguar he was driving. Ma Benson is a real person? Jake was entertained and surprised. Yes, this was a real-life example I just gave you. Sterling had a smile at his expression. For a moment she thought it would be fun to take him back to her rural roots to see how he would cope with all the people she had grown up with. That was a dangerous thought, she sternly admonished herself, tantamount to wishing to introduce him to her parents, something that was never going to happen. Sterling needed to stop seeing Jake as a friend. He was just someone to write about. Chapter 5 They Argued Jake thought that due to Sterling's knee he should set out alone with the map. He felt he would make better time without her and could bring back help. He was probably right. Except Sterling was convinced he might get lost. He already said he sucked at camping and had no life skills for the forest. She was even more worried since he proposed taking a shortcut on the map if it proved that the pond did exist where the two of them had reasoned it might be. They pored over the paper for most of the afternoon, debating where things were and where they should be on the map. After dinner, they knew exactly where they were. It had been a total coincidence. Jake had gone out to get more snow to melt on the stove for drinking water when he stopped in the doorway. Sarah, you need to see this, he said as he looked at markings carved into the door frame. With Jake's help, Sterling hopped to the doorway. She squinted against the afternoon sun as it shone through the snow. The markings were faint and old, but still readable. Waldo's hut. The only reason I noticed it was the angle of the sun. Jake traced a finger over the letters in the wood. It was in the shadows otherwise. Do you think the Waldo sticker on the map is where we are? Sterling looked at Jake excitedly. He grinned back. I do. It had changed the entire situation. Now that they had a sense of direction, a chance to find their way into the town of Earth's siding, they knew the general direction of the sun. They were on Jerry's logging road. All they had to do was follow it past Buckshot Caves to call it Side Road and then to town. Yet Jake thought that he should set off alone, go through Den's misery to the Terry Whittle homestead, since it was closer on the map. He felt they should take the chance and get assistance from the Terry Whittles. Sterling argued that the Terry Whittles were probably dead, or had moved to a retirement home, leaving their house abandoned since the thirty years the map had been issued. Earth's siding was the most likely source of rescue. Plus, there was no need to take any shortcuts to get to the town, so there was no risk of getting lost. There was a risk of not reaching it before nightfall, and risk of exposure. Neither of them were good at judging distance on the map. There was no legend to say how many miles long the road was. It could be that called Side Road was just out of sight around the next bend in the logging road, or it could be twenty miles. Then, who knew how many more miles to Earth's siding? They just did not know. Which led to the third option, to shelter in place until food or wood ran out and hope for an unlikely rescue before then. It did not help that Sterling did not want to be left behind, sitting in the cabin, warm, toasty, and worrying. She would worry about Jake, and that was a problem. Sterling was getting to like him far too much. It also crossed her mind that he might find out just who she was, and decide not to rescue her. While she did not think Jake was like that, they had only known each other for a short time. Okay, so he probably would have other people rescue her than slap a non-disclosure agreement at her, Sterling thought. Finally, they agreed to sleep on it, and Sterling woke up alone the next day. Jake? She frowned as she noticed one of the survival blankets missing, a few cans of food missing, a knapsack left by Waldo, their absent host, was missing. Sterling felt the stirrings of anger as she hobbled around the small shack. There was a note on the desk, along with her phone, most telling of all, the map was missing. Sarah, I found your phone. Thought you might like to have it, even if the battery is dead. 
decided to compromise. I will walk to Earth's siding to get help. Stay in the shack, Jake. For the love of fudge and wine! Sterling growled into the empty air before letting out a huff and sitting down on the cot. How dare he! She would go after him, except Sterling knew that she would slow him down if she did even manage to catch up to him. Her knee felt a little better, but it was not up to walking speed and probably would only be injured worse at the end of the day. What he should have done was wait until her heel was healed enough that both of them could set out together. He was not thinking, and she could prove it. CEO of Ramsley Insurance sets off into snowstorm with canned food but no can opener. How does he even run a business? Grange would not like that headline. It was too bizarre, even though it was true. What did Jake think he was going to do? Run into a bear with a can opener and politely ask to use it? There was no wind outside, but big fat flakes were falling. Sterling could make them out through the dusty window. At the very least, Jake should have waited until it was not snowing. He was going to get lost. She just knew it. Sterling was going to give herself an ulcer from worry. Resolving to ignore the worry and try to stay mad at him, she made herself a cup of coffee. As she was reaching for a pack of instant oatmeal, something furry skittered over her hand, scrambling to get away from her. Sterling screamed, snatching back her hand. Stumbling backward to get away, she fell onto the cot as the blur of fur ran under it. Where was Jake when she needed him? Sterling clutched at the side of the cot as she peered underneath it, looking for the rodent. It had better not be a rat. She did not do well with rats. Or mice, for that matter. They were kind of like bats without the wings, but having tails instead. From the corner of the cot, a chipmunk gazed back at her in confusion. Sighing in relief, Sterling let herself relax. Hello, little Larry descendant. She decided to let him be. He probably would not get into much of anything and was terrified of her. It was likely the little creature would leave as soon as she stopped looking at him. Plus, he was a cutie. A box caught her eye. It was dusty and at the far corner under the bed. Sliding gently off the cot, Sterling winced as her knee made careful contact with the floor. She reached under, pulling the box toward herself as the chipmunk scampered away. Sitting up, Sterling lifted the lid to see what was inside. A flare gun and three flares greeted her. Setting the box on the desk, Sterling managed to get back up on her feet. She sat at the desk and took the gun out of the box. It looked the same as the flare gun her Uncle Jim Bob had had for his boat. Jim Bob taught Sterling and her brother Brandt how to load and fire the flare gun. Sterling had once threatened to shoot Dixby Cooley with one, when he got a little fresh after prom and they went fishing in their finery, small-town living was sometimes an interesting thing. Checking over the gun to see if there was any obvious reason to her untrained eye that it would not work, Sterling carefully loaded it. With the snow falling thickly outside, it would not be of much use. However, if it let up and she heard another snowmobile, she was now prepared to catch their attention. It would be funny if she saved the day when Jake was still tromping around in the snow. Jake plowed through another drift on the road. He hoped he was making good time because the last thing he wanted was to be stuck out in the elements when night came. It was not that cold right now, but the snow was coming down at an alarming rate, making it hard to see all that far in front of him. He did not want to admit that Sarah might have had a point about sheltering in place until her knee was better. Already he missed her company. Chatting with her would have made the journey feel shorter and the time fly by faster. By himself, he was a little bored. Sarah Hawkins, from a tiny town called Pendle, Jake mused. She was the first woman in a long time to catch his attention. He liked her forthright way of talking, her spunky attitude, and the fact that she did not pander to him. That's probably due to the nature of their close proximity since the plane crash and being stranded, but Jake liked Sarah. She was a bit of a mess. Even when they had argued yesterday, he had enjoyed it. She gave as good as she got. 
It had been fun to be challenged and to have to argue the point. As CEO of Ramsley Insurance, Jake often just told his co-workers what was going to happen, and it simply did. Rarely did he have to assert his authority or his intelligence in an argument. It had been refreshing to battle wills with Sarah. Now he needed to make sure that he rescued her. Not only as a point of pride, since Jake had gone off this morning determined to make a rescue happen, but also for their survival. He refused to call it sneaking away while Sarah was sleeping. He did not sneak, and if Sarah had not slept so deeply, she would have woken up on time to catch Jake. Truth was, Jake liked her. He had not truly liked a woman in a long time. People always tended to want something from him, part of the Ransley dynasty, or his money, or his business connections, or whatever. They did not seem to like hanging around Jake for just himself. So Jake had a few friends and rarely ever dated. It was much simpler that way. Yet Jake liked Sarah. He liked her open, fresh way of talking, the way she invited him to share the joke with her when she was happy, the way she managed to get into trouble, the way she smiled and how she talked herself through instructions. He was smitten, as his mother would say. Jake had the feeling Beverly would like her. He gave his head a shake. It was far too soon to think thoughts like introducing her to his mother. He had only known her for three days. Even so, Jake wanted to get to know her better. Maybe, after they were on their way and back on their travels, he could get her phone number and a promise to see him again. Satisfied with that idea, Jake continued to make his way through the snow until he came across a split in the road. There were no street signs, nor was either way plowed. Pulling out the map, Jake studied it. This was not on the map. Jake frowned and looked at both the fork on the road and at the map. They just did not correlate. Sarah had said that things might have changed, and she was right. What did they know about how long logging roads were upkept? Jerry's logging road on the map listed toward the right, so Jake decided to go right and hope that he was going in the direction of the town. Sterling was bored, incessantly bored. There was no one to talk to. She could see how Waldo had named a chipmunk Larry and chatted to it. Her phone was dead. Sterling was afraid to make notes on real paper and carry them around to possibly get discovered by Jake. For some reason, Waldo was not a reader, so there were no books in the small cabin. After playing solitaire for the hundredth time with an old deck that was missing the eight of clubs, Sterling was going stir-crazy. It did not help that she was constantly getting up, opening the door, and listening for any sound that might be a snowmobile passing by. Sterling was starting to annoy herself with how many times her mind had made up the sound. The snow was piling up. If Jake got lost, he would not be able to retrace his tracks. Worrying over him was becoming second nature, and Sterling did not like it. She told herself that she was just concerned about getting rescued, not about Jake freezing to death in the snowy wilderness. Not that she would want that to happen to anyone. Sterling huffed out a sigh as she slid a ten of spades into place. A faint noise of a motor came to her ears, but she ignored it. Sterling had been out in the snow too many times today, chasing phantom machines, ready to shoot off the flare gun at a moment's notice. Then again, if she missed the opportunity to escape this little shack all because she refused to track down whether or not there was a snowmobile outside. Tossing the card in her hand to the side, Sterling pushed herself to her feet, grabbed the flare gun, and headed to the door. Pulling it open, she listened as the snow fell rapidly. There was a motor. She was certain of it. Stepping out into the snow, she forged a path to the logging road. It was snowing so thickly that she could barely see the shack in the waning light, even though she had left the door open, and the stove had a glass window in its little door which would let some light bathe the interior when the fire was lit. Sterling raised the flare gun above her head and hoped that the snowmobiler would see it in the snow. She pulled the trigger and watched as an orange glow appeared above her head. In the gloom, it was not as bright as Sterling would like it. She could only hope that the snowmobiler would see it and come this way. 
There were still two more flares. She probably had just wasted the one that she had fired since it was snowing quite heavily. Sterling sighed and decided she was not going to use another flare tonight. It had been a long shot for anyone to even see the flare in this storm. She hobbled back to the shack, disappointed and discouraged. Hey! Hey! Jake yelled, waving his hands in the air as the lights from the snowmobiles cut across the road at dusk. He had gotten as far as called Side Road, and had been steadily marching towards Earth's siding. There had even been a sign pointing toward the destination, which had made Jake feel a lot better about his odds of getting to the town versus getting lost. Jake stepped into the way of the headlights, praying that they were not going so fast as to run him over. Over here! The two machines slowed to a crawl, pulling up beside him. A man popped open the visor on his helmet. Hi! A little far from home? asked the snowmobiler. Jake Ramsley. Jake held out his hand in greeting. My plane crashed up further on the mountain. I was walking to Earth's siding to try to get help. Earth's siding? The snowmobiler laughed as he shook Jake's hand. That's a ghost town! Hasn't been anyone there for years. Better to go on to Carver's Bend. Nice little town. I'm Lenny Walsh. No one lives in Earth's siding? Jake questioned with a little disappointment. He would have walked there and not found the help that they needed. Not a living soul, confirmed Lenny. He pointed to the other snowmobiler. That's Frank. Hop on and we'll take you to our truck up the highway. Then I can drive you to Carver's Bend. Wait. Jake shook his head at Lenny's offer. There's another person stuck at Waldo's cabin back up on Jerry's logging road. She has an injured knee and is going to need medical care. We need to go back for her. Waldo's cabin? Frank looked at Lenny. Do you know where that is? Lenny whistled. That's a way back. You walked from there? Yes, Jake replied. He was tired. He was also glad that he had run into these two men, unless Jake was dreaming in the snow right now. Then he was in danger of freezing to death. Jake had heard about how people hallucinated when hypothermia set in, although, from what he understood, people generally thought they were someplace warm and ended up taking off their coats before curling up on the snow like they were at the beach. Jake was not at the beach, nor did he think he was dreaming. Still, he pinched his hand just to be sure. It was so numb it did not hurt, and that worried Jake a little. It has been a long day. No kidding! Lenny looked at him a little closer. You said there was a plane crash? I think I saw him on the television. Hey, Frank, didn't the news say there was a reward for him? I think you were right, Frank commented excitedly. That's nice. Jake would give them a reward himself if he could just get these two boneheads to rescue him and Sterling. I need to go back to Waldo's cabin to get Sarah. No can do, Lenny said firmly. What? Jake was incredulous. They could not possibly be serious about leaving a woman in the forest to fend for herself. We're running low on gas. Lenny tapped the fuel gauge. Got enough to reach the truck, but we'll need to fill up the gas station. If we go back, we'll just end up stranded. How close is the nearest gas station? asked Jake, relieved that they were not going to abandon Sarah. Then we can come back for Sarah afterward. Nearest gas station is Carver's Bend, supplied Frank. About a two-hour drive. Two hours? echoed Jake in disbelief. At this rate, it would be halfway the night before they got back to Sarah. Hop on! invited Frank. Sooner we get to town, the sooner you can come back for your friend. You're going to be cold in that suit, Lenny eyed Jake's attire critically. I am already cold. Jake took the extra helmet that Frank offered and put it on before straddling the large machine. He had never been on a snowmobile before and quickly grabbed Frank as they accelerated far too fast for Jake's liking. Soon, Jake realized there was a difference between cold and windchill cold. When he was hiking through the snow, Jake had managed to generate some heat for his body. 
He also had the luxury of walking with his hands in his pockets to keep them warmer. On the snowmobile, he was forced to hold on for dear life since Frank and Lenny drove at excessive speed on the roadway. Within minutes, his fingers felt frozen stiff and his body felt a chill embed itself within his bones. He wondered if he was going to die of exposure before they made it to the truck. Jake hoped desperately that the truck was equipped with a working heater. Maybe it was a good thing that they were not going back for Sarah right away. He would hate to have her be this cold during the ride to the plowed roadway. Neither of them had been dressed for the elements, yet fortunately it had been rather mild. When he got to Carver's Bend, Jake was going to make sure they had appropriate gear for himself and Sarah when they went back to Waldo's cabin. That was if Jake still had any fingers left to use to do up a zipper. Frank slowed as they neared a bend, and a few minutes later the lights of the snowmobile shone on a pickup truck that was parked alongside a plowed road. Lenny pulled up first, cutting the motor to his machine before getting off. A trailer was attached to the pickup. Lenny let down the gate, using it as a ramp for the two snowmobiles. Frank let Jake off the machine, taking his helmet and giving Lenny a set of keys. Better get him inside and warmed up. It had taken Jake two tries to get his shaking frame off the snowmobile. He was so cold. All he could think about was getting inside the pickup with the heat turned on full blast. Lenny let him in, and Jake gratefully held his hands to the dash as Lenny turned on the truck. Is there a hospital at Carver's Bend? There's a clinic. Don't think it's open this time of night, shrugged Lenny. Got some first aid people at the fire and police station. You heard anywhere? Just frozen through, Jake's teeth were chattering. As the dash began kicking out heat, his hands were starting to hurt. I'm more worried about Sarah's knee. I'm more worried about your toes, responded Lenny. Loafers are not exactly fit for hiking through the snow. There was nothing else available, Jake acknowledged with a lift of a shoulder. His feet were pretty numb. He was not looking forward to finding out just how bad of frostbite he probably had gotten. Maybe Jake could bribe them to open the clinic to deal with their injuries. Frank slid into the passenger seat. All secure and ready to go. How much did you say the reward was for this guy, anyways? Don't remember. Lenny helped Jake with his seatbelt since Jake's hands were far too shaky to be able to insert the tongue into the buckle. It was pretty substantial, though. "'Enough for a beer?' laughed Frank. "'Maybe enough to open a beer store,' commented Lenny as he pulled onto the icy road. "'It is not a bad idea in these parts.' "'Wow!' Frank stopped laughing and looked at Jake with a new-found respect. "'How much?' "'Since I have not watched the news, I cannot really comment,' said Jake dryly. Likely, Dylan had overreacted and offered far too much money for any information leading to Jake's whereabouts. However, I assure you that the reward will be paid. Maybe we should ransom him for more money, Frank mused as he eyed Jake. Do not even think about it. Jake's voice cut out icily in the truck. It was a tone of voice that he rarely had to use in the boardroom, but when he did, it was effective. There is no need to be greedy. For a moment, he wondered at the two men he now found himself sharing company with. Would his rescuers put him in an even worse situation? Then who would rescue Sarah? Leaving the truck did not seem like a good option, first because he was still half frozen and unlikely to survive a night outside, secondly because he did not know exactly where he was. I was just kidding. Frank offered from the back seat. Frank, leave the guy alone. Lenny grimaced as he maneuvered a particularly slushy patch of roadway. He's not in a joking mood. Frank grumbled as he leaned back, looking out the window. Jake was just thankful they were no longer talking about essentially kidnapping and holding him for ransom. He was also thankful his hands had stopped the searing pain and were now just pins and needles as they thawed out. Head nodding, Jake did not notice when he drifted off to sleep. When the motor quit on the truck, Jake jerked his chin off his chest, looking bleary-eyed out the window. 
Street lights were on as snow fell gently down on a picturesque street. "'Welcome to Carver's Bend,' commented Lenny as he got out of the truck. Stiffly, Jake undid his seatbelt. As he emerged from the pickup, he noticed that they were at the police station. "'Come on, Jack,' grinned Frank. "'We're going to collect that reward on you.' "'It's Jake.' Jake corrected the man, then wondered why he cared. Help, it was literally a few dozen feet away. Finally, someone would go and rescue Sarah. A profound feeling of relief swamped Jake as he made his way up the icy sidewalk to the building, escorted by Frank and Lenny. "'Hey, Justin!' Frank yelled in the empty front lobby. "'We'd like to collect a reward for capturing this guy.' Lenny rolled his eyes. "'Not for capturing him. He's not wanted or anything. It's a reward for finding him because he was lost.' "'What is going on?' A tired-looking man in a brown uniform came forward with a yawn. "'There is no need to yell.' Jake decided to take charge of the situation before it got out of hand. Stepping forward, he offered a hand in greeting to the officer. "'Jake Ramsley.' I have been missing since Tuesday, after our plane crashed on the mountain. I believe the gentlemen with me are expecting a reward, which I am sure my family will be happy to provide once I can contact them. Justin shook Jake's hand, sizing him up. You're that billionaire from the news that has gone missing? I'll need to see some identification. Absolutely. Jake pulled out his wallet, handing over his license. There's still another person from the plane and a cabin not far from here. She has an injury and needs to be rescued. Justin frowned as he typed in some information from the driver's license into the computer. You've got an unpaid parking ticket. Excuse me? Jake did not see how that was remotely relevant. There's a person still missing on the mountain, and you're worried about a parking ticket. It's in violation of the law. Justin typed a few more words with his index finger only, taking his time. I will be happy to pay the ticket, growled Jake. He could not think of why he would have a ticket, unless it was an extremely old one, since he now used a driver in a company car nearly all the time. How much is it? With the latest fees and interest. Justin trailed off as a woman in uniform entered the station. She raised an eyebrow at the gathering. Can I help you? Lenny pulled off his woolen hat, causing his hair to stand on end. Hello, Sheriff Terry Whittle. Frank mumbled a greeting as well, shuffling a little behind Lenny as if to shield himself from the law woman. Look, interrupted Jake, I am happy to pay the ticket. However, I think it's a little more important to get a plan together to rescue Miss Hawkins. Justin, are you trying to scam this man out of money? frowned Terry Whittle. I told you that if I caught you doing that trick again, you would be cleaning the cars for the next month. Justin sighed. He's loaded. He could have spared a little change for our petty cash. Knock it off. She pinned Jake with a hard look. Who is Miss Hawkins? The other passenger on the plane. Jake explained, tamping down his frustration. What kind of town was this? His plane crashed, Lenny helpfully supplied. He's the guy from the news with a reward out on him. I am not wanted, Jake said dryly as Terry Whittle eyed him with suspicion. My family appears to have put up a reward for my safe return. Identification, she asked firmly, holding out her hand. Your deputy has it, responded Jake. It checks out. Justin sourly replied, holding out Jake's driver's license for the sheriff's perusal. It is a nice reward, also. Too bad it goes to these two bumpkins. Hey, we found him, Frank said hotly. Frank, I thought I told you not to come into my station again unless it was an actual emergency, Terry Whittle said mildly as she inspected the identification. Mr. Ramsley, welcome to Carver's Bend. Jake gratefully took his driver's license back as she offered it to him and shook her hand. Thank you. If you will have a seat, 
I'll grab a local map and we can pinpoint where your traveling companion is. Terry Whittle moved to a filing cabinet. No need for that, Lenny spoke up. He blushed a little as the sheriff's eyes turned on him. She's at Waldo's cabin, according to Mr. Ramsley. I know where that is. We can have the snowmobiles gassed up and ready in no time. Gas them up, Lenny. I want you and those snowmobiles back at the station as soon as possible. She pulled out the map and set it on the desk in front of Jake with a pen. You and I will head out to the cabin. Justin, you will stay here with Mr. Ramsley, and we will keep you advised on any updates as they happen. Contact Doc Luce and have him come over here to look at our guest and be available for when our second rescue comes in. What am I supposed to do? Frank asked with a frown. Disappear? Terry Whittle suggested unkindly. Lenny jammed his hat back on. Come on, Frank, let's go gas up the truck and machines. I have a map. Jake lowered himself into a chair near the desk and pulled out the map that had come from the cabin. The Waldo sticker is where the cabin is. Where did you get this? Justin scowled at the old map. From Waldo's cabin, sighed Jake. These people were beginning to get tiresome. Since he needed their help, Jake tried to tamp down his impatience. Could we just get on to rescuing Sarah? I don't care about the cost. I will foot the bill. I'd just like to have her safe. Justin's eyes lit up at Jake's words, but Terry Whittle frowned at her deputy. Do not go off half-cocked, Justin. Search and rescue is in the yearly budget. I appreciate the thought, Mr. Ramsley. I'll ensure that we do everything possible to find your traveling companion and bring her back to Carver's Bend as soon as possible. Thank you. Jake felt a little relief at her speech. She marked off where Waldo's cabin was on her map, folded it up, and put it in her parka. If you don't mind, I'd like you to take your map with us as well. Terry Whittle accepted the map from Jake. You can also use our phone. I'm sure your family will be happy to hear from you. Again, thank you. Jake resolved to contribute to the police budget. Even if Justin was annoying, and if the sheriff brought back Sarah, then she deserved something. Maybe a new vehicle, or money for new uniforms. Under Terry Whittle's questions, Jake explained about the plane crash, where some of the wreckage might be, his and Sarah's hike down the mountain, then finding Waldo's cabin, which was really more of a shack. Now that he was in the safety of the police station, the story seemed a little surreal. Lenny came back in, stomping off snow and yanking off his hat again, before running a hand through his hair in a useless attempt to smooth it out. All ready to go. Where is Frank? Terry Whittle asked dryly. I dropped him off at home. Lenny squeezed his hat in his hands, shifting from foot to foot. You do know that his snowmobile license is revoked. Justin mentioned casually. Lenny's eyes widened. No, he didn't tell me that. Terry Whittle sighed. Mind the shop, Justin. Let's go, Lenny. Yes, ma'am. Lenny pulled his hat on almost over his eyebrows as he followed the sheriff out the door. He has a thing for your boss, Jake commented absently. He probably should not have said anything. It was not his place. But Jake was so tired, he supposed it had just slipped out. No kidding. Justin put the phone in front of Jake. It was an old, rotary-style antique. If you want to make some calls, here is the phone. Jake debated asking if Justin was serious, but the young deputy went back to typing on his computer. It looked like an old 90s throwback with the large monitor. Maybe a technology upgrade was in order for this place. Jake shrugged internally and picked up the receiver to find a dial tone. Thank goodness his grandmother had owned one of these and he had used it as a kid. Otherwise, he would not have known how to operate the phone. Dialing Dylan's number, Jake waited for the call to go through. Hello? Dylan said hurriedly into the phone. Dylan, it's Jake. He identified himself. Jake! There was palpable relief in Dylan's voice. Where are you? What happened? You would not believe what has been going on. I was in a plane crash. Jake kept his voice calm. I'm okay. 
I'm in a small town called Carver's Bend. Carver's Bend? Never heard of it. Where even is that? asked Dylan. Not too sure. Jake glanced at Justin, but decided not to ask him. The important thing is I'll probably be on my way to New York later tomorrow, or the next day. Did Everett fly in? Yes, he's here, replied Dylan. We were worried about you when we did not hear from you. I'm fine, Jake repeated for Dylan's benefit. The pilot unfortunately did not make it. However, I and the flight attendant, Sarah Hawkins, are fine. Jake, did you just say the flight attendant was fine? Dylan's tone of voice sounded a little weird. Yes, why? What's wrong? frowned Jake. Her name is not Sarah Hawkins, and she is not a flight attendant, he informed his brother. What? Jake's stomach dropped. Dylan had to be wrong. Her name was Sarah, and she was a flight attendant. Otherwise, she would not have been permitted to be on the flight. There was security to make sure of that. Who else could she be? Dylan gave a reluctant sigh. She is Sterling Denver. No. Jake bit out the word. He closed his eyes and took in a deep, calming breath, wishing he could shut out Dylan's words. It's all over the tabloid dubious. They're milking your disappearance with their star writer for all they are worth. Dylan explained patiently. Yesterday, there were pictures taken from the inside of the plane, with you working on your laptop, splashed all over the front page. Today, it was pictures of a cozy little cabin. The headline said something like, Love Nest for Two? It's her, Jake. It's Sterling Denver. She's been lying to you the entire time. Chapter 6 Never had Sterling been so happy to see anyone. When she woke to the sound of snowmobiles, then had them come right to the cabin where she was standing in the doorway, she had just about danced for joy despite her aching knee. Rescued at last. Miss Hawkins? The uniformed woman asked as she took off her helmet. Yes. Sterling wanted to cry in relief, but she held the tears back. That's me. Have you found Jake Ramsley? He set out yesterday morning for Earth's siding. Is he okay? We found him, came the curt reply. Will you be all right to ride on one of the snowmobiles? Otherwise we'll have to hook up a sled, and I'd prefer not to do that in the dark. I can ride, Sterling confirmed. Her reporter's sense kicked in to what the officer had said. Visions of them finding Jake half buried in a snowbank filled her with worry. You found Jake. Is he all right? Is he hurt? He's fine. The male snowmobiler said as he held out a gloved hand, Lenny Walsh. Sarah Hawkins. Sterling returned the handshake, relieved that Jake was really okay. This is Sheriff Terry Whittle. Lenny gestured to the woman, who was pulling a bag of snowmobiler's gear out of a compartment. We've got some warmer clothes for you. Thank you, smiled Sterling. I cannot thank you both enough. You wouldn't happen to be one of the Terry Whittles from the Terry Whittle homestead mentioned on Mr. Waldo's map? asked Sterling. My parents still live there. The sheriff helped Sterling with the boots that they had brought along. Cold side road does not get plowed in the winter months, so I check on them weekly. I live in Carver's Bend. What happened to Earth's siding? wondered Sterling. Jake had been headed in that direction. Earth's siding is a ghost town. Shut down when the mining operation went bust twenty years ago. It was just not profitable anymore, so everyone moved away, explained Terry Whittle. That's too bad. Sterling zipped up the coat and put on her gloves. It happens to a lot of small towns based on one large company business. Sterling knew all about that. Her hometown was built around farming and one large employer who was struggling to keep its doors open. We can take you to Carver's Bend. I have Dark Luce waiting to examine your knee, said Terry Whittle. You should have examined Miss Ramsley by now. Sterling nodded and accepted Lenny's arm to hop outside to the snowmobiles. Terry Whittle closed the door after them, and they were on their way through the falling snow, retracing the tracks back to the truck, then on to Carver's Bend. When they pulled up to the police station, 
Lenny and Terry Woodle helped Sterling out of the truck. She hopped into this warm building, happy to be someplace safe. Sterling looked around, but all she saw was a deputy, sourly typing with one finger at an ancient computer. Where is Jake? Sterling looked around, but did not see him. He left, the deputy supplied unhelpfully. Where did he go, Justin? Did Doc Luce take him to the clinic? Terry Whittle removed her gloves, tossing them on a desk. Mr. Rich Guy ordered a private helicopter to pick him up at the medevac site, shrugged Justin. He didn't even wait for Doc Luce. A helicopter? In this weather? frowned Terry Whittle. That is dangerous. I told him so, but he wouldn't listen. Said he had to get to New York, and he managed to hire someone to do it. Justin pulled out a pencil from behind his ear, tapping it on the desk. I drove him to the pad myself. He just left? Sterling was a little disappointed. She thought Jake would at least wait to see that she was safe before returning to his world. It had seemed like they had become friends during their ordeal being stranded on the mountain. She ignored the little ache that his leaving left behind. Oh, he said something about how I could tell Sterling Denver that she was done messing with his family. Justin shook his head. I think being out in the cold has affected his brain. Who is Sterling Denver? questioned a confused Terry Whittle. She's some tabloid reporter from New York, Justin motioned to his computer. She writes for dubious. Sterling bit the inside of her cheek in an attempt not to react. Jake knew. He knew she was Sterling Denver, and he was not pleased at all. It sounded like he was very angry. While Sterling had anticipated a reaction like that when he found out, she did not think he might threaten her. Probably he would call her boss and try to have her reassigned to another department. Jake might even want to get her fired. Unless he bribed Grange with a lot of money, it would not happen. Even then, Grange was ordinary enough that he probably would enjoy Jake's anger and just goad him back, keeping Sterling firmly as the tabloid's feature writer. Sterling reflected that she had never felt bad about her job before. Even when she exaggerated, she had never outright lied in any of her articles. She had been doing everything she could to promote her career, just like all the writers in her field were doing. However, Sterling had made the Ramsley family one of her favorite targets, and Jake obviously did not approve. She did not need his approval, Sterling told herself firmly. She did not need him to like her. Just because they spent a few days together getting to know one another, did not mean that they were friends for life. He was just someone she was writing about. Sterling told herself those lies, and a few others. Here's Doc Luce now. Terry Whittle introduced a little old man who carried a bag with him. He looked to be a hundred years old, but was competent in his tasks. Soon enough it was determined that Sterling should stay off her knee, and it should be examined more fully at the clinic when it opened tomorrow. Doc Luce felt that it was nothing more than a difficult sprain with bruising, but would feel more reassured in his diagnosis once Sterling had visited the clinic to have some tests done. With a room at a local bed and breakfast secured for the night, some donated clothes, and a cord to restore power to her phone, Sterling felt almost normal after carefully maneuvering in a hot shower. Elevating her leg on a pillow while reclining on the bed, Sterling looked at Dubious's website. Considering the remote location of the town, she was surprised at the download speed of the Internet. Eligible bachelor and stunning tabloid writer still missing. Exclusive photos of Love Shack in a winter wonderland. Did the plane really crash, or is Jake Ransley simply hiding away from his troubles with rumored girlfriend Sterling Denver? Is this how the famed reporter was able to build her career on the reputation of the Ramsley family? Sterling snapped her mouth shut and dialed her boss, Ray Grange. It took three tries on the smash screen, but the call went through. Ray Grange, dubious. Why not just call the tabloid devious instead, hissed Sterling. Seriously, Grange, who did you let write that article? Faber? He's awful. Who is this? demanded Grange. 
Jake Ramsley's submurmured girlfriend and your stunning tabloid writer, she said sarcastically. Using people for your own ends much? Hey, it's sold copies, Grange defended his actions. You were nowhere to be found. You did not email any articles in. I had to print something. No wonder Jake Ramsley left like he did. Sterling blew out a breath and stared at the ceiling. You should expect a call from him, if he has not already invented his displeasure to you. Oh, I'm so frightened, scoffed Grange. I need more Ramsley material, so you'd better get writing. What did the two of you talk about the whole time out there? Make it suggestive. Readers want to know if he got in your pants. Sterling nearly choked. Nothing happened. Who cares? It's your word against his, Grange retorted snidely. Everyone is speculating anyway, so give them what they want. They're only speculating because of that article you put in the paper, growled Sterling. Jake Ramsley is a gentleman. He's a complete bore, but the public wants to know what he's like. We have to make him either loathsome or likable. Readers love a good romance gone wrong. Grange warmed to his subject. We'll say it was a whirlwind romance, like Stockholm Syndrome. Two people desperate to survive, but uncertain they would. I doubt he had any condoms, so we can claim uncertainty about a pregnancy. It would help if we can get pictures of you outside a doctor's clinic in a few weeks, or buying one of those little tests from the pharmacy. You are absolutely despicable, gasped Sterling. I am not going to drag Jake through a pretend pregnancy alarm just for the sake of Dubious's readership numbers. If you want to keep your job, I would rethink that, replied Grange. It hurts you nothing, and it's worth a pretty bonus. I'm low on battery. I can't hear what you just said, Sterling yelled into the phone before hanging up. She laid back and contemplated her life. She would have to figure out a way to smoothly maneuver Grange from this sort of article. Maybe if she got the lawyers from the ground floor involved, they could convince Grange that it was too much risk for a lawsuit. If not, she might have to dangle something juicier for him to follow. The trouble was, she was not certain if she had enough information to make that happen. Her contact at Ramsey Pharma had not gone back to her yet. She might not be able to convince Grange not to run articles using her as a foil against Jake Ramsley. Sterling needed her job. If it came down to it, she knew she probably would have to pose for the pictures unless she found a job at another tabloid. She had an offer recently, but it did not pay as much as Dubious did. Jake would hate her even more than he did now if she did do what Grange wanted. Professionally, she should not have been bothered by the thought. Personally, she was depressed by it. When had Jake Ramsley become so important to her? Sterling tried not to think about it during a nearly sleepless night. Jake tried not to think about Sarah Hawkins, a.k.a. Sterling Denver, during a nearly sleepless night. How stupid he felt for offering her a job, for thinking about asking her for her phone number, for kissing her. She probably had been laughing at him the whole time, thinking about her next headline. Miraculously, he only had a mild case of frostbite on his feet. Mostly his toes were affected. Jake otherwise was in very good health considering the ordeal that they had been through. He also had two cracked ribs and would have to be careful with them. Jake had some bruises here and there, but was overall okay. His heart and his ego were significantly bruised. He was a sucker, Jake thought grimly. She had lied, forged documents, bribed her way onto his private hired flight, and somehow gotten under his skin with her smiles and good humor over their situation. Sure, she had good humor, Jake supposed sourly. The whole experience was good fodder for her articles. She was probably writing stories about him right now, like that one he saw earlier today. Eligible bachelor and stunning tabloid writer still missing. The article was a pack of lies making it seem like the two of them had been having an affair. It painted him as a man who was escaping from his responsibilities to enjoy a weekend away with his mistress. Anger flooded him that he could have been so blind to Sarah's true nature. Sterling, he reminded himself, 
Her name was Sterling. She was a tabloid reporter. Well, he was sick about her writing about his family. Jake was not going to let Dubious do this to them again. Sterling Denver was done. He would see to that. Flicking on a light, Jake sat up and grabbed his new cell phone. Brandon, get me my lawyers. Within minutes, his PA had roused Jake's usual team of lawyers. Two hours later, Jake had smoothed out the legalities of what he wanted done and had his team moving forward on a deal that Dubious would not be able to refuse. He also had his assistant sending out to all the contacts they had in the press and publishing industries. By the time they were done, Jake was satisfied in his revenge against Sterling. At least, that was what he told himself as he stretched out again on the hotel bed. He could have stayed with Dylan. His brother would have been happy to have him, as would his nephews. Jake did not get to see them as often as he would like. He really should make more of an effort to be in their lives. He had yet to really get to know Dylan's new wife and stepson. Jake would make sure that he took some time to visit even though much of his and Dylan's time would be concentrated on trying to find out more about the charges being brought against their father and their cousin Michael. Jake puzzled over Michael's involvement in the drug smuggling charges. He never would have thought for a moment that Michael would have done something illegal. He was a lawyer. Michael was now a family man. Then again, the drug smuggling operation was purported to extend just over thirty years ago. Michael would have been in his twenties, younger and more prone to making a bad decision that could see him locked into a bad situation over the years. It still did not make sense to Jake. If Michael was truly involved, he was one cool customer about the whole thing. No one who knew him would have guessed. Now when his Uncle David had been arrested, Jake had not been surprised a bit. David had always been a self-serving bully of a man. Jake could believe that David would do whatever he wanted, regardless of the consequences. David gave off an aura of a king who was certain he would never be dethroned, nor did he have to bow to the rules of mere mortals. It was only through the interference of their mother Rachel and all the other family members that Michael had turned out well. Michael and cousins, in turn, had influenced Noah and Max to become decent men. Jake supposed that was why it did not mesh well in his mind. Michael had always been one of the cousins who always took the moral high ground. He had instructed the younger cousins again and again on doing the right thing, in his own kind and quiet manner. Michael took after his mother with a gentle reprimand and soft praise. Had David bullied Michael to become involved in something illegal? Was Michael covering for his father? From what the paper said, David had agreed to testify against Michael and Jake's father, Robert, in return for immunity in the case. How was it that the man who seemed the guiltiest was getting away with the crime? Uncertainty filled him at the thought of his father, Robert. Jake did not know why Robert would not talk to Dylan about what was happening. Robert was willing to speak to Jake, and they had arranged a time. Had Robert really helped smuggle drugs into the country? Jake did not know. He always felt that his dad was above reproach. Robert had been his example throughout life, a hard-working man who was dedicated to his family. For the first time in his life, Jake did not have faith in the actions of his father. It worried him. Not what might happen to the companies, Ramsley Farmer and Ramsley Insurance. Jake was worried what it might do to their families. He looked up at the ceiling and mulled over what a mess life had become. After a visit to the clinic, Doc Luce declared that it was just as he had originally diagnosed. Sterling's knee was badly sprained, and she would need to stay off it for a few weeks. She was fitted with a pair of crutches. Sterling thanked the doctor and his staff of one nurse for their help. The sun was finally shining. Sterling managed to arrange transportation to the nearest airport where she could get a flight back to New York. If everything went smoothly, she might even make it in for a work today for an hour. She was looking forward to having it out with Grange about this morning's article. Tabloid star heartbroken after Jake Ramsley leaves her. 
Injured and left behind in a tiny hillside community, Sterling Denver was heartbroken after her lover callously left her behind as he fled to New York to deal with the continuing family drama. It was a subpar heading. It made her look foolish and Jake seem unfeeling. The papers had also begun to report that David was free in return for testifying against his son and brother. The whole thing stank. Sterling wondered why the FBI did not seem to recognize that. She continued to email her contacts and ask for more information regarding the case. A text came back from one of her sources. Anne in labor at Mercy. Private suite. Doctors hoping to prevent early birth. Maybe Sterling could distract Grange with this. Put forward the tragedy of Anne and Michael's current predicament rather than this bogus story of Sterling and Jake being a couple. The idea left a bad taste in Sterling's mouth, but she could not afford to have a conscience about it, she reminded herself. Her job depended on it. When she landed in New York, Sterling went straight to the mall to get a new phone. The salesperson managed to salvage all her contact information and files from her broken phone and have them transferred to the new one. Sterling breathed a sigh of relief. That information was her income, and she was grateful to have it back in a working phone. She grabbed some money at an ATM for the taxi ride dubious. Grange had to give her that bonus. She deserved it after all that she had been through trying to get the story on Jake Ramsley. Look how that had backfired. Sterling shook away the thought and the pain left from the hole in her life that Jake Ramsley had left behind. It didn't matter. She had not expected their friendship to continue. How could it? He had been friends with Sarah Hawkins, not Sterling Denver. The whole thing had been doomed from the start. All he was meant to be was a target for her pen, and she could not forget that. It didn't matter if she became attached to him, even liked him. Her job was to provide an entertaining story. She could not afford to become choosy and not run a good story just because she had come to respect and like the guy the story was about. As she maneuvered her crutches across the floor at Dubious, Sterling noticed that the building was unusually quiet, even for a Saturday when they normally ran with half-staff. She wondered if everyone was at a meeting. It was so eerily silent. Grange's secretary was not at her usual post. Most of the lights were off. Chairs were empty. What had happened? Frowning, Sterling tapped on Grange's door, relieved to find him in his office. Grange had a banker's box and was stowing his framed awards in it. What is going on? Sterling tried to joke. Did the whole department get a pink slip? Grange scowled at her. You! You are the cause of all this! Excuse me? Sterling was surprised at the venom in Grange's voice. Because of you and those Ramsley articles you wrote, we've been shut down. Grange pulled another award off the wall, shoving it into the box. Hey, excuse me? Sterling watched him in confusion. You told me to write about the Ramsley family. This was all done under your direction. You said it was boosting sales of Dubious. Jake Ramsley bought out Dubious and shut it down, taking the loss, growled Grange gave us all severance packages and turned us out. What? Sterling felt like the world was tilting. Taking a deep breath, she tried to get her equilibrium back. He can't just do that, can he? Grange snorted. He did. That's what you can do when you're a billionaire. You snap your fingers and everyone just gives you what you want. Why? Why did he shut down the paper? Sterling leaned heavily on her crutches, trying to make sense of it. Sure, Jake would have been furious to find out that she was Sterling Denver, but to buy an entire paper and shut it down? That was a bit overkill. I guess he hated what we wrote, came the sarcastic reply from her former boss. Moreover, he hates you. What? A pit formed in Sterling's stomach. Grange smiled maliciously. The rest of us got severance. You, however, have been fired. Terminated with cause. I have your papers here. Sterling automatically took the papers, looking down at them in shock. It was right there. She was fired and would not receive a severance package. Her last paycheck was there, but that was all. 
Sterling had gambled everything she had in her bank account for the last month on the hopes of creating lucrative articles for dubious about Jake Ramsley, and now that opportunity was gone. All she had was her paycheck in her hand, and it was puny compared to what she had lost. For a moment she felt a little light-headed. I need to sit down. You're going to faint? Do it somewhere else. Grange was surly as he pulled down another award. We have to leave the building vacant in the next hour so the real estate guys can come in to survey it. It's to be sold? Sterling did not feel like she was keeping up in the conversation, which was abnormal for her. It was like she was in some sort of surreal daze. You think Jake Ramsley wants to run a rag paper? He snorted in disbelief. By the way, I feel like I should tell you, since you've worked here for the past ten years, you're not going to get another writing job in the industry. Of course I will get another job. Sterling propped her crutches against the wall and took a seat. Her knee was aching. I'm one of your top writers. I'm practically a brand name. You are blacklisted, courtesy of the Ramsleys. Grange explained with some satisfaction. He never liked that Sterling had turned him down the many times he had asked her out. Never mind, it would have been unethical as her superior to hit on her. You must have done something to make Jake Ramsley put in the effort, but he's made you persona non grata for the entire news industry. No tabloid, newspaper, blog, publishing house, or anyone of any standing is going to publish your written word any time soon. Good luck, Sterling. You are done. You're wrong, Sterling breathed. He had to be. It just had to be Grange talking big because he was mad about the paper being shut down. Jake would not have gone through the trouble to see her blacklisted, would he? Surely it had not been that big of a crime to write a few articles and publish some pictures. Grange just laughed. Sterling grabbed her crutches, hopping out of Grange's office as his laughter followed her. He had to be wrong. This was ridiculous. She had just been doing her job. Yes, Jake should be mad at her for lying and saying she was a flight attendant when she was not. That she could understand. Yet buying Dubious? Firing her? Shutting it down? Blacklisting her? That was crazy. Just because he had a lot of money and was angry at her did not mean he had to destroy her livelihood. Assuring herself that Grage was wrong about the blacklisting, Sterling grabbed a cab and went to Dubious's competitor, Vague. Two months ago, she had a job offer from Vague. Unfortunately, the terms were not more favorable than Dubious, so she had turned it down at the time. Perhaps they would consider extending the offer again. A half hour later, Sterling was back on the street. This time she sat at a nearby cafe, calling every tabloid and newspaper that she could think of in the city, asking for an interview. Then she called other tabloids in other major city centers. They all declined. It was very polite. Yet, whereas she had been in demand only a couple months earlier, now she was gently shunned. Most expressed their regrets that they could just not hire her at this time. Sterling started asking them when it would be a more convenient time for them to hire her. They just could not say. She was indeed being blacklisted. Next, Sterling went through every publishing agent she could think of that had contacts in the city. She had been approached not a week ago by an agent from a large publishing house to do a book deal. Sterling had wanted to have the contract looked over by a lawyer before making any moves on the deal. Now when she called the agent, she was told she was no longer being considered for a book promotion and that the contract was being withdrawn. No one wanted to work with Sterling Denver. The more Sterling thought about it, the angrier she became. She was doing her job, and now she was shut out of an entire industry. The pen name, Sterling Denver, had been a brand that she had built up painstakingly for ten years. She came so close to cashing in on it with big-ticket items like book deals and possibly speaking tours. Now it was nothing. It was all Jake Ramsley's fault. He overreacted like some child who no longer wanted to play with a friend because that friend had said something that made him uncomfortable. 
stomping in anger as best as she could on her crutches. Sterling got a cab. It was going to be horridly expensive, but it was the quickest way to Dylan Ramsley's estate. She believed that Jake would be staying with his brother, or at the very least, Dylan would know what hotel Jake had chosen to stay at. Either way, she was determined to confront Jake about his bullying her out of a job. He was not going to get away with this. She would not let him. Stewing in the cab, Sterling built up her anger and self-righteousness. How dare he! How dare you! Sterling shouted into the intercom as she pressed the button at the gate of Dylan Ramsley's home. She leaned on her crutches to keep the button pressed as the cabbie waited patiently through her tirade. You bully! You insecure tyrant! Oppressor of the people just trying to do their job! You think you can dictate an entire industry to keep me unemployed? You are the worst person on the planet, Jake Ramsley. How dare you have me blacklisted for doing my job? The only thing you have to be mad about is that I lied to you about being a flight attendant. That is it. That is my crime. Otherwise, I do what every other press person does. Invade a small portion of your privacy to create an article for a curious public. I never once lied in any of my articles. Embellish the truth a little, sure. If you kill the career of everyone who lies about you just a little, I can't believe what you would do to someone who dare do worse to your majesty. Just because someone chooses to do something that you don't like, you destroy them professionally? Not only can I not get a job in this city, I can't seem to find anyone willing to interview me for any other city either. Real mature, Jake. Um, Jake is not here right now? An embarrassed Dylan said when Sterling finally ran out of breath and released the intercom button. Fine! Tell me where that crustacean is, she growled. No, wait. Crustacean is too good of a word for him. He is mud. No, muck, from a dung heap. What is the scientific word for that? I would not know, Dylan said faintly. You don't know what the scientific word would be, or you don't know where Jake is, demanded Sterling. Neither? Dylan's voice was tentative. I'm guessing you are a reporter. Sterling Denver, Sterling confirmed with a huff. Although my pen name is now completely shot, so I suppose she no longer exists except in tabloid history. Suddenly, tears came to Sterling's eyes, and she blinked them away furiously. Ten years of work completely blown by one angry man with a vendetta. This was not just about Sterling. It was about so much more, and now her life was in ruins because of Jake Ramsley. People were depending on her income, and now she was jobless for the foreseeable future. You were on the mountain with him when the plane crashed, Dylan clued in. Look, Miss Denver, I don't know what happened or did not happen out on that mountain, but Jake certainly has not been in a good mood since. Not been in a good mood? yelled Sterling. He just destroyed my life and two hundred other people's. I thought Dubious had a much larger staff, Dylan wondered aloud. He's just destroyed an entire town, Sterling whispered as the enormity of their situation sunk in. Jake Ransley had no idea what he had done. Excuse me? Dylan was obviously confused. All the fight left Sterling. Now she had to explain to her parents what had happened. She had to explain why there would be no money coming in this month. There would be a domino effect of consequences. It was all her fault. She had overreached. If Sterling had not gotten on the plane, she would have the money for her share of the mortgage and loan payments. They were already on final notice with the bank. It was all about to come crashing down all because she had wanted to push her career even higher, knowing that she needed to push for more money to keep things afloat, to try to get out of the ever-climbing, higher burden of debt. Now she had blown it. She was on Jake Ramsley's bad side, and everyone she held dear would reap the consequences. A sick, heavy feeling invaded her abdomen. Everything was over. Sterling cleared her throat. I'm sorry, Mr. Ramsley. My tirade was directed at your brother, not you. She didn't wait for his reply, crutching her way over to the taxi. It was time to make arrangements to go home with her tail tucked between her legs. 
Never had Sterling felt worse in her life. How was she going to let an entire town know that she had let them down? Chapter 7 Jake waited in the gray concrete room with a single window. His father's head lawyer, Craymarn, was there, already seated. He watched Jake pace the small space. Jake and Craymarn had gone over the evidence that had been offered by the FBI to go against the drug-running charges. It was substantial. Most of it was based on David Ramsley's statements testifying to Robert's guilt. Some of it was eyewitness accounts from people who were in the drug smuggling industry offering their testimony in an attempt to find lighter sentences for themselves. There was physical evidence from the Ramsley Insurance, three decades of laundering money through the company. The accounting was incriminatory. Jake wondered how they would fight the charges. The door opened and a guard ushered Robert Ramsley in. Jake's father wore an orange jumpsuit with shackles. He looked gray and drawn, not the man who commanded boardrooms of people. The guard escorted Robert to his seat, unlocking the shackles but looping a pair of handcuffs through a bar on the table before clasping them over Robert's wrists. Checking that they were secure, he nodded to Cramarn. You have thirty minutes. Jake waited until the guard had exited before sitting down. Dad, are you okay? I'm fine, Robert said tersely. He sighed and frowned. I'm sorry about this. What do you mean? Jake had rarely heard his father apologize before. I didn't mean to do this to you boys. At the time, I thought I was helping to save both our companies. Things had been bad for pharmaceutical and insurance industries. There was a rash of lawsuits that David was not winning. He was having a hard time getting new drug research underway that was costly, and some of his staff had walked out on him. The insurance business was not faring much better. We were taking too many losses. Other insurance companies were folding under the financial pressure, and it came close for us. I could not let that happen. The Ramsley name had a reputation to uphold, and I had a family to support. Dad, Jake looked at Robert in astonishment. You did not do this. I did. Oh, I didn't smuggle the drugs, grimaced Robert. I never had a hand in that. That was all David's doing. He just gave me the money to launder through Ramsley Insurance. That is my crime. Laundering drug money and profiting from it. It bore the company through a tough time. That money helped me build the company up so I could hand an empire over to my sons. I was greedy, so help me. When I come before the judge tomorrow, I will plead guilty to laundering money and be an accessory to drug smuggling. Jake leaned back in his chair. He struggled to believe what his father had just told him. I have resigned my position with the company. Everett will have to take over your role. You are now in charge and will have to deal with the fallout. I am sorry about that. Robert apologized again, his eyes bleak as he looked at his oldest son. It's a bad position I've left you in. Uncle David is free pending his testimony against you. Jake leaned forward. How is it that he's not in prison? How is it he managed to turn this around so that he is not at fault? David is pinning it on me, Ted and Michael, Robert responded. Ted Searson did help David with the drops until they put other people in place to do the dirty work for them as they grew older. With Ted dead, there's no one who can put David on all the drops those years ago. I never saw the drugs. I just had a portion of the money to launder. I guess it was more than Ted and David's companies could handle without alerting the authorities, which is probably why I was offered the opportunity. I never knew Michael might be involved until now when the FBI arrested him. They would not have arrested him without some evidence. Jake could still not believe that his cousin was involved. They had grown up together. While Michael was an intensely private person, he was not the criminal type. Maybe so, Robert mused. Maybe so, Robert mused. Just doesn't make sense to me. Michael, who's wealthy in his own right, still having drug residue on his boat? How stupid would that be to use his own boat for drops where the FBI could collect evidence from? When his own father had outsourced that part of the operation long ago? No, I don't buy it. You think Uncle David is framing his own son? Questioned Jake. 
Robert's reasoning mirrored his own, and Jake wondered what he could do to help clear Michael's name. David's always been about himself. He's a man not to be crossed, and Michael forced him to retire. Robert shook his head, replying bitterly, Don't ask me how, I have no idea. Whether Michael is really involved or not, I don't know, but it would not surprise me if David threw his own son to the wolves. David's thoughts on loyalty and trust only apply to himself. He's a sick man who's drunk on power. We should have done something about him long ago. What can I do? wondered Jake. I wish I knew, Robert sighed again. Right now, you'll probably have your hands full taking care of the company and your mother. Beverly's going to be distraught over this. Dad, are you sure you don't want to fight this? There might be some legality, some loophole we can exploit, insisted Jake. The last thing he wanted was his father to go to jail. No. It's time I paid for my wrongdoings. Robert stared steadily at Jake. I should have stepped down years ago when Everett was ready to take on a division. I should have let you be in charge. Instead, I've held on too long. I suppose I was addicted to the power as well. Do not do that to yourself, Jake. Remember, the company pays the bills, but it should not be your entire life. If it goes under because of my actions, let it go and take care of your family. Don't let it hang like an albatross around your neck like I let it do to me. You've always loved working at Ramsley Insurance. We were expected to follow you into the family business. Jake frowned at Robert as he remembered. There was never any question that a Ramsley does not follow their father into business. That is a full expectation put on us by our fathers, and we transferred it to each of you. Robert growled. It was wrong of me to do that. Just as it was wrong of my brothers to do it to their sons. Do not do it to your kids when you get married. Jake blinked in surprise. He had no idea his father felt this way. They rarely talked like this, laying everything into the open. The door to the room opened as the guard stepped back in, bringing the interview to a close. Dad, you need to let Dylan and Everett visit, Jake said as he rose from his chair, giving his father's hand a squeeze. I know. Robert cleared his throat, blinking back tears. Not until I've entered my plea. I don't want them to talk me out of doing the right thing. Jake nodded. He could respect his father for that. Cray Marn and Jake left the room, escorted by another guard. We're going to have to do our best to try to get his time reduced. He is cooperating, but his age is against him and his health. Hopefully the judge will be sympathetic. Cray Marn did not sound too hopeful himself. What do you mean, his health? Jake frowned and gave Cray Marn a searching look. High blood pressure, diabetes... Arthiosclerosis, the lawyer explained. Time is not on your father's side. This was the first time anyone had told Jake about it. Scowling, Jake thanked Kramarn and went to find out if he could get a visit with Michael today. He made his way back to the office to see if it was possible. He was led by a guard to a room to wait. Jake was surprised to find Max waiting as well to speak to Michael. Jake! Max extended a hand with a grin. Good to see you! Jake shook Max's hand in greeting. How are things going? Just came to visit Michael. Max sobered as he thought about his brother being held in prison. I cannot believe what is happening. Do you mind if I tag along? inquired Jake. I have a couple of questions I would like answered. Sure, Max responded in his usual easy way. I don't have a problem with it if the prison guys don't. They both signed in to see Michael. A guard led them to a room where they would wait. So you were in a plane crash? Max whistled. That must have been some fun. Not really, Jake said shortly. He really didn't want to talk about his excursion on the mountain with Sterling. Dylan told me he had a visitor yesterday. He was debating whether to talk to you or not about her. Max studied his watch like it held all the answers to the universe. Jake knew that when Max was like this, he wanted his audience to draw the answers out of him. Jake did not feel like being a cooperative audience, especially when he suspected that Sterling had been the one to visit Dylan. Although why she would be going to talk to Dylan, Jake did not know. He frowned and waited for Max to get impatient enough to continue 
because Jake was not going to ask. Max rolled his eyes. You are stubborn. Always have been, Jake responded with a frown. It was a family trait. He took a seat, pretending that he did not care. Sterling Denver came by to give a piece of her mind, Max announced, unable to wait for Jake to say anything. I wonder why she would do that. Since Dylan told you about it, I am taking that as a rhetorical question, muttered Jake. You tanked her career. Max looked at Jake with some awe. What did she do that was so bad that she cannot get another job in the print industry? Jake gave Max a hard look. She has dragged this family through the mud with that tabloid of hers. Enough was enough. She did the same as any other tabloid. Max raised an eyebrow. Are you going to buy all the papers up and disband them? Even you are not that rich. Jake bit back a caustic response. It was not Max's fault how things had happened, and he was not going to take his feelings out on his cousin. I had just cause. Really? persisted Max. You knocked her down pretty hard. I'm sure she will be fine, he responded, trying to sound disinterested. Somehow I doubt that. Max frowned as he contemplated Jake. I did a little research. Blacklisting someone is illegal, you know. So is price fixing, but we know that large corporations do that all the time. Jake shrugged it off and tried not to feel guilty. What did she do that was so bad? Max genuinely wanted to know. She lied to me, Jake reluctantly said. He hardened his heart against the feeling of hurt that talking about Sterling provoked. He did not want to talk about her, or even think about her. Max whistled again as he studied Jake. You fell in love with her. What? Jake narrowed his eyes and glared at Max. I did no such thing. You did, Max grinned triumphantly. That is why you've gone overboard to get her back. You wanted her to hurt as much as she hurt you. Very immature, Jake. That is not what this is about in the least, Jake growled ignoring the idea that Max might have some truth to what he said. Not the love part, but certainly the getting Sterling back. She's been libeling this family for years. Her articles were outrageous. I put a stop to them. I would think that you might be grateful. Her articles were no worse than any other tabloid paper, scoffed Max. All I did was make sure that she would not work in the industry again. Jake shrugged away the guilt that he had overstepped the bounds of right and wrong. He made certain that she would not work in a lot of industries. Any job that put words to media where the public might hear, read, or see them. She said, you destroyed her, replied a thoughtful Max. Actually, if I recall what Dylan told me, she said you destroyed not only her, but an entire town. Do you know what she was talking about? Jake could only shake his head. He did not know what Sterling had meant by that mysterious comment. His gut was telling him that he had done something terribly wrong. The door opened and the guard let Michael in. Again, the process of unshackling and handcuffing Michael to the steel table happened. Where did he get that bruise? Max angrily asked the guard. There was a bruise on Michael's cheekbone. Michael gestured to Max with a hand motion as if asking him to forget about it. I am not going to forget about it, Max said hotly. Someone is going to be held accountable for that. If you'd like to file a report, you can do so at the main desk when you leave, the guard replied. You'll be observed by a guard through the window at all times. When thirty minutes have expired, I will return for the prisoner. Max muttered as the guard left, not liking his attitude. Michael held out a hand in greeting to Jake as best as he was able, considering he was restricted by the handcuffs. Jake shook Michael's hand. It's good to see you, Michael. His cousin nodded. Jake had to remind himself that Michael no longer spoke. A few years ago, Michael had undergone an operation to remove two tumors from his brain. As a result, he suffered a small amount of brain damage to the language part of the brain. Michael could no longer read, write, or talk properly. Sometimes he could not find the right word to say. Sometimes he substituted the wrong word entirely. For the most part, Michael now limited his responses and used gestures or people who knew him well enough to help him communicate with others. I was hoping to ask you a few questions, Jake began, and at Michael's nod he continued. 
I want you to know that my father has admitted his guilt in this and is going to take responsibility for his actions. Both Max and Michael were surprised by Jake's words. I need to know. Jake studied Michael for any sign of guilt. Did you smuggle any of the drugs? Hey, Max growled, leaning forward. We all know Michael is innocent. No. Michael's voice was rusty as he responded. He cleared his throat and waited, watching Jake. Did you know that your father was smuggling drugs? Jake questioned. No. Michael's tongue struggled over the word, and his face showed a flare of annoyance at his ineptness at answering a simple question. Did you know David was laundering money through Ramsley Pharmaceuticals? Jake persisted. Michael hesitated. He looked to Max. We've already gone through this, Max informed Jake. There were accounting errors uncovered that led us to believe there might be money being laundered through the company. We didn't know by who, or that the money was from illegal drugs, if that is where it came from. All we know is that there are discrepancies. How long have the discrepancies been going on? Jake turned to look at Max. Thirty years, sighed Max. Did no one think to inform the police? Jake looked at Michael. He had been David's right hand throughout the years. If anyone had known, it would have been Michael. Michael looked at Jake in frustration. Michael found out about the discrepancies when Dad retired as head of the company. He had an independent audit conducted, Max explained. It found no conclusive evidence where the money came from or where it went to. Michael brought the matter to Christian Gaines and the lawyer team. However, when Michael had his surgery and resigned, the matter was neglected. Do you think Gaines was in on the money laundering? Jake wondered why it had not been followed up. Missing money was a big deal, especially if the amounts mirrored what had been filtered through Ramsley Insurance. I don't know. Max looked at Michael, who shook his head, then shrugged. We both like to think that Gaines is an honest man. Christian Gaines was now head of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. The only Ramsley currently working at the company was Noah. He was head of the laboratory division and likely to be groomed for the role of director once Gaines retired, something that Noah was not looking forward to. I need to know what the FBI have against you for evidence and when your hearing is, Jake informed them. We're going to get to the bottom of this. I assume you're pleading not guilty? Michael grimaced and nodded. What was that about? Jake looked at Max for an explanation. The judge wants him to verbalize his plea, Max said dryly. Michael thinks he's going to mess it up. Michael gestured in emotion. With his expression, it was easy for Jake to understand that Michael was pretty certain he would mess up the plea. Then don't do it, Jake responded. They can't make you. Plus it would look bad to a jury if you say that and nothing much else to your defense. However, let's hope it doesn't get that far. I'm going to hire the best investigators that I can to figure out what is really going on here. We've already done that, commented Max. We're doing our best to get Michael out of here. What about bail? Jake asked Max. That's to be decided when Michael enters his plea, Max shrugged. But it's going to be a pretty penny. Michael made a couple of motions with his hands. Jake looked to Max for clarification. He says we're not to make ourselves poor trying to bail him out. All the accounts for Ramsley Pharma have been frozen as well as Michael's assets, Max responded. He checked his watch. We only have a couple minutes left, so let's get to the good news. Good news? Jake did not see how there could be any. Max pulled out a couple of pictures from his shirt with a happy smile. The guard said I could give these to you. Michael took the photos and looked at them in awe. He pressed a hand to his mouth and blinked back tears. They're all perfect. Ten fingers, ten toes, Max continued proudly with his news. Paget and L are extremely jealous. Michael looked at Max sharply, a question in his eyes. Anne is okay. She's tired and is going to need a lot of help, which we are more than happy to provide, Max answered gently. She and Amy miss you. Michael wiped his eyes a moment and had a smile at the picture. His daughter Amy was smiling as she stood next to the three tiny babies lined up in a hospital bassinet. Michael had four daughters now. Just six years ago, no one would have thought this would have happened. Six years ago, Michael and Anne had simply been boss and secretary. Four girls? 
Jake was surprised. That had to be the longest streak of girls in Ramsley family history. In all the cousins there were fourteen boys and one girl. For Michael to have four girls it was unheard of for Ramsley's. We're going to get you home to those girls of yours, Max promised. Michael nodded, still looking at the pictures. The door opened and the guards stood there waiting to usher Max and Jake away. They said their goodbyes and took their leave. Walking down the corridor, Max gave Jake a long look. He is innocent. Jake nodded. Now that he had a chance to talk to Michael, all doubts had been removed from his mind. He did believe that Michael had nothing to do with the drug smuggling. That left the only conclusion that he was being framed by his father, David. Jake did not know how they were going to prove it. We'll pull our resources to get him out. I'll help however I can. What you could do is reach out to that tabloid reporter, Max suggested seriously. What? Jake stiffened. She has resources that we don't. She knows people and can ask all sorts of questions we can't, responded Max. Look, I know both of you are not getting along right now, but surely you can set aside any animosity if it helps Michael. Jake did not want to do this. He was still angry at Sterling, angry that she had lied to him, that he had trusted her, that he had liked her and wanted a relationship with her. Even through that anger he could see the wisdom of Max's words. It was with great reluctance when he replied, I will talk to her. She might not want to help us after all that I've done. You mean the whole ruin her career thing? Max asked innocently. You might want to grovel for a while. Noah says that sometimes help when a man messes up. I found it did not work so well. I am not interested in her. Jake shot Max an angry look. You can stop matchmaking. You heard about my new hobby. Max smiled, pleased at Jake's reaction. The fact that he thought that Max wanted to matchmake meant that Jake did indeed have feelings for Sterling. Jake just rolled his eyes and chose not to respond to Max's obvious delusions. Hello? Sterling mumbled into her phone. It was in the dead of night, and she had been dragged from her sleep by its incessant ringing. It's Mindy, a female voice said. I need to meet with you. Sterling sighed as she wiped sleep away from her eyes. It is the middle of the night. There was a pause before Mindy spoke again. You asked me to check to see if there were any drugs that Ramsey Pharma was experimenting on that resulted in a consistent case of anaphylactic shock. Sterling sat up in bed. Her attention caught. You found one. It's called Ig EGM. It was buried eight years ago as a failure. However, the paperwork and some samples were kept in case the government wanted to purchase them, continued Mindy. In 80% of lab trials, the subject showed signs of moderate to severe allergic reactions, 60% of the time resulting in death if no intervention was given. Tell me you made copies? Sterling breathed in suspense. I made a copy of the paperwork. It's worse than that. Mindy hesitated. What? demanded Sterling. How can it be worse? One of the samples is missing. Mindy's voice was hushed. I took pictures to prove it. No one signed it out. Only a few people have access to that lab, and it's gone. Then David Ramsley could have murdered Ted Searson with no one the wiser. Sterling flipped on her light. This was the story of the year. She was going to make headlines and be a step ahead of everyone. The police, the papers. Grange was going to flip his lid. Reality intruded. She was unemployed and had nowhere to publish the story. I need you to take this information. I can't carry it around. And I'm afraid someone is going to realize I was snooping and then I'll get caught. Mindy sounded very afraid. The pharmacy assistant turned up dead in the river today. What pharmacy assistant? Sterling asked, confused at that turn in the conversation. The one who filled the prescriptions for Bethany Searson before she nearly died? The police want to question her, and she disappeared. Mindy filled Sterling in. My boyfriend Rick said they found her floating in the river today. Sterling remembered that Mindy's boyfriend was a fireman who was part of the search and rescue crew in the city. A pit formed in her stomach. The last thing Sterling wanted was for something to happen to Mindy, or to anyone else, that she happened to ask to look into David Ramsley's actions. 
I will come. Can you meet me at the cafe we always use? It's open this time of night. Sterling grabbed clothes at random from her closet after Mindy agreed. Maybe she could not put the information in the tabloids, but she could sell it to one. Or, if it was as incriminating as she thought, she could bring it to the police herself. David Ramsley needed to be stopped before someone else ended up dead. Sterling quickly grabbed her wallet and headed for the cafe. On the way, she stopped at the bank, depositing her last paycheck from Dubious and taking out as much as the ATM would allow her to. She never did electronic transfers to her sources. It was too risky that someone might find out her banking information and trace who her sources were. Keeping an eye out for muggers, Sterling crossed the street as quickly as her crutches would let her, heading straight for the nearby cafe. Mindy was already there, nervously fingering a mug as she waited. Sterling paid for a bottle of water. It was moderately cheaper than the cafe's coffee menu. It was also easier to carry with her crutches. Joining Mindy, she propped her crutches against the table. Everything is in the envelope. Mindy put her bag between them both, a brown envelope peeking up out of the large purse. I can't prove that Mr. Ramsley Sr. took the drug, but the whole situation is very suspect in light of Ted Searson's death. That is very true. Sterling put her hand over the envelope, but Mindy grabbed her wrist. Am I doing the right thing? Mindy took a deep breath. I keep asking myself that. This is important information. It will affect the company I work for. Stocks will go down. People might even lose their jobs. Mr. Ramsley might go to jail. I'm not sure I should be giving this information to you. I should probably take it to the police. You could do that, Sterling agreed easily. She knew that Mindy's reluctance did not necessarily have to do with doing the right thing. It probably had more to do with wanting Sterling to offer her even more money for the information that she had. In fact, I think that's the best idea. The police definitely need to know about this. It's not like I'm a bad person, explained Mindy. I took a real risk to get this information. I just need to know that I'm doing the right thing. The right thing would be hand the information over to the police. Mindy was just fishing for more money, Sterling decided. Not that she would get it. Sterling plunked out the cash from the ATM and pushed it into Mindy's purse before taking the envelope. You are doing the right thing. Standing up, Sterling grabbed her crutches, leaving the unopened bottle of water behind. Mindy was counting the money. This is it? I risk my job, my life, and this is all it's worth? Standard payout, responded Sterling. You'll not get more from any other tabloid writer. That is ridiculous, scoffed Mindy. If I would have known, I never would have agreed to this. Mindy would likely be selling more copies that she had made to every other tabloid that she could contact before the morning was done. By tomorrow, every paper in the city would have the news. Mindy was not the type to not cash in on an opportunity like this. Ignoring the angry woman, Sterling crutched her way out of the cafe. The sun was starting to rise and she knew of a sweet little restaurant that was open this early which was nearby. At the diner, she managed to snag a seat at the back. Ordering breakfast, Sterling sipped a coffee while unloading the contents of the envelope. Just as Mindy had said, there were copies of the drug log, pictures of the fridge where the vials were kept, and copies of the study summary. There was also a USB stick, which should contain all the data from the studies pertaining to IG EGM, perhaps even an email trail. The email trail might prove that David had full knowledge of the drug. However, none of this would prove that David had actually killed Ted Searson. Anyone could have taken out a vial while taking the photographs of the fridge and the log. Obviously, security at Ramsley Farmer was not what it should be. However, it would prove that the police should look more closely into Searson's death, that it could very well be murder. Sterling leafed through the summary as she ate her breakfast. Mindy had been right. In studies on lab rats, the drug caused anaphylactic shock, a severe allergic reaction in nearly 80% of rats. Just over 60% died if no intervention was given. Ted Searson had been murdered. There was no doubt in Sterling's mind. She needed to see what was on the USB stick for certain. Sterling would plug it into her laptop at the apartment to verify its contents. After that, she would have to decide what to do with the information. She could not leverage it for a new job, 
no one would give her the time of day to hire her. Sterling believed that Mindy was probably selling the same package to the next tabloid even as Sterling finished her breakfast. There really was only one thing to do. She would give the information to the police. They, in turn, would give it to the FBI, and hopefully a full investigation would reveal David's part in Ted's murder. Sterling paused as a headline in the paper caught her eye. Quickly, she scanned the obituaries. Ted Searson's funeral was today. A few hours later, and she waited for people to slowly leave during the graveside ceremony. Ted Searson had been buried with all due pomp. No mention of his illustrious career as a possible drug smuggler mentioned. Ted's widow Constance blotted tears with a tissue, elegantly mourning her loss. Beside her, the prodigal son, Thad, stood stoically, returned from Taiwan or wherever he had run off to. A little to the side, daughter Bethany was tucked to the side of Andrew Colburn Ramsley. Not that Drew liked to be associated to the Ramsleys as one of David's illegitimate children. Bethany and Drew had recently become engaged. It was a whirlwind romance, and the cynical part of Sterling wondered just how long it would last. The romantic part of her hoped it would. They made a handsome couple, Drew holding an umbrella for them both in the light, drizzling rain. Other press snapped numerous photos, asked for comments, and were turned away by security before finally leaving. Thad murmured something to a tearful Bethany as he escorted Constance away from the graveside to a waiting limo. Even after crying, Bethany was achingly beautiful, Sterling reflected ruefully. When Sterling cried, she looked like the ugliest woman on earth for the rest of the day. The security detail had left with Thad and Constance Searson. There were a couple of Drew's co-workers, all cops, paying their respects. Sterling recognized Drew's sister Jana with her husband Miguel, as well as Drew's younger brother Molson. She had hoped to get just Bethany and Drew alone, but it did not look like that was going to happen. Drew looked up and caught Sterling's eye. He scowled, said something to Bethany, who nodded. Giving the umbrella to Molson to hold over Bethany's head, Drew walked over to Sterling. You should leave, he said curtly. We're not giving any comments to the press, especially to the tabloids. I have been fired, Sterling decided to be direct. I'm not here for a comment. Drew gave her a surprised look. Then why are you here? You are a detective. She pulled Mindy's envelope out of her purse and offered it to him. This is about Bethany's father. I believe he was murdered, and this is proof that his allergic reaction could have been manufactured with the intent to kill. Tomorrow it is going to be all over the papers. Did you tip them off? Drew carefully took the envelope, peering at its contents. No. The source from Ramsley Pharmaceuticals sold it to everyone willing to buy. Sterling hoped that she could trust Drew with this information. It was well known that he had no love for the Ramsley family, even if he was David's son. I don't believe that Michael ran drugs. I believe David has framed his son and killed Ted, the only man who might be able to testify against him. Believing something and proving it are two different things, Drew commented dryly. What is your motive in this, Barracuda? Sterling winced at the nickname the police force had given her. Like I said, I am out of the tabloid business. None of this information does me any good. Why did they fire you? He asked casually as he skimmed through the drug summary. Ask your cousin Jake, sighed Sterling. Drew gave her a sharp look. Look, I'm giving this to you. No favors, no expectations, she assured him. Just tell me I'm doing the right thing, that you're going to have this looked into. He would have stood by and let Bethany die, Drew remarked as he looked at his fiancée. She had recently suffered a prescription drug overdose and had thankfully survived. Her life had been threatened by the fact that, as a child, she had witnessed both her father and David Ramsley on a boat with bricks of white powdered drugs. The drug overdoses had been ruled as accidental by the FBI, even as evidence strongly suggested otherwise. "'He's still her father and deserves to have his murder solved,' responded Sterling. "'Especially if it puts David behind bars?' We both know David had a hand in nearly killing Bethany, even if it cannot be proven right now. Drew nodded at her reasoning. I suppose I should thank you for this. Sterling shrugged. Like I said, everyone's going to know about it tomorrow morning when the papers are out. I'm just giving you a head start. 
Leaning on her crutches, Sterling started to hop away, but Drew's voice stopped her. Hey, are you really fired? Yep, asked Jake, or called dubious. Sterling had a bitter laugh. No one will answer. The entire paper has been shut down. I will ask, Jake, Drew confirmed as he looked at her intently. You have sources that I don't have. Is there any way that you can press on them for more information? You want me to cooperate with your investigation? Sterling was surprised. The police force generally looked down on her, wanting nothing to do with the tabloids unless it suited their purposes to mislead the public for a case. I can't pay you anything, warned Drew. If you find something out, I would appreciate it if you could pass it along to me. I'll need your number. Sterling decided she had nothing to lose. She annoyed the Ramsey family for long enough. Perhaps now she could help them out a little. Drew grabbed a card out of his wallet, handing it to her. He gave her a nod before heading back to Bethany. He wrapped an arm around her, talking softly. Sterling bit the inside of her cheek to quell a stab of envy. If she had to lay odds on it, she bet the couple would make it for the long haul. For a moment, Sterling allowed herself to dwell on what it might have been like to have someone like Jake look at her like that. That was never going to happen. With a sigh, she made her way out of the cemetery. There was a nearby bus stop, so Sterling waited with her bus pass ready. She had been spending far too much on taxis lately. It was time to watch what little cash she had left. The rent was due soon, and Sterling was going to have to give her roommates notice that she was leaving. She would continue to press her sources and pass the information to Drew if it was relevant. But she could do that from her parents' home while Sterling licked her wounds over Jake and the destruction of her career. She was going to be leaving New York, much the way that she had entered it, with no prospects, very little money, and on a bus. Chapter 8 Mom? Dad? Sterling popped her bag on the bench in the entryway as she crutched forward into the farmhouse. She had not given them any notice that she was coming home. An empty space caught her eye where an antique cupboard used to stand. Looking around the room, she could see a few more empty spaces where antiques used to be. Sarah! Her mother Paisley exclaimed as she came from the kitchen. You're home! Sterling let herself be wrapped up in a big hug, embracing her mother in return. You sold great-grandma's cabinet? Paisley's smile dimmed a little. It had to be done. When? Sterling knew that her mother had loved that particular piece of furniture. A few months back. You know Eunice Brown had her eye on it for a long time. Paisley pointed to the crutches that Sterling used. What happened? Sterling groaned. It's a long story. You can tell it over dinner. Paisley unwrapped an apron from around her slim form. I was just about to call your father. He's struggling over some safety forms in the den. I will go surprise him and let him know dinner is ready. Sterling gave her mother a smile and another hug. I've missed you guys. Paisley laughed. You were here for the holidays. However, you're always welcome to be here since we miss you all the time. Sterling crutched over to the den, knocking on the door. Surprise! Owen Hawkins looked up in astonishment. Sarah Lee, when did you get home? Just now. Sterling grinned as her dad gave her a hug. Mom says it's time for dinner. How long are you staying? asked Owen. Will you be here for the town fair? A member of the Hawkins family had been opening the annual town fair since its conception. It was a big deal for the little town. I could probably manage that. Sterling thought that she really had nothing better to do. I know that look. Owen looked down at her in concern. What happened? Let's go to supper. Sterling dredged up a smile. I'll tell you all about it. Including how you got the crutches? Owen turned off the desk lamp. That is the most exciting part. Sterling led the way to the kitchen where her mother had already put out an extra setting. Her brother Brant would be working at the factory as the second shift was his responsibility. They all sat down to enjoy the home-cooked meal. Sterling asked about how things were doing in the small town. She found out that the daycare was rumored to be reducing its staff again. The small town boutique Fleur for her had closed. 
the tea-room and quilt shop had opened the upstairs of the building for a bed and breakfast which no one in the town thought would succeed melody jesnell and dixby cooley were engaged dixby and melody sterling looked at her parents in shock melody dixby and brant had been friends for a long time however the last she had known it was brant and melody who were in love even if they were not a couple at the time she could not imagine how brant must feel how is brant coping with that he's ignoring it sighed paisley we feel for him but there isn't really nothing to be done now sara lee owen clasped his hands and leaned forward not that i don't love it when our daughter comes home but i think it's time you told us what's going on in your life sterling sighed should i start at the beginning or would you just like the bad news i find the beginning is always best owen pragmatically replied she found herself telling them the whole sad tale from sneaking onto the plane the crash hiking through the snow getting to like jake ramsley the rescue how jake had ruined her career having a little over three hundred dollars to her name and returning home i won't have my share of the payment money this month will the bank give another extension it was never your share owen said quietly while well, we desperately needed the money you should have not felt obligated sarah i'm a hawkins she gave a crooked smile we take care of this town it's in our blood paisley took her husband's hand in her own it's done then owen put his second hand over their joined ones and nodded what do you mean sterling's smile faded is there nothing else we can do the bank is done giving extensions they've done all that they are willing to do owen took a deep breath we're under water with the loans and mortgage we won't make this month's payments that meant the factory would close and over two hundred people would be out of work what do we have to do she asked her parent quietly we'll take the money that would have been applied for the payment and use it as a bonus for each worker replied owen the bank will get nothing this month but we'll be able to help our workers a little unfortunately there will be no severance packages we just don't have the money you and i can call the employees tonight paisley's told sterling we'll set up a meeting with everyone to announce the closing sterling nodded she had failed her community pendle would soon become a ghost town thanks to her and jake ramsley she knew that it was probably going to be the case when she came home without any money for the payment but it hurt to hear the reality from her parents sterling felt like she had failed them as well the family set to work sending out notices to the banks creditors suppliers customers and companies that supplied services to hawkins company it was late at night when sterling finally made her way up to her room her dad bringing up her bags have you talked to brant yet sterling sat on the bed tired from the ordeal of closing the family company how is he taking it we all knew this was coming owen said quietly orders are down expenses are up even though he was making headway on getting us more of an online presence and procuring orders that way brant knows the deal he's been a source of strength for us i am sorry dad sterling brushed away a tear owen laid a hand on her shoulder you can't shoulder this sarah don't let it bury you we all did our best but it just wasn't enough there's no one to blame here sterling nodded she knew the wisdom in her father's words but she still felt badly i'll leave you to with your mother owen said gruffly as paisley came in with clean sheets Wiping away her tears, Sterling helped to make up the bed. Afterward, Paisley sat beside her, putting an arm around her daughter. Don't worry about it. What's done is done, and we'll figure out how to move forward. Now, tell me about this Jake you like so much. You mean the man who threw my career in the trash? Sterling said dryly. The very one. I know your heart, Paisley said gently. Hawkins have a bad habit of loving people who are not always appropriate at the time for them. How were you not appropriate for Dad? Sterling frowned at Paisley's words. I came from a poor family. He had been dating a daughter of the Lockmans, and they had some serious cash which was needed for the business. Instead, he chose me. Paisley rubbed Sterling's arm. 
Now stop distracting me and tell me about Jake. Is he handsome? Not in a traditional sense, sighed Sterling. I will take that as a yes. Paisley had a sad smile. I liked him. Sterling wiped away another tear and leaned against her mother. She still liked him. She was angry at him. She was sad they had no future. Do we have any ice cream? No, frowned Paisley. I think I have some chocolate chips for baking and pudding cups. That will do. Sterling grabbed her crutches. Come on, let's binge eat while I tell you all the frustrating things about Jake Ramsley. They sat in the kitchen, eating junk food and talking about Jake's smile, humor, ingenuity with the silver pan, and how he kissed. And you never confronted him? Paisley popped a few chocolate chips in her pudding cup. I tried, Sterling said dryly. I yelled at his cousin before calling it quits. It's not like you to quit, her mom remarked. She shrugged. Everyone knows Jake has a temper. He has a reputation for squashing people in business if they go up against him. He probably regarded this as business. He believes I lied and manipulated him to get a story. You did, mildly commented Paisley. That does not excuse his behavior, either. He went overboard by making you unemployable in your field. We both were wrong. Sterling had another spoonful of vanilla pudding with chocolate chips. However, I was just doing my job. If I announced I was a reporter from Dubious, he would never have talked to me. Are you going to let him get away with this? asked Paisley. It was obvious she felt that Sterling and Jake had unfinished business. Right now, I want to concentrate on dealing with things here, Sterling said firmly. If I have the opportunity to see Jake Ramsley ever again, I'll deal with him then. After cleaning up their impromptu snack, Sterling climbed the stairs to her childhood room. It held all her trophies, old uniforms, and some clothes that she had left behind after her move to New York. Yearbooks were there, along with the favorite childhood books and a teddy bear. Taking the teddy bear down from the shelf, Sterling decided to let her childhood friend spend the night with her, since she wanted some comfort. The next morning dawned bright and sunny, much to Sterling's dismay. She felt like it should be raining to accompany the sadness that her family was facing. Her brother Brant gave her a hug, somber as always. The family managed a light breakfast, no one having much appetite, before heading to the factory. Sterling and Brant spent a little time wandering the floor, reminiscing about the summers she worked there. She breathed in the aroma of different sawdust from different woods, looking affectionately at the machines that she had helped to run, quietly remembering. Now it would all be gone. Brent gave her a one-armed hug, then went to help their father. Owen was finishing up at his desk in the office, getting any important items and paperwork that would be needed before the bank took possession of the property. It was almost time, so Sterling went to wait patiently beside her mother. They had spent yesterday calling each employee at the company. They had fended off questions and statements about the end of Hawkins Fine Furniture Company, instead setting up a time to meet with all employees in the plant cafeteria. At its prime, the company had employed nearly 600 people. Now the town was just only over 700 strong, with more families leaving every week. Hawkins Fine Furniture Company was the town's major employer, still providing for 200 employees. Only now it was closing its doors. As people gathered, they greeted Sterling, many not having seen her for years while she worked on her career. Sterling was happy to renew old acquaintances. From her summers working at the factory family, she knew many of the employees as well. It was bittersweet to see so many familiar faces and know that their livelihood was now gone. Brant and their father entered. Owen Hawkins was red-rimmed around these eyes. It was obvious that he had been crying, but no one remarked on it, letting him save his pride. He wrapped an arm around Paisley and the other around Sterling, surprising her. Somehow she had thought that her father would be the one to make the announcement. Instead, the burden had fallen to Brant, who stepped forward, clearing his throat. "'Most of you have heard the rumors by now.' We all knew this day was coming, it was just a matter of when. Hawkins has not been solvent for a long time, nor has it been able to compete in this market. As of today, we are out of business. Brant paused. 
I would like to thank all of you for being the outstanding employees that you are. We never would have made it this long without all of you. There was a murmur from the crowd, but most remained respectfully silent. As a thank you for your service, continued Brant, we have scraped together a small bonus to go with each of your final pay. We cannot afford severance packages. No one is more sorry about that than our family. They can't afford severance packages while they go living on that great big farm of theirs? A grumbling voice came from the back of the room. The bank will be seizing the farm tomorrow, Brant replied baldly. His voice was matter of fact, even as several people, including Sterling, gasped. Owen's hand squeezed Sterling's shoulder. She had not known it was this bad. She had not known they were going to lose the farm. Mr. Monkton, the bank manager, was kind enough to allow us until then to get our personal effects out of the house before he'll be claiming the property. We've been underwater with our mortgage for some time. Mom and Dad took out the second mortgage years ago to keep the company afloat so the town could survive a little while longer. The Hawkins family has done our best to serve Pendle and its citizens since the town came into existence. It's been our honor to do so, and we apologize deeply for our failure to continue in this role. Brant reached for a box that Paisley held, setting it on a table before him. He plucked out an envelope. In each envelope is your last pay, a bonus, and a letter of reference. He called out names, shaking each man and woman's hand as he gave them the envelope wishing them all the best. Before long, the rest of the family were shaking hands with the employees as well. Most wished them well with tearful hugs. Very few were upset since everyone had known this was coming for a long time. Finally, the last employee was given their envelope. People filed out of the cafeteria, emptying their lockers, milling about and talking. It was perhaps an hour later before Brant was able to go around the factory, shutting off lights, locking doors, making sure the place was clear. "'Why didn't you tell me about the farm?' Sterling asked quietly. It had been an emotional day, and she felt the weight of it pressing on her. She knew that the farm was heavily mortgaged, but had not realized that they would lose it as well as the factory. "'It was the hard to talk about,' stated Owen. "'I suppose we were not ready to face up to the fact that we'd lost a home that the Hawkins had family had lived in for generations.' "'Where are we going to go?' she questioned. Mabel Talbot has offered us Ma Benson's old farmstead, free of rent for the next three months to help us get on our feet. It works since they're just farming the land and the house is vacant, Paisley said with quiet dignity. There are no jobs in the community, so I expect we'll end up moving. Her parents had lived here all their lives. Sterling frowned. What about your retirement savings? Surely you should both be able to retire. We put them into the factory, replied Owen. We kept the doors open for all those families a little while longer. As a result, her parents were destitute and facing an uncertain future. Brant and Sterling had time in their favor. Owen and Paisley did not. Sterling still had her retirement savings, she thought, with a pang of guilt. They were locked into investments. She could have taken them out with a heavy penalty, but Sterling had kept them there as a last resort. Now they would need to be used for her family's basic survival. She looked at a tired Brant and realized that he had probably not taken a retirement plan. If he had, he would have put it into the company as well. He probably had not taken a full salary over the years that he worked for the company either. No wonder he did not feel right about entering into a relationship with Melody, no matter that they had loved each other for years. Brant probably felt that he had nothing to offer. It was sad. It was even more sad when Sterling said goodbye to her childhood home as she slowly packed up her bedroom. Gumdrop would be taken to a local riding school where she would have a home and care for the rest of her days. Sterling was welcome to visit her old horse there. Brant's horse Challenger had already been sold. Everything that was of any value had been liquidated over the years. There were just a few sentimental antiques and regular items left in the house. Some friends were going to help move the heavy items tomorrow morning before the banker came at noon for the keys. Sterling taped up the last box of the items she had intended to keep. The rest would be donated to the local thrift store. Walking across the hall, she offered to tape Brant's boxes. He only had a few. 
Most of everything else was marked for donations. Traveling light? she asked as she bent over the first box. Brant shrugged as he rolled up the shirt, stuffing it into a duffel bag. When it comes down to it, a person doesn't really need all that much. What about love? Sterling paused in taping the boxes to look up at him. We are not going to talk about that, Brant said tiredly as he stuffed another shirt into the bag. Melody loves you, and you love her. Why are you being so stubborn about this? She wanted to know, her heart aching for her brother. She is engaged, Brant said tersely, emptying a drawer on the bed. Neither of them wants to be engaged. They thought you would be jealous enough to finally make the move on Melody, Sterling explained. Sterling had managed to wrangle the story out of Melody and Dixby, out of an old friend at the factory. When you didn't do anything, Melody's pride got in the way and they've kept it up. Brant ignored her remarks, putting clothes in the duffel and zipping it up. Sterling got up and grabbed his arm, turning him to face her. Brant, you deserve love and happiness. If she makes you happy, then you should be with her. It's not that simple, Sarah, sighed Brant. I have nothing. I owe the bank a debt that I'll never get out from under. I need to earn an income to help support our parents. You heard Dad. They have no retirement any more. I can't offer Melody a single thing. Marrying her would put her financial future in jeopardy. I won't do that to her. You could declare bankruptcy. Maybe find a place big enough that Mom and Dad could move in for a while. I'll send money when I find a job, offered Sterling. Hawkins pay their debts. His voice was quiet and unmovable. I've lined up a possible job. It's out of state. I'll send money when I can. Brant. Sterling knew that she was not going to change his mind. You're going to regret this. You're making her life miserable as well as your own. He just gave her a hug, picked up his bag, and headed downstairs. Sterling sat down on Brant's bed, looking around the empty room. She was going to miss her childhood home. She had always known that things were tight financially, yet she had a wonderful childhood in Pendle. She would miss the doorway where their dad marked down Brant and Sterling's growth heights each birthday. She would miss the breakfast nook where she had teased Brant about his high school girlfriends. She would miss the smell of her mother's banking and their long talks over sappy chick flicks. Not that she hadn't missed those when she left Pendle, but Sterling had always known that she could come back to the farm and recreate many of those memories. Now the farm would belong to someone else. Someone else would swing from the tire swing attached to the big oak in the backyard that her grandfather had planted. Someone else would paint the walls and paint over their heights on the door frame. Someone else would create all sorts of memories here. Wiping away a tear, she decided there was no point in crying. Grabbing the packing tape, Sterling finished sealing the remaining boxes, then brought them downstairs to their allocated piles. One for donation one for Ma Benson's house, which was much smaller than the farmhouse. "'I hope the next owner has children,' Paisley commented wistfully as she set a box on the growing donation pile. "'I hope they slide down the banister, just like Brant and you used to.' Sterling eyed the boxes as she followed her mother back to the kitchen. "'Mom, we should sell what's in the donation pile. You need the money.' "'There's no time,' Paisley sighed as she grabbed another box off the counter. "'Besides,' Who can afford anything right now? The entire town is struggling, and everyone's budgets are going to tighten even further now the factory is done. Best to just donate it. Sterling nodded glumly, grabbing a box as well to put into the pile. There was a knock on the door, and soon the house was flooded with women armed with cleaning supplies. Sterling smiled as the group clamored for direction from Paisley and Owen. Someone had hitched a hay wagon to a pickup, and a group of men began dismantling beds and hauling furniture out to go to the empty Benson house under the direction of Owen, carefully situating it on the wagon. It was a regular house-moving party, complete with crockpots plugged in at every available outlet, for when the group was done, they would have a small feast together. This was what Sterling missed about a small community. Everyone might know each other's business, but they were also willing to help each other out as necessary. Sterling was washing a window when there was a crash from behind her. I'm okay, Katie called out as she scrambled to pick up items from the broken box. It was just cutlery. Katie, you've cut yourself. Sterling grabbed a clean rag and pressed it on Katie's thumb. 
Oh, Katie had to look at the cut sheepishly. That's not too bad. You should have seen what I did a couple months ago. Still, it should be bandaged. Sterling grabbed her crutches, and the two went in search of the first aid kit, which thankfully had not been packed yet. I'm sorry about the factory, Katie commented as Sterling wrapped her thumb in gauze. It is a blow to Pendle, even if we all knew it was coming. Sterling nodded. She did not feel much like talking about the losses of the town. What about you? Anything new and exciting? Katie shrugged. The daycare let me go today? Katie! Sterling looked at her in sympathy and feeling a little guilt. This would be a direct result of the factory closing. Do you have another job lined up? I've been offered something. I'm not sure if it will pay my bills yet, but it's a start. Katie's eyes followed a couple of the guys as they hefted an old dresser out the door. Sterling lowered her voice and leaned toward Katie as she put tape over the gauze. Still pining for Jackson? Katie jumped, jostling the scissors Sterling was holding causing Sterling to juggle them a moment before getting a firm grip. Katie blushed guiltily. No, not at all. <laughs> it's okay, Sterling smiled, relieved neither of them had cut themselves on the scissors. Really, Katie did have the worst luck. Your secret is safe with me. If I could just stop mooning over him, it wouldn't need to be a secret, Katie sighed and then forced a smile. What about you? Did you meet anyone special in the city? Not at all. Sterling said. She had met Jake on a plane, so that didn't really count. We should get back to work before the rest of the town smells us gossiping. Katie pretended to shudder and agreed. Then they'll demand to know what we're talking about. Sharing a grin, they went to their assigned chores. He could not find her. Jake was getting more frustrated as he searched. Online, Sterling Denver was only a tabloid writer. There was nothing about where she grew up, what school she graduated from, or anything beyond ten years ago. Sure, he could see what awards she had won over the course of her career, but there was nothing else. Nothing of any substance. He could not tell if she was married, had children, belonged to any clubs. She had her own fan page on Facebook but otherwise belonged only to the website of Dubious. Frustrated, Jake decided to try the other name that Sterling had given him. It was probably a lie like the rest of her. He could not believe he was really going to try to contact her and ask for her assistance to try to clear Michael's name. He wondered just how much money it would take to buy her cooperation. He wondered just how much humble pie he was going to have to eat. Jake was certain he was going to have to apologize for what he had done to ruin Sterling's career. He may have gone too far, Jake acknowledged to himself. He had let his emotions rule him and crushed her because he was angry and hurt. It was unlike him. Jake did have a temper, but usually he was able to contain it. He did not like to be crossed. However, he had always handled most situations a lot better than this. What he had done was unworthy of him, unworthy of the Ramsley name. Then again, the Ramsley name was not what it used to be, he reflected. Jake would have to restore her career. Not that he wanted her writing about his family again. He sighed and scrolled through his computer. Sarah Lee Hawkins, Pendle, Ohio. It was her. Jake stopped and stared at the screen, his breath hitching at her picture. She played field hockey in high school and won third place in state competition. Sarah had won awards for speeches and journalism in state college. She worked at her parents' factory, Hawkins Fine Furniture Company, in Pendle during the summers. Her brother Brant still worked at the factory. Only now they didn't. Jake frowned as he clicked another article. The company had closed. The announcement was made today. There was a photo of the family as they told their employees. Sarah was there with them. The furniture company had been in business for 89 years, with a Hawkins at the helm all the time. At its prime, the company had employed nearly 600 people. Now 200 were out of work. The bank had foreclosed on them. What had Max said? that Sterling had declared that he had destroyed an entire town? A sinking feeling invaded Jake's stomach. 
the town of Pendle was small, only seven hundred and fifty people at last census. Losing a factory that size in a town that small meant the town was going to go under. It simply could not survive. All those people were going to need to find work somewhere else and would move away. As a result, all the smaller businesses like restaurants, gas stations, hardware stores, and more would lose their customers, causing a domino effect. Had her income been tied to the company? Had she been supporting it and thus people's livelihoods? Had he really destroyed an entire town? Jake picked up his phone to make some calls. He needed to catch a flight as soon as possible. Chapter 9 On Friday nights in the summer, the ballpark was the place to be. Set in the campground area overlooking the lake, it hosted a small canteen and bar where the locals came to play, drink, and talk. Sterling decided she might as well let everyone know she was home, not that the rumor would not have already circulated that she was back. Small-town news flew much faster than city news. Usually the entire population of Pendle knew exactly what was happening within an hour of the event itself. The gossip train was that efficient. "'Do you have any dented ones?' Sterling asked Pete at the bar. Everyone knew that whoever was bartending would keep back any dented cans, selling them at a lesser price than the regular ones. "'One left,' Pete acknowledged, setting the palm bay on the bar. "'I'll take it.' Sterling fished in her pocket for the money. It was an extravagance. However, Sterling felt she could nurse it all evening long, then just have water which would be free. Turning around, she looked over a sea of familiar faces, all gossiping about crop prices and whose child did what at the school play. She nodded and smiled at a number of people who were at the picnic tables. No one appealed to her, even as she had plenty of invites to sit down and talk. Scanning the area, she noted Dixby Cooley sitting out on the dock at the lake not far off. She had not seen Dixby in years. Making her way over, Sterling carefully lowered herself on the dock beside Dixby, putting her crutches to the side. It was only a little chilly, but not bad outside tonight. Looking up, she squinted at the moon through the trees. Sterling Denver, back from the city. Dixby took a sip from his beer. You staying long? Sterling shrugged. You can stop calling me that. Sterling Denver is just a pen name. It's what you wanted to be called the last time I saw you. Dixby had a glance at her. A smile tugged at Sterling's lips. The last time I saw you, I had a flare gun pointed at your privates. Even in the dark, Sterling could see that Dixby had the good grace to blush a little. I've been meaning to apologize for that. It was a long time ago. Sterling shrugged at the memory. They had been on a boat on this very lake, making out and going too far. I always wondered what made you spook. He gestured to the lake with the bottle of beer. I know I was pressuring you, and I'm sorry about that. I was a stupid kid back then. Yet I was backing off just before you pulled out that flare gun. You were talking forever, Dixby, Sterling said dryly as she studied him. He had grown into his gangly form and was not that hard on the eyes. Not as handsome as Jake Ramsley, though. We were kissing, and you started spouting off on how we could renovate your granddaddy's house. You wanted to plant a garden, go farming, have me barefoot and in the kitchen. I don't even cook. At the time, I think I might have put up with your poor cooking. He grinned at her. Like I said, I was young and stupid. You would have regretted it, Sterling assured him. I didn't want to be a farm wife. I still don't. That's right, you're the big city writer, Dixby commented without any ill will. Not any more, she gave a forlorn sigh. I'm blacklisted. I can't get a job. I took the last month's salary I had and spent it foolishly on a career gamble and lost spectacularly. Since I can't send the money home, we missed the final payment again for the loans on the company. Now the bank has shut us down. I came back to try to help support Mom and Dad. Sarah Lee Dixby let the name roll off his tongue. Everyone here knew it was just a matter of time for Hawkins Furniture Factory to close down. We aren't competitive in a global world, no matter how hard your family tried. The community is grateful for the fact that your family managed to keep it open as long as it could. Sterling struggled to keep tears from her eyes. She felt guilty for not being able to help with the payment due this month. She had been sending money home for years to help out, 
but it had not been enough. Hey! Dixby bumped her shoulder gently with his shoulder. Don't get all sentimental on me. She wiped her eyes and took a sip from her can of Palm Bay and decided to change the subject. I hear you're engaged. Dixby grimaced, fiddling with the label on his beer bottle. That is a fine mess. What do you mean? Sterling frowned as she pondered his reaction. It didn't seem to like he was happy to be engaged. Dixby sighed. Your brother is not the smartest of men. Care to explain that remark before I go and find another flare gun? Sterling said dryly. Melody loves Brant. Brant loves Melody. She wants to be with him. He's letting his pride stand in the way of being with her, because he believes that he can't provide for her. Dixby shook his head. Why it is an issue if she's a breadwinner for a while? I don't know, except it hurts his pride so he won't follow his feelings and be with Melody. Shameful, as my mama would say. Then how do you end up engaged to your best friend's girl? She raised an eyebrow. That, Dixby growled, was a moment of stupidity. We're all right here at the canteen, and Melody starts spouting off about how she was not going to wait for Brant anymore. She wanted a family and a home of her own. She was saying that she was seeing someone. Brant did not take it too well. Yet his pride kept him from declaring himself to Melody. At this point, I could see what sort of disaster was happening, but the two of them bullheaded friends of mine just kept arguing with each other. Him saying he hoped she would be happy, even as it was breaking his heart. Her wishing he would just call her bluff and finally get on with them becoming a couple. Melody had hoped to make him jealous. It wasn't working. He took a long swallow of beer. In a moment of absolute genius, and that's sarcasm if you're wondering, I stepped up and announced that the fellow Melody was dating was me. Brant just about swallowed his teeth. I thought for sure it would get the right reaction out of him. Let him think Melody was not waiting for him, then instead of digging in his heels and doing nothing about their feelings, maybe he would finally tell her that he wanted to be her boyfriend or more. That didn't work, Sterling said softly. She knew her brother. When he had an idea in his head, he generally did not budge. If he thought he was unworthy of Melody, then he would not ever give her any hope for a future between the two of them. No, it did not work. Dixby worked on the label again. I doubled down and told him how it all made sense. Melody wanted a family and a home. I had a house and said some drivel about how Joy needed a mama, so we decided we would suit. That Melody and I had a friendship going for us, and since Brant didn't seem to want Melody, I had taken it upon myself to propose and she accepted. Unless, of course, Brant knew a reason why we should not get married. He said nothing? She looked at Dixby in the dark. It was obvious he regretted the whole episode. Who is Joy? You don't know? He paused. Bottle raised part way as he turned to look at her. I got married. I have a daughter, Joy Grace Cooley. You're married? Sterling could not quite believe it. No one told me. I suppose they didn't think it was important. Dixby shrugged. You being the big city girl, you might not want to hear all the local gossip. Who is she? she asked with curiosity. Sterling had never thought of Dixby being mature enough to be a husband and father. Somehow, Sterling had the idea that everyone in Pendle would have just stopped moving forward in her absence, but that was not what had happened. How can you be married and engaged at the same time? Her name was Grace. She came from Buford. Right pretty little thing. Dixby's smile faded. She passed three years ago from cancer. I'm sorry. Sterling was. She had always known that she and Dixby would not end up together, even when they were dating. It was only right that he should move on and be happy with someone, Sterling decided. It was too bad he was alone again. I'm glad of the time we had. She gave me joy in more ways than one. Dixby looked over the lake and gathered his thoughts. It's a sad thing when two people who love each other so much are so stubborn. If both of them only knew what it's like to be someone you love, how life can be so short and fragile. What did Brant do when you told him that you and Melody were getting married? Questioned Sterling. 
partially because she wanted to know the rest of the story and partially to get his mind off his deceased wife. He punched me. A grin came to Dixby's face, broke my nose, and gave me a black eye out of the process. Never was I so satisfied by being hit by another person. I thought, finally, Brandt is going to do what he should have done years ago. Tell Melody that he's the one for her and persuade her to choose him. Not that it would have taken much persuading. Instead, Brandt swallowed it all down, shook his finger in my face, told me to treat Melody right, and walked out. We haven't talked much since then. You're still pretending to be engaged? frowned Sterling. Melody won't back down. She's decided to remain engaged. I suppose I let her, but this farce has gone on long enough. It's past time to end it. He breathed in deeply. My biggest worry is that if I do, Melody will find some other willing dupe to be her boyfriend and get married to. Right now I can stretch out this to be the longest engagement on earth, or at least as long as it takes for them two to get some sense and get together. You're a good friend, Dixby, Sterling commented. It was true, even if he might have gone about the situation the wrong way. Although Sterling was not sure there was a right way to do things between Melody and Brant. I don't feel like one. <laughs> I lost my best friend over this, and Melody is right miserable. Dixby grimaced and pulled the label off the bottle in one piece. I told her the longer this goes on, the harder it's going to be on her and Brant, but she just won't listen. Maybe you could talk some sense into her. Sterling shook her head at his hopeful gaze. I'll try, but I'm not sure how much help that will be. I'm not exactly a success story in the area of love. What, no big city guy caught your eye? Dixby asked curiously. Sterling shrugged. Not really. Remember how I could always tell when you were lying? He reminded her. I can still tell. There was one guy, she admitted reluctantly. Who is he? Dixby questioned curiously. The guy who bought Dubious, the tabloid I wrote for, shut it down and then proceeded to backlist me so I can't write at any other paper in the country. Sterling looked at her dented can of Palm Bay. He whistled. Must be a pretty rich guy if he can just buy up a tabloid business like that. I wasn't after him for his money, Sterling confessed ruefully. I was after a story. I wanted to take some pictures, write some articles, and drag his name through the tabloids, because that's what I did, and it paid well so I could help out with the financials here at home for the family. I made him very angry. He felt betrayed and had every right to feel that way. I did betray him. Suddenly, the story was pouring out of her. How she snuck on the plane, the crash, and Jake's help as they struggled through the snow to the cabin. Dixby laughed as she talked about the bat the argument over the stove, and finding the map with its story written on the back. She explained her worry over Jake being gone for so long, how they were rescued and going to the small town of Carver's Bend, where they were graciously taken care of by its residents, where Jake had found out the truth about who she was. "'You are in love with him,' Dixby stated kindly. He had wrapped an arm around her, and Sterling found herself leaning on his warmth. I barely know him. We met five days ago, she protested. Love comes at different times and in different ways for different people, Dixby mildly remarked. When I saw Grace, I knew she was the one for me. It took me three months to get her to say yes to a date, over a year before she said yes to one of my many proposals. I like him, that's all, insisted Sterling. It's really not anything more than that. If he walked up to you right now, ready to forgive you for your part, and asking forgiveness for his part, how would you feel? Dixby questioned. I don't know, she ventured morosely. She knew that was not going to happen. Dixby pulled back a little so he could look her in the eyes. You don't know? That's it? You wouldn't feel relieved that this fight between the two of you was over? You wouldn't be jumping for joy on the inside that he's back in your life? You wouldn't want to wrap your arms around him, hold on tight, and never let him go? Tears sprang to Sterling's eyes. You know I would, even though I am mad at him. Then you are in love, he stated baldly. Now what are you going to do about it? Nothing. She wiped away the moisture in her eyes and let him settle her against his shoulder again. He's mad at me, justifiably so. 
He might have liked me as a friend, but I ruined it. Jake does not want to see me. How do you know? Have you asked him? Dixby inquired calmly. He bought my paper, threw me out on my ear, and made sure I would never have another position like it again in this country, she said wryly. I think he hates my guts. Hate is a passionate word. It's a lot like love, he remarked thoughtfully. Jake does not love me, she insisted, wondering when Dixby's head had become so swelled that he thought he was an authority on love. Then again, he was a coolie, and they had an opinion on everything. Dixby paused, mulling over Sterling's sad story. For a guy who does not love you, he went in overkill on your career. I think his feelings are involved. It doesn't matter. He's not going to forgive me. Sterling looked over the water, feeling hopeless. Did you ask him to? asked Dixby. Did you apologize and ask for forgiveness? I didn't exactly get the chance. She closed her eyes as she remembered Jake's rage over being deceived. He's not in any mood to listen. I think you should write your story. The whole alone with Jake Ramsley thing, only without any exaggerations like you had a habit of putting in dubious. Dixby had read a few of her articles. You should publish it under Sterling Denver, otherwise known as Sarah Lee Hawkins from the tiny town of Pendle, our claim to fame. Don't forget to mention how sorry you are about the tabloid thing, and that you have fallen for him. Maybe he'll read it and come to our little town. No, thank you, Sterling shuddered. I've already put enough of the Ramsley's private affairs into the limelight. I'm not going to do it again. Then how is he going to know how you feel? Dixby wondered at how people were so inclined to shy away from the person they wanted most. He supposed that everyone was always afraid of being vulnerable or making fools of themselves. Then again, being raised a coolie, he had never been afraid of making a fool of himself. That was one of the few perks of the family name. Sterling shrugged. I guess he won't. Like I said, he hates me anyways. I'm not exactly pleased with him either. Somehow, Dixby doubted that very much. If he were a betting man, he would place odds that Jake Ramsley was just as much affected by Sterling as she was with him. The question was, what was he going to do about it? Dixby did not have long to find out. The very next day he was getting gas at the gas bar with his daughter Joy, and watched as a shiny rental car pulled up. How's it going? Dixby eyed the stranger as Dixby gassed up his rusting truck. The stranger was wearing an expensive suit and brand-name sunglasses as he began to pump some gas. Do around town? Yes. The man looked at Dixby, assessing him in return from Dixby's worn work boots to Joy who sat on her father's shoulders humming a little song in her sundress. Are you local? Silly question. Everyone here was local except for this overdressed stranger. Dixby was surprised the man knew how to run a gas pump. He seemed the type who would just have people do it for him, even if the rental was not overly flashly. Yes, sir. You looking for someone or someplace around here? I have an address and a GPS. I'm sure I'll be fine. He gave a tight smile. Shutting off the pump, he put the gas cap back in place, then went into the building to pay. Snob, Dixby muttered. Good luck to Mr. Expensive Suit. GPS was not known to be the most reliable here, unless the address was directly in town. If he was searching for anything in the country, he might end up miles away from where he wanted to be. Sweetheart, you want to share a Sunday after Daddy's done his rounds? Strawberry? Joy piped up with interest from Dixby's head in her little voice. Absolutely, Dixby promised. He would stick around town to see if the stranger came back. If he did, Dixby was going to have a prime time getting the fellow thoroughly lost. Finishing up at the pump, he went into the building to find the stranger at the till. There's a bank down the street. You'll have to leave the car here until you pay, Judy informed the man. Thank you. The stranger said curtly as he grabbed a gold credit card back and headed out the door. Dixby pulled out a couple of twenties, tossing them on the counter. Didn't know about your cash-only policy? It only says it on the pumps, the door, and the till, 
Judy rolled her eyes and took Dixby's money, popping it into the till. The bell rang as Katie Sutton came breathlessly into the gas bar, laying money on the counter. Here, Judy. Oh, hey, Dixby. If you happen to see my hubcap lying around, could you get it for me? I'm late, and I just spilled my coffee over myself and on some guy who looks like he's going to a funeral or a wedding. Judy, I'll grab the quart of oil from the stand on the way out. The car just keeps acting up. Thanks. She bustled out, the bell tinkling as she left. That girl needs a new car, Dixby commented. That girl needs a man to rescue her from herself. Judy shook her head as she put the cash in the till. They watched as Katie tried to start the small rusting hatchback at the pump. After a few tries, it roared to life and a black cloud belched from behind as she pulled out of the parking lot minus one hubcap. I'm going to miss this place when everyone leaves. Dixby sighed with a little nostalgia at the idea. He could afford to stay since his place was paid off. However, many other people would have no choice but to leave to find work, creating a ghost town. You and me both. Judy grabbed a peppermint and offered it to Joy, who happily accepted as she tried to tie Dixby's short hair into a ponytail. Pendle will just not be the same. What do you think that stranger is here for? he asked casually. Not sure. He didn't strike me as the type to share confidences. Judy wiped down the counter. You go on across the street to wait and see if he comes back needing directions? I figured Joy and I were loiter at the hardware store, then settle at the milk box for a little ice cream, confirmed Dixby. If Mr. Snooty happens to need directions, that's where we'll be. Judy chuckled as Dixby left, still letting Joy play with his hair as they passed the even less pleased than he was before stranger, who now sported a large coffee stain on his white shirt. Two hours later, Dixby and Joy were finishing up their Sunday and chatting to a group of people in the milk box, a local ice cream and bakery shop, when the car and the stranger returned for more gas. I think this is my cue. Dixby smiled in satisfaction. Putting Joy on his shoulders, Dixby made his way across the street. Ignoring the stranger who was pumping gas again, he entered the gas bar to lean against the counter. You think he would have put in a full tank of gas the first time, Judy commented. GPS can be unreliable at times. It certainly can, Dixby agreed affably. He lifted Joy off his shoulders, letting her sit on the counter where he grabbed his handkerchief and wiped away a few smears of strawberry from her cheek. The stranger came in to pay for his gas, this time having the cash ready. Would you happen to know where the Hawkins family has relocated to? I see their farm is to be auctioned. Suddenly, it clicked in Dixby's mind. This was Jake Ramsley. It had to be. Perhaps the man had finally come to his senses and was going to talk to Sara Lee. Dixby smiled pleasantly as his mind ran through all sorts of possibilities. They've gone to Ma Benson's old place. You need to take second line out past the Milners. Turn right before the bridge, take the left fork in the road to find Ma Benson's old place, which is now the Talbots, since they bought it three years ago. If you find the church that burnt down last spring, you've gone too far. That would imply that I know where the Milners are, sighed Jake, afraid I'm not familiar with the area. Oh, we're aware of that, Judy said pleasantly. We don't get many strangers in our part of the country. I'll draw you a map. Dixby grabbed an old flyer and pulled a pencil out of a jar near the till. He proceeded to make it as complicated as he could with information that really was not needed. Here's the old peach yard. Over there is the brickyard, which shut down in 55. Now it's just a big wet hole in the ground, but my granddaddy used to work there. Most every home around here that has bricks, those bricks came from that yard. Now, if you follow this road, you'll get to the Hawks Trailer Park. But if you do, you'll have to turn around and come back, because you'll have passed the cutoff. The side road that goes second line is here. But you could take Fairweather Road. It is a shorter way. Midway through Dixby's ramblings, Jake put a stop to it. He had already followed the directions of five other people and had not managed to find Sterling. Could you just take me to the Hawkins directly? I'll gladly pay you for your time. Well, that's a good idea. Dixby looked surprised, as though that had not been his intention all along. Judy, do you mind looking after Joy for a little while? It won't take all that long. Sure thing, Dixby. 
Judy was plaiting Joy's hair into a braid. Joy and I will get up to all kinds of fun. You are a peach, Dixby said to the woman, who just smiled and waved them away. As they walked to Jake's car, Dixby stuck out his hand. Dixby Cooley. Jake Ramsley. Jake shook Dixby's hand in greeting. Theory confirmed, thought Dixby with some satisfaction. He got into the passenger seat of the no longer shiny rental. Jake had been going down some gravel roads, Dixby acknowledged. He happily provided all sorts of conflicting directions as they drove, pointing out landmarks and telling a little history about the country as it passed by. Once or twice he made Jake backtrack, saying he had been too busy telling Jake about a particular property's story that Dixby had plumb forgot to tell Jake where to turn. Sensing Jake's growing impatience, Dixby had him drive onto Fairweather Road. It was a gravel road, and a decent drive, until they came to a bushy area where Jake halted the car. "'You want me to go through that?' Jake looked at the mud on the road. "Yup." Dixby had neglected to say that the road was called Fair Weather, because the only time it could be driven was during a bout of fair weather. It had rained two days ago, and near the brush there was unusual quagmire of mud after any sort of precipitation. You act like you've never been mudding before. Will the car even make it? Jake did not look confident. Only one way to find out, Dixby said philosophically. Gun it and give it a go. Jake decided enough was enough. He would probably wreck the rental car in that pit. We went around the corner with the red barn with the weather vane on the top three times. You've been taking me in circles, Dixby. Now you want me to go through this. Dixby grinned. You've been letting me take you in circles without saying anything. If you'd said something, I might have been a little more creative. Sterling told me about the joy of country directions, Jake said dryly. She did? Dixby mused. Sarah Lee confiding about her country roots. He wondered just how cozy the pair had gotten. Now what is this really about? Jake put the car in park and gave the man beside him his full attention. "'I'm just trying to get a sense of the sort of man you are,' Dixby responded. "'She told me about you.' "'What did she say?' Jake looked out over the brush and farm fields, trying to pretend that it didn't matter what Sterling might have said about him. "'She likes you, and I wonder why,' Dixby replied baldly. "'You had yourself a temper tantrum and ruined her career, which had helped to support our town.' Not exactly the most forgivable thing. Jake had the grace to wince. I didn't know that she was helping to prop up Fendel. There's a whole town of people ready to lynch you, Jake Ramsley. We take care of our own as best we can. Dixby scowled at Jake. If you're here to make things even worse for her, you'll have to get through all of us. Jake sighed as he watched a flock of birds fly past. It was so quiet here compared to the city. You're right. I was angry, and I did everything I could to make her as miserable as I was. When it comes to business, I was taught to cut the competition out quickly and harshly. I did that with Sterling, but this was not business. It was personal. I'm embarrassed about how far I took it now that I have had time to reflect on what I've done. My actions were inexcusable. They were, readily agreed Dixby. What is the point of your visit? If you're just here to apologize, that's not gonna cut it. I know. Jake far preferred the city. Everything was much more convenient. Need a coffee? Within one block there was a coffee chain. Dry cleaning? Three to five blocks. Restaurant? Just around a corner. Parking was a nightmare, but everything was close at hand and easy to find. Plus, the GPS was rarely wrong, unlike here. He decided to level with Dixby. I need her to help with an investigation we have going on. Plus, I would just like to talk to her and try to clear things up. I never thought I would say it, but I miss her. Dixby shook his head with a small measure of disgust. You are going to get shot down if you come at her like that. What do you suggest I do? Jake asked dryly. Dixby grinned. I thought you were never going to ask. If you want to win her back, Mr. Moneybags, you are going to need to. 
Chapter 10 Ladies and gentlemen, Rod Temple, the auctioneer, stood on a hay wagon, microphone to his mouth to get everyone's attention. If I could just have everyone come over to me, I have an announcement I would like to make. And, contrary to popular opinion, I don't like to hear myself speak. So let's get everyone here, and then I can say this only once and not have to repeat myself. Sterling watched in confusion as the crowd gathered, buzzing over the unorthodox opening of the auction. Usually, Temple just said the terms and conditions of the sale and then got on with it. Dixby came to stand beside her, Joy sitting on his shoulders. Dixby, you keep carrying that child. She will never learn to walk, run, or make it on the field hockey team, Sterling said dryly as she reached out a hand to straighten Joy's dress. She runs just fine. Dixby frowned at Sterling. Some days I can barely keep up to her. I like running, Joy piped up as she strangled some more of Dixby's hair into a tiny ponytail, complete with colorful elastics. It's fun. How did you manage to have such a cute kid? Sterling smiled at Joy, who smiled back happily. She is all her mother, Dixby said confidently, ignoring the tugging of his hair. All right, everyone, Temple called their attention back to him. The equipment was supposed to be auctioned off today in the farm if the minimum bid was met. There's been a change of plans, as the auction has been cancelled as of this morning. Someone has stepped in and offered the bank a tidy sum for the whole lot, and that offer has been accepted. I'm sorry if that some of you folks drove all the way from Buford or beyond, and as an act of goodwill, lunch at the fry truck will be paid for. Thank you for coming to Pendle for the auction. If you require an auctioneer for estates or livestock sales, please contact me, Rod Temple at Temple's Auctioneering Company. Have a good day, folks. Temple turned off the microphone and jumped off the wagon as the crowd began talking, gossiping amongst themselves at this turn of events. Several people had already wandered over to the fry truck, forming a line. Some headed for their cars. Most just hung around, ready to talk for a while. I wonder who bought it, Sterling said softly. It's hard to imagine anyone here would have the cash for a straight-out purchase this big. Who is that talking to your parents? asked Dixby, even though he already knew. He had spotted Jake talking to Paisley and Owen Hawkins a while ago. Paisley was wiping her eyes with a tissue, and Owen looked a little gobsmacked. Sterling sucked in a breath as her traitorous feelings took a leap of joy at the sight of Jake. I can't believe it! He bought the farm! Seems that way, Dixby commented with a smile. That low-down, sneaky scumbag! Sterling exploded, marching toward Jake as quick as her crutches would allow. She ignored the pain of her knee as she put weight on it to get there more quickly. Wait, what? Dixby followed her. This was going to be a show if he was any judge of the situation. Coolies never missed a show if they could help it. You! Sterling poked Jake in the leg with a crutch. You're despicable. First you fire me, shut down my tabloid, then blacklist me so I could never get another job in my field. But that was not enough, was it? You are so set on revenge that you had to buy my parents' farm, then taunt them with the news. You were the worst person on this planet, Jake Ramsley. Whatever Jake had to say was lost as he quickly backed away from Sterling, who tried to hit his loafered foot with her crutches as she continued her tirade. How dare you! I was doing my job, just like every other tabloid reporter. While I might have accentuated the truth, I never once lied about your family in the articles. Yet for some reason, you singled me out to destroy my career. The only thing I can think you would have against me is that I lied about being a flight attendant to get on that plane. I saved our lives on more than one occasion after that crash. You would think you might be a little bit grateful? Maybe even forgive me for having to write about your family in my articles? But no. Instead, you go ballistic. You are the worst sort of autocrat, bully, tyrant, dictator. Sarah Lee Caroline Hawkins, Paisley said sharply as Sterling paused for breath. Owen handed his daughter a paper with a trembling hand. Sterling glared at Jake one last time before taking the paper and having a look. It was the deed for the farm, transferred back to her parents from the bank. She felt her anger drain away, being replaced by confusion. I don't understand. He's bought the farm and has given it back to us, Owen said in surprise. Why? 
Sterling felt bewildered. "'You are right,' Jake admitted. Part of him was surprised by her tirade. He knew he deserved it, yet no woman had ever stood up to him that way before. It was refreshing. Plus, she was magnificent in her anger, her eyes bright and cheeks flushed. Jake cleared his throat and concentrated on an explanation. "'I was wrong to interfere in your career. I was wrong to hurt you like that. This is my way of making amends. If I had not caused you to lose your job and not be able to get another, you would have been able to make the payments and not have lost the property. Every insult you said about me, or even thought about me, I deserve. I'm sorry.' Sterling stared at Jake in shock. Never had she expected him to apologize. It put her off balance for a moment. Buying the farm is easy for you. It was an easy thing to just spread your money, ask for forgiveness, and leave. What about the people of Pendle? What about my career? Jake nodded at Sterling's calm questions. I've talked to several of the other magazines, newspapers, and tabloids. I have asked them to ignore my earlier request not to hire you. Sterling, you can choose to work for whoever you wish, or I have another idea if it suits you. I still have all the assets from Dubious. If you want, you can run the place. Change the direction of the tabloid or keep it the same. I don't care. I'll fund it. As for Pendle, I think the furniture factory should reopen. The business model that Brandt has slowly been implementing is viable. The biggest problem that the company was laboring under is so much debt. If the debts were removed, it could turn a profit, explained Jake. I've decided, if Mr. Hawkins is amenable to a partnership between the three of us, to invest in Hawkins' fine furniture. I believe that in the long term, the company could flourish. Sterling did not know how she was supposed to stay mad at him, even though she wanted to. Once the town learned of his sponsorship, he was going to become the town hero for saving jobs and Pendle itself. The Hawkins family had worked so hard as a family to keep things going, and here was Jake, with his bank account, saving the day without even blinking an eye over what had been insurmountable for the Hawkins family. It wasn't fair. Yet at the same point, Jake did not need to have to have done any of this. He could have just let it all collapse and never look back. None of this would have touched him. It meant that he was sincere in his apology. Why? Why did you do it? Sterling asked again. Why even go through that much work to destroy my career? I admit that I was angry. I felt that you'd been lying to me the entire time in pursuit of a story. I felt betrayed because I'd really started to enjoy your company. I liked you. Jake frowned at the memory, reluctant to confess his feelings, but Dixby had coached him that if he wanted to succeed in this, then Jake was going to have to tell Sterling how he felt. I had intended to ask for your phone number to stay in contact afterwards. I felt that we had a connection. I thought that you might have had feelings for me as well. Jake sighed as he debated how to frame his next words. Being a Ramsley is not always the easiest thing. People tend to want something from me. I'm constantly looking for an ulterior motive. It was refreshing to think that you had none. And then you found out that I did, Sterling said glumly. Yes. I was furious, Jake acknowledged. I was sick of the tabloids profiting off my family. I was angry that my father and Michael's reputations were being shredded. Mostly I was mad at myself for being duped by you. Instead of dealing with that anger, I directed it at you and Dubious. I dealt with you like I would anyone who'd cross me in the business world, since I expected that you had viewed our interactions as business only. Worse than that, I honestly felt like you had been laughing at me. Here I was, starting to fall for you, when you were just doing your job, trying to get picture and an article. It stung my pride. What I did, blacklisting you, was inexcusable. Buying dubious and shutting it down was a bad move, both financially and because it hurt you. Again, I apologize for my conduct. I was wrong to do that, and I hope by helping your family I can restore everything I took from you. Jake continued. I understand now that you were desperately trying to keep your parents' company functioning. I understand why you had to write those articles, and I have to admit that you do have a flair for the written word. I don't expect you to forgive me. I'll give Mr. Hawkins and your brother my business advice, but mostly I expect to be a silent partner. 
If you want to take over Dubious, you will have full reign, and I'll just fund it. You'll never have to see me again. Jake regretted the offer as soon as he made it. However, he knew that he had to respect Sterling's wishes. If she did not want to see him, then he would not see her again. It was that simple. He fervently wished that she would want to talk to him again, not just because he wanted her help with clearing Michael's good name. Jake intended to do what was right this time. Sterling thought over Jake's confession. He said he had started to fall in love with her. Sterling hugged those words to herself, trying to absorb them. "'Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins, I will be in touch.' Jake shook Owen and Paisley's hands. He turned to Sterling. Sarah. Or Sterling. I guess this is goodbye. Maybe not. Sterling decided it had probably taken a lot of courage for him to admit that he was wrong and apologize. Men like the Ramsleys generally did not have to do that. The fact that he had humbled himself before her and done so much for her family as restitution meant that Jake was making an effort to right his wrong. Despite his eloquent speech, she could see that he was not used to apologizing and was embarrassed to be doing so in front of their parents. Sterling decided she could meet him halfway. I like you, too. Ignoring the nervous beating of his heart, Jake focused on Sterling. Do you think that maybe we could start over? Just talk, get to know each other. Perhaps go out on a date. I would like that, admitted Sterling. She gave Jake a tentative smile, which he returned. There is something else. Jake thought it best to get everything out in the open. Sterling's stomach dropped and her smile faded. She waited patiently for what he might say. I was wondering if you might help to try to clear Michael's name. You have resources that my family doesn't. You could speak to your contacts at the FBI or elsewhere to find out if there's any evidence that will help him, asked Jake. I would appreciate any help you could give. She digested his words, anger building up. Did you just do all this to manipulate me into helping you? Is that what this whole thing was about, using me and my sources for your cousin? No, Jake protested quickly. It was not the way it is. Even if you don't want to help Michael, I meant every word I said. I still want to see you and get to know you better, Sterling. It's Sarah, she said curtly, wondering at his motives. Forget I said anything. Jake put his hands on her arms with a beseeching look. Let me buy you lunch. We can get to know each other better. You can tell me what it's like growing up in Pendle while I fill you in on what it's like growing up a Ramsley. Please? It was the please that convinced her. Jake was being truthful. Sterling decided to tell him about what she had already done. I already agreed to try to help Michael. I gave evidence to Drew Colburn about David Ramsley. It is perhaps enough for the police to start an investigation into David. I'm not sure how my sources are going to be of any help to Michael, though. Drew Colburn? Jake furrowed his brows, trying to place the familiar name. Your cousin? Sterling said dryly. He's David's son from an affair with Margaret Colburn. Jake nodded as he remembered. He's the police officer. A detective, Sterling confirmed. Thank you for agreeing to help Michael. He's innocent of what they're trying to accuse him of, Jake responded, grateful that she was going to help. I noticed you didn't ask me to help with trying to clear your father. She looked at him for an explanation. That's because he admitted to his guilt. Jake did not hesitate to tell her. Everyone would know soon enough when Robert entered his plea in the court. Jake, Sterling said in sympathy as she took his hand, I'm so sorry. He shrugged. Jake would be there however he could for his dad, despite what his father had done. He loved Robert. It also meant that there's going to be a big fallout for the company. Everything is going to change. Yes, Sterling agreed. If you're nice to me, I'll stick around and face it with you. Then I'll have to make sure I'm nice to you, Jake gave her hand a squeeze. Why don't the two of you go down to the milk box and enjoy lunch? Dixby decided to interrupt. I'm going to organize the troops and get your parents moved back to their own home. That sounds like a really good idea, Paisley slipped her arm into her husband's. I know we'll look forward to being back in our own house again. Are you sure you don't want us to help? questioned Sterling. You two go and enjoy yourselves, Paisley was determined. 
she could see where this might head, and she liked the idea of Jake for a possible son-in-law at a future date. "'Shall we?' Jake offered to Sterling. "'I have it on the best authority that the milk box is the only place to get ice cream.' "'The best authority?' Sterling raised an eyebrow. "'Joy told me so.' Jake smiled at the little girl who was still perched on Dixby's shoulders. "'Well, then, it must be true,' Sterling declared. Jake escorted Sterling as she crutched along beside him. "'How long until you can walk without crutches?' "'The doctor wants to wait a couple weeks and then start physical therapy.' "'What happened to your car?' Sterling asked in disbelief. "'The rental was covered with dried dirt and mud. "'The front bumper dented, and the windshield had at least three sizable stone chips.' "'Oh, Dixby and I went mudding,' Jake said casually as he unlocked it. "'Mudding?' Sterling looked up at Jake and surprised. He really did not seem the type. In a car! A farmer named Rudley had to pull it out with his tractor, he admitted as he opened the passenger door for her. I expect the rental company's not going to be very pleased. When did you meet Dixby? wondered Sterling. Yesterday. He was kind enough to give me a country tour. Jake grinned. He took Sterling's crutches, setting him in the back seat as she got comfortable. He even let me stay overnight at his place. He filled me in on all sorts of interesting things about your childhood. Remind me to have a word with him later? Sterling rolled her eyes. I'm so glad the two of you are getting along. I think I'm going to like spending holidays here. That is, if we do continue dating. Jake gave Sterling a sideways look as he settled behind the wheel of the car. You don't happen to have a flare gun on you. No? Sterling frowned at him. Why would you even ask that? Well, Dixby told me why you threatened him with one, Jake responded. I would hate for the same thing to happen to me if I start talking about a future with you. I'm going to have a word with Dixby about sharing personal stories. Sterling gave Jake a little shove on his arm, then looked at him in surprise. Does that mean you want a future with me? Does the idea make you want to point a flare gun at me? Jake asked, watching her intently. I like the idea, Sterling said softly. Jake smiled as he leaned over to give her a kiss. Sterling happily returned it. Epilogue Sterling and Jake had returned to New York. They both made as many calls as they could to try find anything that might help Michael's situation with little success. Sterling was surprised to hear from Drew, asking her to attend a meeting with the Ramsley family. Jake received a similar call directly afterward from his brother Dylan. Perhaps they found something, Jake said hopefully. I hope so. Sterling did not have much faith. Her sources had been surprisingly empty. They canceled their plans for dinner and arrived at Max's condo in time for the meeting. Max greeted them cordially at the door, unsurprised that they had arrived together. In fact, he looked inordinately pleased. Ellen Paget have the kids at Noah's place. Kelly is currently taking care of Anne and the babies. Max invited them in. The rest of us are trying to get an update on what everyone has found out at the moment. Noah had already taken a seat, talking to Dylan and Everett. Jake recognized Drew Colburn and Bethany Searson, but there was another man with them. Jake greeted his brothers, introducing Sterling. Everett and Dylan were surprised, but kept their opinions to themselves, maintaining a polite demeanor towards her. "'You're the tabloid reporter who splashed my mother's personal business all over the papers,' the stranger said in disgust. "'Who asked you to come?' "'I did.' Drew spoke up as he helped Bethany take off her coat. "'Everyone, this is my brother Molson.' "'I'm sorry about that.' Sterling decided an apology was the best way to smooth things over, since she was trying to help the family. "'You should be.' Molson looked at Sterling like she was a bug he wanted to step on. He pressed a finger to his temple. Margo ain't all there. I didn't know, Sterling stated softly. It was going to take a long time for her to gain anyone's trust in the Ramsley family after her previous career. She gave Jake's hand a warning squeeze to let her handle this when he took her hand in his. His brother Everett raised an eyebrow at the contact. I apologize. That is enough, Jake warned Molson. What, you all cozy with her after all the trash you wrote about you in her paper? Molson challenged Jake with a touch of disbelief. We talked, and we worked it out. 
Jake said clearly in a tone of voice that brooked no argument. "'Leave her alone, Molson,' Drew remonstrated his brother as he seated Bethany. "'We need all the help we can get to prove Michael's innocence and David's guilt. Sterling is here to help. She won't be putting any of this in the papers.' "'Proof?' Molson laughed bitterly. "'I got proof. I recorded the man himself bragging about how he put Michael in jail. You got Bethany remembering Pop cleaning drugs off the floor of a boat with her daddy.' He tried to kill her because he's a sociopath. Then there's the paper trail from all that drug money he run through his own company. Don't all this count for something? Nowhere on the recording does David identify himself, Drew calmly explained. This makes the origin of the voice dubious, and you are not exactly a character witness material, Molson. While we could prove that Ted had a hand in attempting to kill Bethany, we couldn't pin anything on David, especially now that the pharmacy tech who filled the prescriptions has turned up dead. Bethany's repressive memories are admissible to court, but won't hold up under questioning. Any jury will discount them. Just because money has been laundered through the company does not mean that David did it. The finger could be pointed at a number of individuals, including Michael. That's bull, Molson exploded, pacing the room. I didn't say I agreed with it, Drew growled back. I'm just saying what the FBI has said to discount everything. Look, I don't like this any more than you do. If we were handling the case, I would bring all this up, and we might be able to charge David. Individually, it's inconclusive. Together, it's all very damaging. However, when I spoke to Agent Law, he said none of it was pertinent to their case. Unless we can get something to stick, Law won't look at it. What we need is solid proof, Everett inserted into the conversation. Short of a full confession, I don't see how that's going to happen. Drew rubbed his face, exhausted. He had been putting in extra hours trying to come up with any sort of solution, while Agent Law did his best to blow Drew off. We all know David is smug and conceited, but I don't think he's going to let me record him boasting about his victory. I have a different angle. Sterling hesitated to bring it up. I don't have proof yet. It's only a theory. What is it? Max asked hopefully. A theory. Molson was sarcastic. A lot of good that will do. Let her speak, Jake gave Molson a hard look, putting a hand on Sterling's shoulder. I have someone looking into the FBI agent Law's financials. What? Max was surprised. You think Dad was bribing him? Is that even legal, to looking into someone's financials? Bethany asked. Can you do that? No, it's not legal, Drew answered with a frown, which means anything you find is inadmissible in court. True, Sterling conceded. However, if Law is accepting bribes from David, we would be able to find out. If this is the case, then perhaps some reason could be manufactured to look into the money trail and get them caught. That is crazy. Noah leaned back in his chair, shaking his head. An FBI agent accepting bribes. It would mean the end of his career. It would mean prison time, Drew commented coldly. It was no secret that he didn't like Law. The reality is, Law is not likely to jeopardize himself for money. It's just a theory, offered Sterling. One, that it does not hurt to confirm or rule out. Jake supported her. If Law is accepting bribes and we can prove it, what happens to the case? The whole case would be suspect and have to be reevaluated. Drew shrugged. It would implicate David, and he could be arrested again, as any deal the FBI made with him might be void if Law had a hand in it. However, if there's still evidence against Michael, that doesn't go away until someone confesses that they planted it. It's a highly unlikely scenario. Not only that, we must have just cause to go before a judge to get evidence legally to implicate that law is accepting bribes or planting evidence. If we can't find just cause, the evidence is inadmissible and useless. Then it doesn't help Michael at all, Noah asked grimly. No, it doesn't. Drew said quietly. He spotted Molson leaving. Where are you going? Molson paused at the door. To do something. I got contacts, too. I'm going to start asking some hard questions and see what happens. Drew scowled. You really think your gangbanger friends are going to help? Won't know until I ask. Molson stated as he pulled the door shut behind him. Your brother is a bit of a hothead, commented Noah. Says my hothead of a brother, Max stated calmly. Look, if he can find out anything that helps, more power to him. 
Is there anything else that we have that can help Michael? I don't think there is. Keep trying. Perhaps something will come to light that we can use. Drew shrugged, not feeling hopeful. I apologize for Molson. He feels responsible. How can he feel responsible? asked Everett with a frown. David called him. He said that Molson had given the idea from a conversation the two had previously had to frame Michael and testify against him for immunity, explained Drew. David basically thanked Molson. None of this was Molson's intention. Now he feels responsible. The room was quiet while they assimilated the statement. What about the evidence that I brought to you earlier? Sterling quietly asked Drew. The department has decided to look into it, responded Drew. The problem is how the evidence was obtained. There is no way to prove it was or wasn't tampered with. Plus, it never showed who stole the drug. If we can obtain the same evidence and be able to prove who took the drug, we may be able to press charges. If we can't prove it, we have nothing. Then what can we do? questioned Dylan. Pool your resources to get Michael the best legal team that money can buy, a grim Drew suggested. He's going to need it. He could be spending the rest of his life in prison. If you enjoyed Stranded with the Billionaire, you might enjoy Book 7 of the Ramsley Brothers series, Unlikely Hero. Molson Colburn has always grown up with people looking down at him. He's made life choices that his family doesn't approve of, but he never let that bother him before, preferring to weather it all with a fine sense of sarcastic humor. Now he's serious about helping his half-brother Michael after he feels responsible for Michael's imprisonment. Holly Ershman has always done things by the book. She doesn't have so much as a parking ticket to her name. When a client of hers has their life threatened, she vows to get to the bottom of what happened. It's an unlikely pairing that neither of them wanted or expected. Yet once they put their heads together to help the Ramsley family, they find they work well as a team in more ways than one. We also met Katie Sutton and Jackson Davis in this book. Find their story in Kissing Katie. Jackson Davis is in a panic. Seven years ago, he sent a manuscript to an editor as a joke. Now he is becoming a famous romance writer under the pen name J.D. Emerson, and his editor wants him to go on a tour, including an interview on a daytime talk show. The problem? He let everyone think he is a woman writer. Katie Sutton is just not making it in life. Her car is an oil-gulping rust bucket. Her hours are being reduced at the daycare center where she works, plus her rent has gone up. She had always had a crush on Jackson, her friend Trent's older brother, but he sees her as he always has, Trent's buddy. Katie might just be the perfect answer to his problems if Jackson can get her to accept a position to pose as his pen name and do the tour for him. She could be the face of his muse. From mishaps, writer's block, and stage fright, Jackson and Katie are spending a lot of time together. For the first time, Jackson is really looking at Katie. What he sees makes him think of taking the romance off the paper and into reality. You can find it on Amazon. Happy listening.